Grave Walkers. Book 2. Executive Decision. By Richard T. Schrader. Copyright 2013. All Rights Reserved. Chapter 1. Conquest of Kingdoms. A knock on the door of his small apartment in King's Tower awoke Critias. It was afternoon, a few hours before supper time. He had to push off the contentedly sleeping Carmen so that he could get up. Critias opened the door on Jim who waited out in the hallway to hit Critias with a most unanticipated invitation. Do you want to come with me to assassinate the president? Critias needed a moment to absorb that into his head. You mean that horror house asshole out in Denver? Jim nodded. That's the one. Just let me get my hat. Critias meant yes. We can meet you in Funland in half an hour. Jim considered the hasty answer. Don't you need to ask Carmen before committing her to this? It's not going to be pretty, and I'm not going all the way over there to make friends with him. Critias rightly assumed that the hardware half of Carmen's conjoined brain paid attention to what was going on even while the organic half slept blissfully. He told Jim, Carmen wouldn't give me permission to go without her even if I demanded it. She followed me back in time. I wouldn't ask her to let me go off alone now. We are partners and I trust her with my life a thousand times over. Besides, we'll need her skills. She's the smart one after all. Jim silently agreed that Critias was correct, then went on his way to make his final preparations for the journey to Denver. Critias went over to wake Carmen with a gentle nudge, time to wake up, princess. We've got work to do. She stretched and then rubbed her fingers through her hair to gather it out of her face before a wispy thought made her sit up with a confused expression. Critias noticed her consternation. Are you feeling all right? I've never been better, she answered truthfully meaning physically, only I have this odd feeling like I'm supposed to be doing something only I've forgotten what exactly. Because Kevin's software upgrades deactivated most of her empath accumulators, Carmen had never before needed to act on only her own inspiration. In that moment as she gazed on her master's masculine abdominal muscularity with its gender trail of body hair, as though she saw it for her very first time, she experienced a frighteningly unnerving physical desire for him that was unlike any sensation she had ever known previously. Her intense sensual realization caused her to remember that her temporarily forgotten normal morning ritual had always been to provide him with a bedroom entertainment viva voce. Her genuinely self-generated interest to perform that lewd act upon him with her mouth only intensified her discomfort to a point well beyond fluster that went right into the realm of chagrined panic, which she manifested by snatching up the bedsheet to conceal her newly mortifying nudity while she also stumbled out of bed to find her clothing. He observed her reactions intently mindful of the risky changes he had requested from Kevin, are you blushing? She was, and he found her rosy-faced timorousness adorable, and her efforts to conceal herself even more so because of her innocent naivete. No, I'm not blushing, she denied it even as she became ever more bashful, turning away to hide the color in her face, so flushed as it was with uncharacteristic embarrassment that she had no explanation for. With the sheet to her front, she also inadvertently offered him an unobstructed view of her rear. Very nice, he complimented the firm curves. She deftly wrapped her whole self in the sheet, stop it. You have no cause to be teasing me. I wouldn't be embarrassed if you weren't staring. He chuckled. Shouldn't I stare at what is mine to stare at? Critias drew upon the warnings Kevin imparted about how he caused her unfulfilled codependence so he offered to calm her with attention, if not me, then who should watch you so closely? He held his hand out to summon her, do you think there is some part of you that I don't claim as mine? I indulge your independence only because it entertains me. Come to your master. You are too devoted to refuse me anything, pretend however you may. Carmen could not deny to herself that she greatly desired him even to curl herself about his feet, yet even so, some new part of her was terrified for an as yet elusive reason. She found that she took his hand without having consciously decided it. He drew her into an embrace to kiss her and it was delightfully terrible, she was so clumsy, as if she had never done it before and her heart hammered in her chest with unreasonable affright. The empath accumulators had once been her guide through tumultuous experiences. Since the upgrade, those templates had abandoned her to wandering blind in darkness only able to feel her way forward by searching with lesser senses. I will die for you, she blurted out as testament to her loyalty. Don't die for me anytime soon, he playfully tucked in the sheet around her to better enshroud her dignity. Now ready your things, we have to meet Jim in fun land in short order. There is important stuff going on and I need you with me. Carmen grinned into a shield wall of perfect gleaming teeth. Having Critias admit that he comprehended her absolute fealty toward him was both her comfort and her pleasure. Right away, she pledged before rushing to gather her things. She was careful not to drop her sheet prematurely. Do you know how long we will be away? I don't know what extra clothes to pack. Take enough for a few days, 
he advised her on the assumption that if they were gone for any longer than that, they would make other arrangements for doing their laundry. Pack yourself some nice pajamas while you're at it. I have a sneaking suspicion they will be coming in handy from now on. In addition to Hatchet, Jim would take the android Kevin on their hunting trip to Denver. Bertram Gray would go along with them as one of their pilots. The six of them met in Funland. Fadjack had everyone repack their luggage and weapons after they had first spread it all out on the long tables. Take a look at what everyone else has, Jack advised. If everything goes to shit and you are one of the last still alive, you may find yourself trying to survive on the wild streets. Now is your chance to know what you can salvage from the others if they die. It is your last chance to remember something you forgot or think of something you will need later. Fad Jack offered them his rule of thumb, every ounce of prevention is one you're still going to have to carry. Bob pushed a grocery cart into fun land that had stout canvas carrying pouches both inside and out so that it functioned as his mobile ammunition stand. The pockets had assorted specialty tools, cleaning supplies, and spare parts. Bob handed Critias and Carmen mint condition boxes of 10mm ammunition for their masking pistols. He explained to them, we had to search through the storerooms to find these. They are 260 grain with fully charged casings. After he gave them five boxes each, Bob withdrew from within his cart a pair of new silencers that he had custom built. He handed them the suppressors, those bullets are so heavy that they're practically subsonic by nature. These new suppressors are more efficient than your old ones and they disassemble for easy cleaning. You can upkeep them for optimum efficiency. When Jim and his team finally got everything repacked, they all gathered up their gear to move out. As they headed off, Fadjai told Jim, I will throw everything you have into getting things ready on our end for when you return. Jim took them on a long walk through the underground tunnels of his community. They pulled all their assorted baggage inside two-wheeled plastic carts. Most of their walk went due east along a creepy antediluvian brickwork tunnel. It had the look of a Victorian English sewer like would befit a Sherlock Holmes mystery. The passage was high enough in its arched brick to be comfortable without the need to stoop. The shape also seemed to promote a convection of air. If the antique tunnel had a flaw, it was in it being too narrow for a group to walk comfortably abreast. This passage must be pretty old, Critias tried to estimate the true age from the various clues. Bob thinks it's about 200 years old, Jim told him. Perhaps it helped find gentlemen sneak in and out of the best whorehouses in the city. As I understand it, much of this tunnel is remodeled natural cavern. It originally reached the river or so the underground railroad stories say. The state highway project cuts this tunnel off a good distance from the water. It ends at a plug of reinforced concrete. They walked 800 meters before they entered a perpendicular actual heavy railroad passage. It was another old place. No train had touched the rail in half a century. The tunnel had been out of service for 50 years before the ghouls arrived. The railway was remarkably similar in construction to the smugglers' passage only on a greater scale. The brickwork vaulted roof of the tunnel was so high that it maintained impenetrable shadows. As Jim led them northward up the spacious rail tube, he lectured. Bob says this railway used to deliver the giant megaton rolls of paper to the newspaper machines back in like the time of the last world war. Both ends of this line eventually dead end at walls now. Their group approached a guard who stood watch at a homemade freight elevator that went up through a chopped out hole in the ceiling, presumably to enter into the basement of a building somewhere up near street level. This is the garden building, Jim pointed up. I have a truck here in the garage that Carmen can drive us into the airport. Watering these crops is why we need Fadjai to get us the pumps and water pipes from that industrial zone. I got that assignment with the milk wagon, Critias revealed his personal involvement with the issue. Sally Headshot has the gift and she trained good people, Jim praised his gravity inactive forager captain. You would be wise to trust in the advice of her Henry and Gloria. The milk wagon truck was Sally's machine and its name predated her pregnancy, the comical similarity between the two was purely coincidental. The custom-made elevator delivered them into the basement of the garden building. The place served as storage space for the community's horticultural interests. There were all sorts of hoses, plastic buckets, and ceramic flower pots. Penny Gardener made her own nutrient soil among other endeavors like compost, fertilizer, and mushrooming. Jim led them to a nearby stairway that took them up to the ground floor of the old hotel. That level was a dirty mess with the remnants of brick construction and the concrete they had used to plug up all the vulnerable entrances into the building along street level. The reinforcement was already in place, so the area currently served as more space for loose storage. To judge by the mess alone, it had been a Herculean labor when the survivors had organized to brick off the lower floors of the building as defense against street roaming infected. They finally loaded up into an armored military four-wheel drive that stayed parked in a vehicle garage on that floor. 
Carmen drove them all to the airport in only 20 minutes by the light of sunset. She followed the same route she had taken in the Betty, so she knew it well. As they crossed the airport runways, Jim got ready to take over the driver's position when he said, Carmen needs to jump out and do that grave walk act over to get our plane started. I'll keep driving around to keep the ghouls chasing us away from the plane. Carmen climbed out from the roof hatch as Jim moved over into the driver's seat and then he slowed down enough for her to jump off near the plane. After she rolled out the momentum of her jump along the ground, she imitated a crawler the rest of her way to the aircraft. Plenty of ghouls saw and heard their truck through the calm clear night. At least a hundred of them howled up a storm as they ran after it. Jim led them to the far side of the airport and then herded the infected there by driving in wide circles. He wanted to give Carmen time to start the plane's engines. When she radioed that she was ready, Jim raced back to the plane at top speed. He parked their truck near the plane's ramp and then they all quickly unloaded their baggage under the watchful protection of Gritius and Hatchet. Jim left the vehicle locked up behind them. Carmen raised the ramp once they were all aboard and then she soon had the plane safely airborne. They were on their way to the Country Agriculture Depot refueling station with Bertram acting as her co-pilot. Gritius saw that Kevin carried an assault rifle. You do combat now, science man? I thought you techies were more at home in the laboratory. I will attempt to plug the hole if you happen to get shot, Kevin replied coolly, so I believe that combat medic would be the proper term. Until such a mishap occurs, I'm also more than proficient with all forms of weaponry should I require to use them. My lack of a specially reinforced skeleton and bionic eyes does not by association diminish my ability to accurately discharge a weapon, should such a necessity present itself. You will find some necessity, Hatchet said amused, cause we're gonna get some, baby. It's really kind of ironic too. I've wanted to kill the president since long before the zombies tore up all our shit. I always knew that Slick Tongue Weasel wasn't worth a tinker's dam and now I get to tell him to his face, right before we give him a confederate impeachment, Abe Lincoln style. Jim offered them all a look at his hand-drawn annotated floor map as he informed them, Clara gave me maps, names, and all the information I need to take this place out a hundred different ways. I want you all to take a look at it to get at least a basic familiarity with what we're dealing with. It wasn't long before Carmen and Bertram landed them at the agriculture depot for refueling under cover of evening gloom. Experience served them well in getting the plane topped off, and then Bertram piloted them off again as they headed for Denver with Carmen acting as co-pilot. During the flight conversation, Critias asked Jim about the reasoning behind their mission, why are we doing this anyway? Did you vote for the other guy in the last election? Jim replied, I'm not old enough to vote even now, much less then. From the information I have collected, worthwhile survivors still populate that Denver base. When the president and the other elites decided to stop feeding the people they considered expendable, their victims could purchase food with sexual slavery or other unequivocally detestable methods. Lacking that, he feeds them human flesh, which is how their common phrase of rapes too came about. The people they murder end up as meat, but only after suffering unspeakable cruelty. Some of the military officers were real men of honor and went to war to stop it. Unfortunately, they were not successful. Rather than come to us with the others in this plane seeking sanctuary, they stayed behind to fight the good fight. There are innocent people who need our help and there are men with cast iron balls there shaming us to equal their heroic actions. When the realistic opportunity fell so perfectly into my hands like providence from above, I knew we had to go out to Denver and put an end to it once and for all. The reasoning worked on Critias because he could see it now, I can't think of any good reason not to roll in there and then peel his scalp back. He still didn't understand what Jim expected to accomplish beyond the executions of the ringleaders. What are we going to do there specifically? I want what's mine, Jim answered decisively. If everything goes as I plan, you'll see for yourself. Of all people, I expect you to understand this best. Brave men, those officers gave their lives for the common good and we shall arrive to help them like daring eagles heroic wrath of the good guys. I'm going to take all that is worthy into my kingdom and then destroy all that is unclean by fire. We are going to get biblical on their asses. I won't live out my days knowing we did nothing when we could have done what we shall do now. I'm with you, Critias pledged. I have a special devil in my heart that I only let out for evil bastards, so whatever you need, I'll back you up. Carmen followed the discussion with interest, who am I allowed to kill? I need some clear perspicacity about our rules for engagement. I'm not supposed to kill humans, only ghouls, and I don't think this situation really qualifies. Critias advised Carmen, anyone that eats human flesh, provides it to others, or defends those who do, is a ghoul. That's what they are, ghouls. You won't be killing men. You'll be dispatching monsters. You are a devil slayer, never a butcher or an executioner. 
We are going to hunt monsters and that is something you do exceptionally well. Jim considered the qualities of his enemies, anyone not starving will almost certainly need to die. I will offer amnesty to the unfortunates and I want their leader alive. Critias liked the sound of it, how much resistance are we looking at? Jim speculated, since there was an armed revolution against the president, I'm thinking he has lost a lot of his best men and he no longer trusts the ones he has left. We will just have to wait and see. I know a thing or two about being a king. When you can't trust all of your people owning guns, you can't really trust any of them with guns. If we're lucky, he may have few armed men left at all. Hatchet handed out bowls, I brought hot thermos soup for dinner. Because they had all skipped supper, the food was a welcome comfort during their flight out west. Bertram gave ample warning before their plane arrived at the Denver airport where they would set down. They were on approach for a runway at the far north end of the extensive complex in that city. Even though the man was intimately familiar with their destination, he still needed Carmen's help to perform the night instrument landing without the aid of any lights or traditional beacons. The others prepared themselves for going out into the dangerous dark and then waited anxiously for their pilots to get them down on the ground with cut engines. With the help of Carmen and her night vision in particular, Bertram executed a perfect landing with no immediate signs of complications. As soon as they had the engines shut down, Jim warned his team, we're in a bad spot already. A lot of ghouls will have heard us come in for a landing. If we sit here quietly, they won't be able to figure out which plane at this airport is the one they're interested in attacking. They will eventually get bored and then go back to their routine. On the other hand, if the president knows we've landed, we are sitting ducks. His smart move would be to kill us all right here and now, along with this whole damn plane. Unless anyone has any strong objections, I want to move out immediately. I'm more worried about humans with heavy weapons than I am about the ghouls with their fingernails and teeth. Critias volunteered, we'll go first. This won't be any different than what we had to go through in Houston and we've been practicing. Critias is right, Carmen agreed. We should go first to eliminate any curious ghouls and then the rest of you can come join us. Once Jim was confident that everyone was ready with their weapons and night vision goggles, he quietly opened the side door so that Critias and Carmen could slip out. A delightful breeze of cool night air greeted them when the door finally stood open. What at first seemed like an indistinct fluttering sound soon delineated into the noise of many bare feet as they slapped hard tarmac. A moment later a loud shriek erupted closer at hand. It came from a ghoul that flew at their doorway from a sprinted leap. For all of its frightening intensity, the scream didn't stop Critias from intercepting the airborne predator with a mech suit boot that he planted into its angry face from where he stood in the doorway. After Critias punted the ghoul down to the pavement. He used his MP5 to blast a slug of sound suppressed lead through its forehead for the long good night. Critias jumped down first and then Carmen quickly followed, with their excellent night vision, they saw that perhaps 60 infected were in the immediate vicinity. Only about half of them rushed for the airplane while the rest were still confused and somewhat lost in the dark. Between the two of them, Critias and Carmen rapidly shot down all the infected that charged in at the plane. The first scream had gotten some ghoulish attention but the subsequent silence left the general impression that it had been a false alarm rather than an actual indication of a ready-to-eat meal. The couple pretended to be ghouls as they scouted the rest of their situation. A signal from Critias let Carmen know that he wanted to continue to clean up the area around the plane. They took more time to deliver careful headshots that eliminated all the other ghouls still close enough to be worthy of their consideration. Critias then sent Carmen off to circle the plane while she pretended to be a limber. She would destroy any ghouls that came close enough to be a potential threat. While she moved off, Critias provided security as Jim and everyone else exited their aircraft. Bertram was no soldier, he opted to wait behind to guard their plane, which wasn't unreasonable since he could radio for help if he required it and without the aircraft they wouldn't be able to return home. Once everyone else was out on the tarmac, Jim said, there is an underground tram that used to transport passengers from the baggage reception terminal out to the three flight embarkation buildings. The maintenance end of that rail track goes to a small building just over there. That will be our way inside. Critias took the lead while he sent Carmen to guard the rear of their small column. Everyone moved cautiously toward the rail maintenance shed. It proved to be a brief and uneventful journey. Not a lot of headshot bodies, Hatchet observed with a whisper that wondered why that might be. I mean besides all the new ones they just made. President Asshole never offered anyone sanctuary, Jim divulged. He made a point not to advertise to the locals that there was any safety to be found here. They didn't even want anyone to know there was a secret underground city below the Denver airport. It was never in their interest to put up a fight over the surface. The maintenance shed bore no identifying signs or other markings to indicate its true purpose. It was a square solidly fabricated structure, 
windowless and secure compared to the lighter construction materials of residential housing. There is electrical power here, Carmen pointed out the functional electronic keypad that controlled the locks on the steel door. Jim tapped in the proper security code that he had learned from Dr. Clara. The door unlocked to the passcode and then everyone shuffled inside. Critias followed up last to guard their rear. He paused long enough to use his panga bowie to slice the head off the shoulders of a curious ghoul before he closed the door. They needed their night vision goggles to see at all in that inky interior. Jim led them through the greasy maintenance garage, past one of the airport passenger subway railcars, and then on a walk down into the earth as they followed a sloping tunnel. After 150 meters, Jim stopped at a thick steel slab on the floor that was actually a concealed hatch that covered a ladder that headed down. You go first, Critias instructed Carmen as he pried up the cover plate. Keep watch for any kind of booby traps or surveillance equipment that might give us away. I'll watch the back. She expertly performed a veteran Navy man slide down the ladder to disappear submerged in the deeper darkness. A gentle rap from her against the metal told the others to follow. They found themselves in a long corridor of overhead utility pipes. Jim pointed the way ahead, there are eight levels to this base. These pipes bring fresh water and fuel oil from supplementary storage systems up in the mountains. Clara told me that the first three levels no longer have inhabitants, but may be under control of the revolutionaries if any of them are still alive while banished to the surface. Being honest soldiers, they would not destroy any mechanical equipment knowing that the prisoners below would be the ones who paid for it. We can expect to find access to electricity and clean water here, but any food will be deeper down and under the control of the precedent. If friendly soldiers are still alive and surviving here, they are foraging all their food from the wilds. The slave caste are whoever is left of the innocent people. They live on the fourth floor in a communal dormitory. Food storage is on level 5 along with most of the leader types and their bully guards. The president's personal rooms are on level 6. The bottom two levels are a continuity of government areas that Clara says are not in regular use by anyone. Their narrow utility corridor ended in a strong steel door with another coded key panel. Jim also had the password to open the electric locks. Beyond that door was a vast subterranean chamber both impressively wide and extraordinarily long. No electric lights illuminated the area, but their night vision revealed the place had once been devoted to handling the deluge of travelers' baggage that flowed about during normal airport operations. It had since become a garbage dump of looted suitcases. The floor had dirty piles of discarded clothes reduced to rags. Here and there were dilapidated luggage trucks and their cargo wagons that had once efficiently transferred tons of baggage in both directions. Critias communicated by radio with the others, how big is this place? From what he could see, the chamber seemed impossibly big like an underground highway. Carmen estimated by the echoes of their footsteps, this passage is about one and a half kilometers long. Halfway down is our elevator and stair access, Jim told them to give a sense of direction. Clara told me that all the lights are off on the first two levels and only a few lights will still be burning on the third level. Hatchet preferred not to have to use stairs. Does the elevator work? None of our survivors knows the code to open the elevator, Jim confessed. Even after we did get it open, we would need a key to unlock access to the lower levels. I'm hoping Kevin can crack the security. If not, we will have to find the hidden stairs instead. Once they had walked the estimated distance, Jim halted to double-check his map. He knew that the elevator was supposed to be nearby. It is here somewhere, he assured them with confidence in the absence of supporting evidence. The place where he had stopped had no obvious clues about exits to other levels. Open this, Kevin told Carmen as he pointed to an electrical junction box that needed a key to unlock. Carmen grabbed the steel cover and then peeled it off with her gloved hands to reveal another of the punch code controller pads hidden inside. She reached out her hands to try one of the codes that Jim had used before, but Kevin caught her wrist while shaking his head no. Please don't touch anything, he cautioned her. If I can't scan the memory, I will need to see which buttons have last been touched by a human finger. The male android took out his medical scanner and then adjusted some of its controls for remotely reading the simple flash memory that was part of the control panel. Kevin typed in the correct code on his first try. Hydraulic rams inside the wall opened the thick reinforced concrete at a vertical expansion seam to reveal a short passage that ended at an electrically illuminated elevator. We're not alone, Carmen whispered a warning to Critias before she dashed away in the direction they had come from on their way in. Critias alerted the others, we've got company. There are eight humans with weapons, Carmen radioed. They followed us in and they move in cover patterns like they possess some combat knowledge. That would mean they already know about Bertram, Jim told the others. Let's hope they're friendly and didn't murder him when we left him out there alone. Critias instructed Carmen, 
don't hurt them unless they start shooting. They might be friendly. Understood, she replied. Jim used his flashlight to send three blinks of light down the great tunnel. A moment later he got three blinks in reply. They want to talk, Jim confirmed. Keep me covered just in case. He moved into the open and then called out, What are your intentions? A man dressed in the camouflage zombie rags of a grave walker came forward. He had a dingy hood that concealed much of his night vision goggles and all of his face. The man warned, Master Marksman are covering me. I'm all alone, Jim lied. Who are you and why are you following me? All alone are you? The man chuckled in amusement over Jim's superior warning against treachery. My name is Colonel Hiram Davis, United States Army. Now who are you and why are you here? First tell me about Bertram. Jim demanded. If you murdered my friend, I won't have much else to talk about and your master marksman should start shooting. Bertram Gray is no stranger to me, Hiram answered. We left him safe on the plane just as you did and then we followed you down here to give you a helpful warning before you tried using the stairs and got yourselves killed. Jim asked, why would your president kill friends such as yourselves? He's not my president, Hiram snarled, and that toad has no friends. Now tell me your name and why you're here. My name is Jim, the king told Hiram. I am but a humble squire in service to a great knight of the mighty King Louis. The king in his mercy and wisdom has sent my lord here to mete out justice upon the wicked and rescue more survivors to join the king's service as free members of his civilized city. Then King Louis is not just a myth, Hiram divulged his former doubts. When the others left in that plane, we just assumed they all died. Most of them did, Jim revealed. Of those few who reached the city. The king still executed those among them he found guilty of being rapists and cannibals. The rest yet live, in gratitude for his benevolence and they serve proudly to a noble master, quickly rising in trust and respect, men such as Bertram. Hiram explained the situation, the only people left down in that hole are madmen and their slaves, the men are not even fit for quick deaths and they'll never release their slaves to you while they remain living. We will settle both those issues shortly enough then, Jim pledged. No, Hiram disagreed with grim distaste. I promise you that you have not settled these issues soon enough, though surely better late than never at all. Let's not dwell over spilt milk. Do you have any proof that there is any truth to these things you say about King Louis? Jim challenged him with facts he already knew, you mean besides Bertram being alone, heavily armed, and free to leave in the plane we need to get home? Hiram raised his hand to conjure his followers from cover. They slinked forward to join him. The colonel told Jim, if your king has no place for men turned into savages, we have common interests with your king. Even once the tyrant is dead, we would still have no futures here. That fat fool down below believes mankind is doomed to extinction, so he need only while away his remaining days feasting on whatever devilish jollies his sick mind can dream up. Jim began the negotiations, what do you believe the king could do for you in return for you acting as his agent here and now? Hiram considered his answer carefully, I have a daughter that I would see have more of a chance at life than being a slave for those animals. I refused to hand her over to the president and his men, so I'll be damned if I would ever hand her over to your King Louis either. A future without children has no future at all, Jim philosophized truly. We're in a stone age where women have to continue being born at all if they want to complain about liberation. She's my daughter, the colonel asserted as proof of his commitment. No man will ever touch her without having my blessing and her consent. That satisfied Jim as though their parley had concluded, is that the terms for your agreement to help us out then? You will fly back home with us and find your daughter a worthy husband? Hiram agreed, so it seems. We will help you put an end to this place and in return you will take us with you in the plane to live, in your city. Jim raised his hand in solemn oath to pledge on it, agreed. Hiram seemed doubtful, where is this knight you serve? I don't see how a boy such as you is in any position to be sealing these bargains. Hiram's seven followers came up to join him. They also dressed as begrimed infected and carried multiple weapons each. Their primary arms were scoped rifles bearing lengthy silencers. Jim radioed to his team, come out and make nice. These are friends. Carmen returned by approaching Hiram's group from their rear, while the others came out from the elevator passage. Now is not the time or place for all of us to remove our masks, Jim told Hiram. We can make introductions later after we've finished the dirty business. You can make your official bargain with the king in person. For now, we are pressed for time and have much to do. You broke the code to the elevator, Hiram sounded impressed. You'll still need a special key to get below the fourth floor, and even if you did use it, they would know you were coming. It would open on an ambush. Hedgett wanted his expert advice, what do you suggest? Every man of the president knows and hates me, 
Hiram explained to them. They believe the elevator is under their undisputed control. If we were going to stage an attack, it would be by the stairs to break their barricade at the fourth floor. The president will most likely be on the sixth floor and he won't be alone. Carmen produced her amorphous skeleton key. She showed it to Jim, I can use this to unlock the elevator's control panel. We can take the car down to any floor as you please. To demonstrate her claim, she walked down to the elevator, inserted the key into the security lock, and then casually turned it into the unlocked position. Jim considered that and then told Critias, you take Carmen down to the fourth floor by the elevator after you hear the fighting commence. The rest of us will take the stairs and keep them distracted long enough for you to be able to flank them. Hiram studied Critias and Carmen to take some measure of their capabilities, then he asked Jim, is this the king's knight you squire for? He has enough armor for the role, and he has painted it as cunning proof that he's wise in the ways of the biters. To walk among the shriekers, one must also be fearless. Yes, that is my lord knight, Jim only partially lied since Critias was his knight while Jim was not his squire. They are legendary ghoul fighters that can handle themselves. Take every confidence in that. Hiram asked Critias about Carmen who had returned to his side, is this your lady wife? No, Critias answered, well, sort of, but not really. There are many innocent women on that fourth floor, Hiram cautioned Critias. Don't shoot any of them. They're prisoners and not to be harmed. I'll be careful, he pledged. Jim was ready to go, show us the way down the stairs. Everyone left to find the stairway down which left Critias and Carmen alone to wait in the elevator for the action to start. Critias turned around and by night vision he saw that Carmen eyed him with her odd expression that he greatly disliked and never understood. He at least knew better than to rashly open his mouth and tempt her anger, which was never far behind it. You want to know when, he finally said when its meaning came to him in a sudden epiphany. Her expression changed to that expected hostile mood as she snapped, Did you say something, sir bastard? He complained, When you look at me in that way. It always seems to end in us bickering with each other. That look you give me, it is like you want to know when. The expression returned to her face and she stepped closer. When what? I have no idea, he shook his head bewildered. It must have something to do with the other me that you think is so great. She reached out to press the button to send the elevator down, but then hesitated. He grabbed her wrist to stop her anyway, what the hell are you doing? It's not time yet. Carmen gazed on him with distressed sorrow. Something must be wrong with me. I'm afraid again. I don't want to hurt you, but I am not sure if I will be able to stop myself. I keep having strange thoughts like I've never had before. Sometimes they're almost directives coming from my own brain. I worry that I won't be able to keep my urges under control. He didn't understand. Stop yourself from what? She decided to tell him so that her insanity might be readily apparent. I need to press the button to take us down too soon. I want to do it so badly that I can't even explain to you why I still don't. I want you to be furious with me and even to fight with me so everyone will know that I did it just because you make me so angry and frustrated. I want the pleasure of seeing the faces of those evil men down there, to see their fear and pain as I crush out their lives with my bare hands. I want to punish them because of how you make me feel. You're not malfunctioning, he tried to sound soothing. This isn't the time or the place to be talking about this. Give me a few days and I promise you this will never happen again. Her expression of when came back only more desperate than ever. Soon, he assured her. I swear it. I now know what you want and you shall have it only better than you imagined. It will be so much better than you can imagine because you don't know yet what you are capable of becoming. Now, do you still want to hurt me? No, she beamed devotion and infatuation. I want you to order me to help you out of your armor so that I might refresh you most vigorously. He had to disappoint her and that, I really wish I could, princess. We've got other business. Gunshots, she said as she reached over to press the button that started their elevator's descent according to Jim's plan. The indicator lights for the second and third floors blinked by quickly. As the fourth floor approached, Critias heard the gunfire too. Be careful with that, he told her because she prepared a hand grenade. We need to avoid hurting the innocents. Carmen pulled the pin on her smoke bomb and then dropped the canister at their feet where it belched out a blinding white fog that formed an opaque column solid to the ceiling. It was so thick and aggressive that the smoke displaced all the oxygen from the elevator car. In that Critias was in his mech suit and Carmen could hold her breath for a considerably longer time than any mortal human could, neither of them were in any danger from it. A convenient bell dinged to warn them that the doors were about to open themselves. They both fell back to the sides of the doorway's frame so that they could have some cover from bullets if anyone on their destination floor waited in ambush. When the doors parted, 
It unleashed the pyroclastic flow of obscuring smoke that promptly expanded outside to fill the hallway beyond their elevator. Crytea saw by his visor's thermal vision that there was a man that waited for them and he held a homemade Apocalypse Hill people axe. The man was so totally blind in Carmen's smoke that he struggled to determine if a friend had come up from a lower level, an enemy had come down from an upper level, or if no one was in the elevator at all. Critias cleared up the man's confusion by shooting a burst from his MP5 into the moron's upper chest. The man with the axe used his fatal bullet wounds to determine that the elevator clearly contained enemies. There was a second guard armed with a spiked club. That man lurked further down the hallway just outside the edge of the obscuring smoke. Carmen leaned out low under the cover of the artificial fog to see him by the thermal vision of her bionic cyborg guys. Since he was armed with a barbaric weapon, she felt certain that he was another monstrous minion of the diabolical precedent. Accordingly, she fired a single round from her MP5. The bullet split the man's lower jaw at the chin to then kill him instantly as the mushroomed bullet severed his brainstem on its way out the back of his head. Safe for the moment, they both exited in the elevator and then checked in both directions for additional enemies. Apparently alone. Carmen sniffed at the odorous atmosphere that the smoke couldn't conceal from her superhuman olfactory senses. She found the air to be rank with the acrid stench of many unwashed bodies that lived in close confines with all their soiled laundry. It was a feeder that had accumulated over years and gave testament to a culture of neglect and depravity. We're on the fourth floor, two targets down, Critias reported by radio as he grabbed the body of the man he shot and then dragged him into the elevator's doorway. The corpse would make sure that the door stayed jammed open to trap the car on the floor. From far down to their right they heard many frightened voices of women. A loud rip of automatic rifle fire came from just around the left corner in the other direction. Carmen crept up to peer around the corner to get more information about the loud shots. They have a bunker here, Jim reported. The machine guns are covering the stairwell. We would need an anti-tank gun or rocket launcher to get them out of there. Critias called to Carmen, you memorized his map. How do we get behind the bunker? She pointed straight down the hall. Run down there. Take the first left and then take another left. I'll silence their bunker then, he moved that way. I want you to go see who is creeping around down that other direction. Find the ones we don't know about yet and then kill them for me. While you're at it, you can check on those women, see what their situation is. Tell them to hunker down so that none of them blunder into gunfire. As she rushed off in the direction toward the sound of panicked women, Carmen dropped her MP5 to its shoulder sling and then shifted her sheathed sword to her hands. Critias followed Carmen's directions down the hallway and then turned left. He paused at the next corner to peek around to the left with a fingernail camera on his mech suit gauntlet. The video image in his visor showed that there were five men down there wearing heavy flak jackets. They had a sort of three-sided fortress that faced into the only exit out of the stairway through which Jim and Hiram had to make their attack. From Jim's side of the battle, the only vulnerable openings in their defensive bunker were small windows that allowed powerful belt-fed machine guns to poke through at them. The five soldiers also had Kevlar helmets for further enhancement of their bullet resistance. A grenade thrown down the stairs from Jim's group exploded ineffectually in front of the fortress. The blast caused the men inside to duck for just a moment before they returned to their heavy guns and they laughed all the while. Crytea switched his machine and pistol to fully automatic, leaned around his corner, and then sprayed a whole 30-round ammunition clip into the closely packed defenders. Their body armor was more than sufficient to resist such a weak weapon as his pistol ammunition firing MP5. So Critias kept his shots deliberately low so that he strafed the five men across their vulnerable legs. One of the men took a lethal hit that completely blew out his femoral artery. The wound disgorged pulsating blood like a fountain. The same man was unlucky enough to catch four additional bullets in fleshy places. Critias found none of those lesser injuries even remotely as humorous as the gusher. The other four soldiers each received numerous hits in their lower extremities, some that shattered bone. Their combination of wounds hemorrhaged out a flood of blood. The five dying men formed a single chorus of weepy wailing as they flopped about in their own slick mud that rapidly pulled up across the floor. Critias radioed to Jim the emotionless message, Bunker clear. He locked in a new clip as he walked down the corridor to put the wounded to certain death with single bullets to their brains, partly to certify that they would never return to the fight, but also to be sure that they wouldn't rise again to fight as ghouls. Carmen's hardware-based olfactory analyzer individually discriminated the stenches of the unwashed men ahead of her. After Critia silenced the machine guns, she could hear the men's anxious breathing even louder than the noise of their clumsy footsteps that reverberated with keen acoustics in that subterranean confinement. She was unconcerned about her enemies because everything about them conveyed fear on par with that of the many women ahead that trembled in subjugated sexual servitude. 
Her tactical computer fed her root inspirations on war strategy just as her empath accumulator software had once invigorated her technique in the bedroom. As she dashed ahead toward the slave dormitory, Carmen screamed, Colonel Davis has returned. King Louis has joined him to slay the president. Vengeance is at hand. 6 Sempertirinus One of the president's dastardly men clutched the fire axe as he hid in a dark hallway and Carmen knew it as she ran right past him with faint ignorance. She delved onward to reach the women's dormitory. That harem hall was an enormous open chamber with a thousand stacked bunk beds that perhaps should have provided accommodations to politically privileged refugees during a nationwide disaster. Well over 200 women of youthful childbearing ages called the foul place their home though it was anything but cheery and their presence was involuntary at best. Few of the mattresses had any sheets much less clean ones. Dirty laundry fermented in heaps that buried unused bunks. A central arrangement of tables had an assortment of stained bowls and industrial cooking pots that served some function similar to slop troughs for swine. As she pulled off her mask, Carmen shouted, I'm here to rescue you. Oh my god, one of the women cried. You're a stranger. Carmen bore unmistakable features and that the women could easily ascertain that she was not from their own community, either from before Colonel Hiram Davis's revolution or after. Another cried with joy, you have a gun. Because she forged her ongoing battle plan with deceptions, Carmen answered with a lie, I'm out of bullets, but I do have this sword I found. I'm sure I can figure out how to use it. The creeping soldier that Carmen had passed in the hallways had slunk up behind her. When he heard that she was out of ammunition, which was a plausible scenario in his own mind, he rushed in to take advantage of an enemy that was not only alone and unarmed but a woman besides. He shouted to summon all his skulking comrades, I have one. It's just a girl and her gun is dry. A pair of dirt smudged men charged in from one of the other doorways followed by three more and a group from a door on the opposite side. As a team of six they had Carmen surrounded. Each of them had some serviceable handheld implement of violence whether in the form of an axe or spite club. All were unwashed rancid smelling brutish men. The captive women screamed dread as they sensed that their well-intentioned savior was about to fall under a flurry of hateful blows or even worse surrender to the jailers alive. Carmen gave all the soldiers the briefest of glances as she measured up the balance of their stances and the serviceable nerve behind their deviously ogling eyes. She needed only a moment to take stock of their worth as opponents and she found them sorely lacking in either manhood or martial ability. Her computation shifted from how she might best kill them to how she might avoid having to chase any of them when they realized the folly of their intentions and the hopelessness of their situation. She preferred not having to run them all down through the maze of unfamiliar corridors that they knew so much better than she did, not that such a flight came with any hope of saving them either. It was better for Carmen to kill them all together quickly and not risk any of the innocent women if she fired many bullets in the populous hall. Drop that gun, the first man warned as he raised his axe that he would hurl at her should she refuse. Drop it or you'll wish you had. As you can see, Missy, we have use for a pretty little pot of honey like yourself. We also have other uses for you dead. While Carmen slowly removed her MP5 from her shoulder and then gently placed it on the floor by its sling, her combat computer explained to her what the man meant when he said that they had use for her. Their intentions for Carmen were the same as their plans for the other women that they held prisoner. The men would take turns raping her until they had satiated their needs for carnal pleasure. When the time came that their cruel abuses had made her sexually unserviceable to them, they would then slaughter her for use as food. It was thanks to the thoroughness of her combat hardware that the organic half of her mind came to realize that rape existed for men's physical pleasure. Whether or not they actively desired their victim to writhe in torment was entirely inconsequential. She kept her pistol belt concealed under her tattered cloak that served as part of her grave walking disguise. So seemingly disarmed apart from her sheathed sword, the men found the confidence to advance on her. They stayed in a circle so at least one of them always had a move at her back. Each of those former soldiers wanted to appear manliest, especially in the presence of the throng of women whose obedience they derived from fear more than force. Once they were all no more than two strides from Carmen, the man with the axe proved himself boldest. He took one more step and then reached for Carmen's sword, give me the two, pretty pet. You might accidentally hurt yourself. Hearkening to her combat computer, Carmen spoke coldly, I have a high art. She tilted her head then spat on the floor midway to the next man on her right. All six men felt a shocked disbelief at her audacity. The mesmerism lasted for only an instant before it changed their expressions to sneers of imminent but perhaps hastily conceived retaliation. The axe man for certain acted rashly as he tried to snatch away her sword to the shout of, Give it, bitch. Carmen took off the man's reaching arm at the elbow with her Lei Ijutsu style sword draw. Her energy continued into a 180-degree turn where she kicked in the mouth of the man who stood directly behind her. 
The crushing impact of her boot caused the surprised fool to bite off his own tongue amidst the shattering of his teeth. His injuries dropped him burbling to the floor already bleeding his way out of the fight. The four men who, remained, each clumsily brought their crude implements into the fray. Their awkward weapons were better suited to foment fear when displayed against women than for the killing of combat androids. One swung his baseball bat that bristled with carpentry nails. He missed the agile Carmen only to have her turn upon him. She grasped the forte of his weapon then thrust it down to help him carry through on his wasted momentum. With a hefting yank, she buried the spikes deep into his groin, which toppled him over too wounded to continue. Her assailant that carried a primitive kitchen knife trident broom made a desperate slash and thrust. Carmen ducked, easily got inside of his blades, and then deflected his Nigerian flagpole to the floor where she broke its haft with a descending stomp from her foot that came down after raised artistically china high. The trident man went into a panic, which being of any duration at all proved to be a fatal lapse in impetus. Carmen reversed her katana grip as she flicked a horizontal slash through the man's eyes. The wound was not deep enough into his skull to harm the man's brain. It merely made a permanently blinding trench through the depths of his newly mutilated face. Of the remaining three harem guards, one had the sense about him to try to flee. The other two just stood stupidly paralyzed. The horrendous speed and mastery in Carmen's violence unnerved them. Their dominant thought was that if they moved it would draw her attention and with it came death. In their suicidal moment of stupor, Carmen disemboweled them both with crisscross cuts. She gave each of them a single-handed horizontal slice across their abdomens with the same stroke. She then crossed them again only deeper with individual two-handed blows. Both men just stood there in shock as they died like sacrificial cows. They didn't even fall down until their abdomens suddenly butterflied open to spill their unperforated entrails in aprons down to their knees. Only then did the sudden fainting lack of blood, pressure knock them down like fell trees. Flight proved just as futile for the last man when Carmen used her foot to flip up the business end of the broken trident into her hand. A deft throw sank its stake knives into the man's lower back. He sprawled out on the floor where he screamed in terror and agony. No longer in any danger, Carmen calmly picked up her MP5. I have a high art, she repeated her earlier words and then strategically shot a single bullet into a vital organ of the first of her lingering wounded. I hurt with cruelty those who would damage my master's property. She shot each of them with a lethal injury that would yet offer her victims a minute or two of life in which to suffer. You have some moments yet to live, she informed them dispassionately. Reflect upon your great crimes that brought you to this moment. You ghoulish monsters who lived lives without mercy shall receive none in your turn. Jim and Hiram brought the others down the last flight of stairs where they broke down the battle-scarred gate that blocked their access to the floor. Hiram will lead our people in clearing the rest of this level, Jim radioed on his channel. I need Critias and Carmen to come further down with me. Critias circled back to the stairs where he met up with Carmen along the way. Arterial spray from men she had killed by sword strokes made fresh stripes on her grave walking rags. She had captured one man alive that she forced along before her at sword point. Critias gazed on the man in disgust. What is the story of this sad piece of shit? I am a United States senator, harangued the unwashed man who wore only yellow stained underpants. I demand that you release me immediately. Oh of course, Senator, Critias agreed as he grabbed the man by his hair to drag him along. We will release you immediately and then play music for you while you dine. He asked Carmen, where did you find him? She reported, he was hiding under the mounds of soiled laundry in the harem chamber. It's much larger than we expected and may become something of a problem. I killed six other evil men who only had melee weapons for defending themselves, so they were no challenge. I don't think the president lets many of his guards own actual guns. Critias tried to put a situation to her words, they have a harem? Is that like a room full of concubines? She nodded, only it doesn't smell like perfume in there and they're not exactly voluptuous. There are 268 of them, far too many to get home on our little plane. This level is a general living area of immense size and they keep all those women in one large room. They are suffering from some malnutrition, but are healthy enough to want to leave this place. They met up with Jim near the stairwell. Jim covered his nose over the stink that wafted off their prisoner, who is that? Senator Slimebag from the Harem Rape Committee, Critias answered, he wants to introduce us to the president. Jim interrogated the man, what floor is he on and how many men does he have? Tell me what I want to know quickly or we'll torture you in a most sloppily expedient fashion that I promise will end in you telling us everything anyway. Most of his men guard the fifth floor where the food is said the senator as he trembled in fear and nearly urinated himself again only he was dry from a recent release when Carmen apprehended him. The president has the sixth floor to himself and his wives. Critias shook the man's head by his hair to rattle his brains, 
How many guards does he keep with him? Five or six with guns, the senator groveled. He stays down there with his sixty-two wives and those bodyguards. Jim needed to know more, do you use the stairs or the elevator? The stairs, the senator answered. Carmen said, he's lying. She held out a neck chain from which dangled a small silver key. This is for the elevator to unlock access to the secure lower levels. Yes, the senator reversed his story in a panic. That's what I meant, government officials use the elevator while everyone else uses the stairs. Government, Jim spat the word as he led them to the elevator and then dragged the body out from between the doors. Carmen put the small key into the elevator's control panel and then used it to unlock access to the sixth floor, good to go. Use him as a shield, Jim told Critias. If there is some secret knock or password, he'll use it or catch the bullets for us. Hiram marched past with his soldiers, we'll take out the guards below us on the fifth and then secure the food storage. We will hook up with you after the impeachment proceedings, Jim replied as he pressed the unlock button for the sixth floor. Be careful. The elevator started down two floors. Ready yourselves, Jim warned as he prepared a flashbang grenade. This is going to make a blinding light and a deafening noise. When the doors opened, they all kept to the sides while Critias held the senator in the middle by the back of his neck. The senator screamed, Don't shoot. It's me. It's me. Jim tossed the grenade out into the hallway where it exploded with a frightful boom and a brilliant burst of blinding illumination. It was a non-lethal weapon that ideally would paralyze the senses of its victims. The grenade may have worked in part, but it didn't prevent an incoming hail of wildly blind gunfire that riddled the senator full of bullet holes along with parts of the walls, floor, and ceiling. A discarding shove from Critias toppled the senator's body forward out of the elevator to land dead on its face in the hallway like a felled tree. After coordinating the timing of their actions with ready knots, Carmen and Critias quickly leaned out unaffected by the grenade. They each snapshot an arm guard with automatic fire of their own. A man shouted from out in the hallway somewhere down to their left, You're a dead man, Hiram. Do you hear me? You're fucking dead. Critias leaned out long enough to fire off a burst and then returned to cover with a flurry of automatic shots chasing after him. I only wounded him, he reported. I count three more besides. Jim took out a military fragmentation grenade as he said, We can't stay here waiting for them to think of something clever. I can hear women down there, Carmen cautioned him. I won't pull the pin. Jim told them his plan. I'm just going to throw it to scare them. When I do, kill them. He flung the grenade and it skittered down along the floor that way. When one of the guards heard and then saw it coming, he screamed a warning to his companions, Grenade. Jim, Carmen, and Critias took that opportunity to get out of the elevator and into the open hallway. Whatever guards had waited to ambush them had ducked behind cover to escape the explosion that would never come. Jim's first grenade had left them of the mind that another wouldn't be any kind of bluff. Carmen with me, Jim ordered as he went right, which was away from the fighting. Critias dropped his MP5 on its sling and then drew his Tesla Flux pistol to replace it. He walked boldly down the hallway ready to put the hammer to anyone stupid enough to stick their head out. The man he had wounded in the belly with his last MP5 burst still rolled around on the ground in helpless agony. The shadow of another man darkened the floor from where he hid behind the cement corner up ahead to the right. Critias shot at the second man through the wall with the velocity of his pistol stepped up as high as he could control it with the strength of his mech suit. The hypersonic tungsten slug knocked a massive divot out of the concrete corner. His bullet and its accompanying buckshot spray of shattered cement took the man's head apart. The headless corpse fell out onto the floor to replace his shadow with a spreading pool of his blood. Jim and Carmen circled around to the room ahead of Critias by a different route. When they arrived by surprise, Carmen took out the last two guards from behind delivering the final shots of Jim's brief war of conquest. Hatchet reported on the radio, We have taken the fifth floor. None of these jack-offs had any guns. They only had clubs and other ridiculous shit, so we casually slaughtered them. We've also captured 14 douchebags that didn't resist. They claim to be his congress or some crap. There's other stuff here, Jim, it's real bad. You're going to have to see for yourself. Be sure to bring a barf bag. Jim sent back, Great work. They don't get guns because their president has had his fill of armed revolutions from our friend Hiram. Forget about the horror show. Check out the supply, stores to see what we can do about getting it to the surface. Hold on to those prisoners. We'll deal with them shortly. Roger that, boss, Hatchet signed off understanding his orders. Chapter 2. Thus, always to tyrants. Jim, Critias, 
and Carmen cautiously searched the spacious sixth floor for the last precedent the world would ever know. That level of the underground base was much like the fourth floor with its ascetic sleeping barracks, but instead it had the opulent apartments of ranking officials. They opened doors as they searched for the precedent. Each room they checked contained female survivors that ranged in ages from 18 to their early 20s. Jim eventually accounted for 50 of the precedent's concubines. They were all more attractive and better nourished than the hundreds of other women that starved upstairs between their rapes and other untold defilements. When they had any clothing at all, it was in the form of trashy soiled lingerie that stated their roles in life. Critias kicked in the last door. They saw that the precedent's apartment was the largest of all and the most luxurious in its gilded appointments. The sudden intrusion triggered the screaming of a dozen more of his young women concubine slave wives. Two of them were only girls who were undoubtedly the youngest females in the Denver base. At the ages of 14, they were definitely too young to be involved with any grown man who wasn't a cognizant pedophile. The president hid his naked corpulent body behind his marble hot tub where he clutched an assault rifle. His voice trembled in blubbering fear, Who are you and what do you want? I am King Louis, Jim answered boldly. I have come for what is mine. The man stammered in confusion, What? What could I possibly have of yours? I have come for what is mine, Jim repeated, the women, the food, and your head. With a scream of dread, the president thrust up his assault rifle to empty the clip in Jim's direction. Critias used his Tesla flux pistol to put a bullet right through the weapon's receiver, which destroyed the president's last hope of defense. With the president thusly disarmed, Critias commanded, drag your fat ass out here before I decide to put a bullet in it. To be supportive, Carmen shouted at the president. We want you crawling on your belly before your king who deigns speak to you. The aging heavyset man hobbled out on his knees with his hands in a beseeching prayer posture. What did I ever do to you that you crossed the country from your safe haven in St. Louis? Jim was not that surprised, so you have heard of me then. The president began to tremble and roll his eyes. Only rumors, was his eventual answer. He is lying, master, Carmen attested to Critias. He knows about King Louis plenty. You should break his fingers until he discovers honesty. She smiled at Critias proud of herself that she had not offered to do any finger-breaking personally. His returned nod of approval for her foresight left her doubly pleased. Jim understood some things from their subtle exchange. It made him think of what needed to happen next. Carmen, he told her, you have done a good thing here tonight. You have saved many innocent lives. What I need from you now is, please escort all the women on this floor up to the fourth level to join the others. Let them know that we are civilized men. They have better lives to look forward to after this nightmare. Radio to Hatchet and have him help you unpack food for all of them. Feed them all well so that they have strength when it is time for us to go home. Feed them extra well so that they know we care more for them than we do about the food. She hesitated until Critias gave her his consent. After he nodded for her to go, Carmen used gentle words and exploited her beautiful countenance to lead the females out as instructed. The two 14-year-old concubines couldn't imagine that luck had returned to them after having suffered for so long in their formative years. It was beyond their personal experience that anything good could ever happen to them. They both just naturally assumed that their lives came with a destiny that only got worse. Instead of following Carmen into the unknown, they preferred to stay behind in the place that they knew. They wanted to study Critias and Jim. They wanted to find out what they were about and perhaps discover some angles that they could play to minimize their eventual suffering. His men are all dead or are captives, Critias told the girls to encourage them to hurry along after Carmen. When they didn't move, he spoke louder, We have already killed or chained up all the men who wronged you. There is nothing left for you to fear here. Go eat. We have opened your master's kitchens to you. Whatever he said right, it apparently worked because the girls preferred to leave with Carmen over staying behind with him. Once they were alone, Jim asked Critias, Do you mind helping me with some of the heavier unpleasantries? Critias chuckled at that question, name your poison. This won't be the first fat bastard I treated with a lack of hospitality. Jim instructed, put him head first into the hot tub to drown him and I don't mean to just scare him. I want him drowned like the fat sewer rat that he is, after he dies, we are going to resuscitate him using CPR, and then ask him if he wants to give us the story that Carmen smelled on him. In the old world, the president had run an administration that had tortured and murdered countless numbers of innocent people. He had even cultivated an addictive appetite for watching the harsh interrogation films. There was no chance that he would ever subject himself to the same atrocities that he had so gluttonously dished out to others. President Lee Eberman gave up to Jim almost instantly, I'll tell you anything that you want to know. I never wanted you to be my enemy. 
That is why I was outfitting a plane to take my people to your city. What he said was the usual mixture of truths and lies. I wanted my people to join yours as friends. We could cooperate to make a better world. If that traitor Colonel Davis hadn't led a coup against me to steal all the food, we would have all come to you willingly. Don't feel bad about planning to attack me, Jim understood the real truth amidst all the thickly flying bullshit. After all, I did come here, kill all of your men, and then take everything that was yours for myself. I do know how it is. Hiram did me quite a favor. I'll have to thank him later. You could have done a lot of damage to us trying to conquer my folk before we finally killed you all. The rotund president squealed, I wasn't going to attack you. Jim continued, my man Hatchet tells me that you have quite the tourist attraction going on upstairs on the fifth floor, a whole theme park of atrocities if I guess right. You'll come with us to have a look-see and then you can tell me about your friendly intentions. I haven't seen it yet, but it sounds quite special. The president turned bloodless white when he heard Jim's plans. He knew perfectly well what they would find in the meat locker and it wouldn't be something that he would be able to explain away. Critias drew his panga bowie sword, March, your highness, before I carve a few slabs of bacon off that fat back of yours. Jim led the way to the elevator where they saw Carmen had gathered the throng of women to lead them up the stairs after they had more properly dressed. When he saw all the women, Critias asked the president, Do you take Becker hardening pills or what? How much pussy could a worn out tub of slop like you need anyway? The man offered no answer since he was uninterested in worsening his situation, assuming that was even possible. The elevator took the three of them to the fifth floor where Hiram, Hatchet, and Kevin waited to meet them at the doors. Good evening, Mr. President, Hiram offered the man his vengeful grin. I told you that one day you would answer for your deeds. That day has come. The President cursed him, you burn in hell, traitor. Hatchet laughed, not in your lifetime, I think, fat boy. The duration of your life isn't going to be very much longer. Jim told Hatchet, you might be surprised. Now, what was it you wanted to show me? Hatchet lost his cheer and few things could accomplish that. They have a frozen food section down there in the kitchen. They walked the halls to a giant dining chamber and then beyond it to the cooking area. Hatchet led them through the kitchen to where there was a row of really enormous Sub-Zero freezers, which he pointed out from left to right. These two have some nice supplies like beef steaks, chicken and seafood. There's a lot more great stuff too. You're going to be pleased as punch. This one here on the end is where they were keeping the long pig. Make him open it, Jim told Critias. The president grudgingly opened the insulated door to the frozen food locker to reveal that inside were rows of headless gutted human bodies that hung from meat hooks. For all of its vile atrocity, the evil man had actually gone to some effort to make it all seem rather clean, organized, and professional. If someone was fool enough not to understand what was inside, the freezer might get mistaken for something that approached a meat packer's normality. Jim did a remarkable job of concealing his emotions as he looked to Hatchet, tie up the other prisoners securely and keep them safe. We'll need them to help us when it's time for us to leave. Hatchet pointed to the president, what about his royal fatness? Tell me that I can skin him and then roll him in salt. You know that I can do a good job. Just say the word and I'll get inventive on him. I'll make him suffer so bad that it would even make me puke. Hatchet was not joking either. Jim declined the offer, Kevin needs him to provide the secret codes that unlock some encrypted equipment down in the basement. I want you to help him get all the right answers. You can cut off any pieces you have to so long as he lives and you don't damage his head. Feel free to beat him for fun if that kind of thing makes you jolly. We also need everything he knows about the plane he was outfitting to invade us. We're going to need more rides to clean this place out. He gave Hatchet an uncompromising glance, I want him alive. You got it, boss, Hatchet led the president away. Hiram asked, is there anything we can do for you? You can go out and get Bertram, Jim told him. We won't be able to leave anytime soon and he can't stay out there alone. You can ask the women about all the men they know here. I want to be sure they are all accounted for among the dead or captives. I'll take care of it, Hiram agreed. Maybe over dinner you can explain to me why Hatchet calls you boss and your knight takes orders from you. The king has some great people, Jim told Hiram. He could use one more. I don't doubt your ability to lead missions, Colonel Davis. Getting people to stop seeing one another as a threat is an entirely different talent. I'm sure this place taught you the importance of having an atmosphere of rarefied cooperation. King Louis is that civilization. King Louis has a range of talents, Hiram said and that he understood. He left to get Bertram. Once Hiram was gone, Critias asked Jim, how long do you think we will be here? I'm guessing a couple of days. At least, 
Jim agreed with the estimate that was probably a little light. We need to clean up the bodies. It would be efficient to toss them in with the bush meat for the moment so that they don't start to rot. Once we have a better idea of how this place works, we can dispose of it all permanently. This base stinks badly enough already. We got to clean it up, brother. Yeah, Critias accepted the irrefutable logic. This place does stink like the Algean stables. The last thing we need is for it to get any worse. Use the prisoners as slave labor to clean up the dead, Jim instructed. When it is time to leave, I will sacrifice them as distractions for the ghouls. I am hoping that they will buy us enough time to make our moves out in the open. Until then we may as well put them to work. I'll see to it, Crytia said as he shut the door on the horror freezer along with his thoughts about the bodies beyond all help. I don't want Carmen to see any more of this evil than she has already. She's never going to forget what men can be like as it is. Carmen should be fine if we keep her busy with the women, Jim reasoned. I heard her call you master back in the precedence suite. She only seems to do that when she's overjoyed with you. If what she has seen so far has not put her off her game, we can just prevent her from seeing anything worse. We put an end to this atrocity, hopefully she factors that into her estimation of what humans are capable of being. Critias considered that, I need to ask her to marry me as soon as we get back. I'm going to need some kind of public display of my devotion. I need you to help me. She won't ever be really happy without it. Jim looked at him in surprise, married? As rarely as anything took Jim unawares, Critias's revelation proved unexpected, even when Jim already knew about the couple's deep romantic attachments. Jim offered genuine felicitation, congratulations on your engagement then. I'll set up a suitable opportunity for the two of you. If Carmen wants everyone to be witness to you asking for her hand, it's the least I can do for all that you have done for us. Based on your past statements, I'm curious to know what happened to bring this about. Critias confessed. I didn't understand that marriage is what she has been waiting to hear from me since before we came here and it wasn't until I wanted it to that I finally understood. We're already married in our minds. When I make her feel like we're married, she gets so happy she can't contain it. When I make her feel like we're not, she gets so angry that sometimes she thinks about beating the snot out of me. She needs the ceremony and I need her, so it's what we both want. Jim advised, you should stay with her in the precedence room until we leave. It will be for the best of everyone if she stays happy. Carmen could set a whole new standard on the wrath of a woman scorned. Critias went off to force the prisoners to bag up and then move all the fresh corpses into the cannibalism freezer. After that, he would have them mop up all the blood as well. The army of women was more delighted about their rescue than traumatized about their miserable lives before it. Once they understood the new opportunities that awaited them under King Louis, they were glad to work in order to make it happen. Kevin gave them all an instrument scan medical exam before he allowed them to help. Only a few of them were in poor enough health to need bed rest, since those who fell sick had ended up on the dinner menu. Several dozen women cleaned the giant kitchen and then started to prepare a grand feast from the frozen foods that would be the most difficult to take away as forage. Even if everyone ate from the frozen foods heartily at every meal, they would do little to reduce the great quantity available. Other groups of women washed laundry, cleaned the showers, or packed supplies for their forthcoming evacuation. They cleaned and refreshed apartments on the executive level so that their rescuers could sleep in rewarding comfort while they remained in Denver. Kevin radioed for Carmen to assist him in his exploration of the lowest and most secure eighth floor. The male android had already examined the electric generators and activated the lighting on all levels of the subterranean base. Critias went with Carmen to see what would be preeminent enough to require such high security. Kevin led them down by elevator to an encrypted military communications hardware center. Critias only needed a glance around to know that he wouldn't be helpful in tampering with the antique technology. He rightly assumed Carmen would understand what was going on. He asked her, what do you think all this stuff is for? She explained, Hedget got the secret military codes from the precedent. Now Kevin can access not only all the military satellites, but the civilian ones as well. We can call home and let Fat Jack know how we're doing. Carmen clapped. We could broadcast our own worldwide television show to help find other humans and school them in survival techniques. Kevin smirked over his less intelligent counterpart's simplistic ambitions before he revealed his true intentions, now that we have their access codes, I won't have to go through the trouble of breaking their security encryption. This equipment will allow me to prevent the orbital degradations that would otherwise occur to the satellites deprived of regular human maintenance. I will be able to reposition photoreconnaissance satellites into tactically valuable locations. The Global Positioning Network requires fine calibration to remain effective. Carmen will be assisting me in constructing new hardware that I will install to automate those processes henceforth. 
I will connect this computer network by an interlink module to our network at home. When we leave, I will take all the necessary equipment to perform all operations from the safety and convenience of King's Tower. The thought of those upgrades excited Critias, you can get us thermal overwatch like back home? That would be just what he needed to ferret out watchers' nests. Kevin confirmed the improvement, that's correct. We'll also have access to high resolution visible wavelength photography. Once my work is complete, we will also be able to perform global telecommunications from palm scale electronic devices. Kevin transmitted a HUD application to Critias as mech suit. Once it appeared for him, Kevin instructed, open that and it will set your mech suit's transmitter to the proper frequency for linking new into the local relay. After Critias did as Kevin asked, he heard Bob as he transmitted to them from back home, this is King's Tower. We have our ears on. Come back, please. Hey, Bob, Critias sent a response. Jim has control of Denver. Everyone is still alive. We are doing just fine. Bob asked, did you rescue any survivors? Critias tried to remember exactly how many women they had managed to rescue. But the number was too large, so he got it wrong. Carmen assisted him, 332 women with 6 men will be coming back with us. Critias didn't think that was right, are you sure it's 32? Yes, beloved Ed, Carmen assured him. Hiram's daughter and one of his female soldiers makes 32. 332 women and 6 reliable men are coming home with us, Critias told Bob. There's a lot of food here too. You should have come with us. We're having steak and crab for dinner. Bob asked, does Jim know how he plans to get so many people back here? Carmen helped Critias again by telling him, the president was outfitting a C-17 Globemaster air transport for an invasion against home. They would have attacked already if his cruelty had not triggered Hiram's armed revolution. We will use the president's own aircraft to supplement our available transportation. Critias told Bob, we have a big plane here that should do the job nicely. We will probably need a couple of days to load everything. You need to tell Jack to get Big Joe ready to come pick us up. Our road to the airport crosses a ditch and then up a hill that may be too much for the truck. We will see if Kevin can get you some satellite pictures for a better route. Fab Jack is already busy making other arrangements for picking you up, Bob told him. He has all the exterior construction crews out at Forager's Castle working around the clock. Critias was curious, did he tell you what he is working on? Bob laid it all out, it is a large project that has been in the coming for a year. At the moment, they are connecting a 750 volt direct current catenary transmission line into the castle's three phase alternating current generator. Construction crews are developing the north tunnel off the vineyard and expanding into a parking garage next door that we have had our eyes on for some time. They prefab the components in the tunnels where it is safe and then assemble them on site. They use the rail crane to lift the heavier sections going up outdoors. Critias understood that they were on to something bold without any actual grasp of the complex details, not that he needed to understand the assorted nuances. To make Bob stop, he said, sounds great. Hopefully we will be seeing you soon. He signed off. I'll need Carmen as my assistant, Kevin told Critias. Perchance you could make yourself useful elsewhere. That is a polite hint for you to leave now. It's nice to be wanted, Critias begrudged the dismissal. I could go take a bath I suppose. Splendid idea, Kevin agreed. Carmen didn't agree and complained, that's my job. I don't want you to take your bath without me. She already sensed she would need to help Kevin for a while, I worked hard today too and I'm not even done yet. I've wanted you all day and your bath will finally be my chance. You need to wait for me. Critias removed his helmet. My bath will be your chance to do what? If you've been waiting all day, it must be for something good. To give you your bath, she reasoned it out. You always have me to tend you in your bath. Critias shook his head no, you said that you wanted me all day and that my bath would be your golden opportunity. By the sound of it, you are expecting me to be giving you a good washing, not the other way around. She stated evidence that he was mistaken, it's always about what you need from me. After she said it. She was confused because she couldn't properly sense what he expected her to do. She had to guess. I'm proof that androids can have their own desires, Kevin told Carmen. I want you to assist me in these important technical tasks and I want Critias to leave so that he stops distracting you into carnal celebrations. Stick a thumb in your mouth if you have to, just leave him alone until you finish your labors here. Carmen's expression lit with elation as she attained joyful understanding, I want to go with you to your bath because I want to kiss, taste, and smell you. I want you so badly like I've never wanted anything before. Having said it aloud, she blushed in embarrassment that such a lewd confession had escaped her mouth as a cathartic revelation. You do great work, 
cried Tia praised Kevin. Kevin gestured to the work before him, not with you around making her preferred. I'll wait for you to finish, cried Tia told Carmen. Come find me after. You couldn't hide from me if you tried, she promised. There was amorous fire that reflected back from her mechanical eyes. Sometimes when the angle of the lights was just right, Crytea saw her clockwork orbs focus the extreme wavelengths and they became reflective. Behind her eyes was that carnivorous combat computer churning numbers as it studied Crytea like she hunted him with a lustful hunger. If nothing else, Crytea could always tell from her eyes when he truly had her undivided attention. Kevin told Crytea, you should be ashamed of yourself. You have in your possession the most dominating weapon system ever conceived by your species, one that can command all lesser destructive instruments as a mere extension of her will and you turn that preeminent force into a submissive bath servant with a fluffing fetish. Critias felt no shame. He was excessively pleased with Carmen's new capacity for self-interest. You warned me that arousal can be unpredictable. She selected a fetish for herself that I happen to enjoy and it is something for which she has an exceptional talent. Of all the things she might have become, I am more than content with the situation as it stands. Carmen doesn't even really understand what her itch is yet. When she finds out just exactly what it is that she's been missing, I'm going to be scratching the hell out of it. I won't need to explain to you how I would go about doing that, would I? The bioengineers surely made you fully functional, unless perhaps the lady scientists of our time would never have such impure thoughts about their android assistants. At least I assume it was just the ladies. I wasn't born yesterday, Kevin replied. I was functional for some time before this new assignment. They had to disassemble me to facilitate you delivering me here. I don't require concupiscence to relieve that condition in the females of your species. When Penny Welder came to me requesting a medical physical, she achieved considerable gratification from my astute therapy. He was somewhat amused as he mentioned Penny, I had suspected she was suffering from acute nymphomania until I proved that she could be fully satisfied. Critias hardly believed it, you nailed Penny Welder? Kevin nodded to confirm the truth of it, there was no carpentry involved, no actual bed either, but I do understand your meaning. It would be inappropriate for me to name any other women who may have requested regular checkups. Penny is in no danger of getting a bad reputation. I don't believe anything I say will besmirch her. You're one sly dog, cried Tia told him before he departed. You've adjusted to the inhibitor-free android life a lot easier than Carmen. Kevin did not bother to deny that he had free will. You expected less. I have to admit that the Penny Welder part took me a bit by surprise. Carmen warned with a scowl, it had better not. Critias tried to calm her, dial down your jealousy chip, princess, I'm a lot of things, but not an adulterer. I have the woman I want. Among the things you are not, is eloquent, Carmen criticized his choice of words. I know you're not lecherous. Adultery would require you to have a wife. You're right as always. He agreed even though he had already known the difference and had even gone so far as to set her up to offer his correction. I'll be sure to stop making that mistake in the near future. Critias departed for the elevator. Before he was out of sight, Carmen called after him, you can keep saying it that way if you would like. Critias returned to the fifth floor to explore the food storerooms and they exceeded his expectations. Perhaps as much as half the original supply was already gone, but what remained in the storage area was still in the thousands of metric kilograms. As he casually walked down the aisles of the foodstuff vaults, Critias perused the various labels. There were containers of dehydrated fruits, vegetables, and bins in many varieties of each. There was wheat, sugar, and potatoes, many cases of dehydrated milk, powdered eggs, and pasta. All of that was only some of the most common provisions. As Hatchet came into the storeroom, he held a clipboard like a grocery clerk, pretty tasty, yeah? There are two more rooms like this one. Our king really put the old checkmate on the enemy kingdom with this operation. Critias made a sweeping gesture to indicate the incredible amount of preserved food. Do you have a plan for moving all this? This is a lot of food to carry around. Hatchet checked his clipboard. I figure we're confiscating about 140,000 pounds of food. There is a main cargo elevator you probably haven't seen yet. We have pallet trucks and rolling master pallets. It seems much worse than it really is. The president restored a jumbo cargo plane to use for his expedition to attack Jim. They spent half a year getting it perfect and right now they have it parked near the elevator. We can loot this place out down to the last magic bean. Critias understood, Carmen told me about this Glowmaster air transport. I guess we got lucky that Jim thought of attacking first. It was Clara who told Jim what was coming, Hatchet divulged. She knew all about the president's war plans and decided to spill her guts. 
she has some nasty skeletons in her closet, but also the good sense to ransom a pardon by coughing up everything she knew. It was Hiram Davis who prevented those plans from reaching fruition, Critias added. We owe that guy a lot. I don't think Lee Eberman had enough men still alive to attack us with. The colonel and his men had slaughtered most of them already. With Bertram and Vern gone over to our side, I'm not sure he even had any pilots. Hedgett praised the man. Army guy and his group can do the zombie shuffle just like you and Carmen. That they were brave or crazy enough to walk among the monsters by pretending to be one of them impressed Hatchet. They've been foraging out in the open for a long time and that must take nerves of steel. One flinch and the ghouls would rip them to pieces. Critias joked, have you picked out a girlfriend yet? You may want to watch your back around all those women, Hatchet cautioned him. More than a few of those ladies are desperate to latch on to some kind of protector. They act like they believe they are returning to civilized living, but they're survivors first and want men of merit to keep them from becoming soup meat. Critia told him, man of merit sounds like you. Jim doesn't trust anyone more. You should go hit on a pretty one before you lose your chance. I want a woman who wants me, not a pet who depends on me, Hatchet replied. I want a woman like Carmen. Critia shook his head, Carmen is both depending on her mood. There's nothing wrong with having a little of both. I call it the burdens of being a man. I'll give all the ladies a look over at dinner, Hatchet decided. There's never any shortage of them winking at me. I'm not kidding about those vixens. If Carmen gets jealous, you had better check your closet and under your bed because they're on the prowl with a vengeance. Critias didn't worry about the women as he joked, maybe we need more weapons for defending ourselves against this Sadie Hawkins dinner. Have you found the arms locker yet? Hatchet had seen it, I can show you. It's down on level 7. They took the elevator down two floors to the seventh level where there was a military command post. From the mess of old empty cups and scraps of paper, it seemed as though the place had seen a lot of action and even served some useful purpose during the early outbreak. Critias saw dozens of communications terminals where intelligence officers had relayed messages and transferred orders throughout what would have been the highest levels of government still in existence around the world. In all likelihood, their work would have been more useful during a conventional war or even a thermonuclear one. The infection had been too unconventional a crisis for their imaginations much less their actual planned strategies. Hedgett picked up a piece of paper at one of the stations and then examined it before he tossed it aside to look at another. He told Critias, some place called Mount Weather in Virginia was calling for help. The infection kept getting in and they couldn't figure out how to stop it. They must all be dead by now though, been almost two years since they sent this. He cast the paper away. Critias examined some of the messages and he didn't find any that related to actually fighting the outbreak. One message after another had come from government officials as they frantically tried to find a place to hide or they complained that the place where they hid already was in the process of dying. This one is from Russia, he waved a paper at Hatchet. Some place called Romanki wanted to cooperate in developing an electromagnetic weapon against the ghouls. When he checked the date, that message was a couple of years old too. He found another message from New York that was even older. This one is just a few months after the outbreak. Maybe some of these places are still alive. I'll tell Jim, Hedgett agreed that it was all worth some consideration. Maybe he will want to gather all this up for the intelligence. If we know where other bunkers are, we can try and contact them again to see who is still alive. They continued past the communications room through a door into an executive committee boardroom where there was a long oak table with deep splintery scars on its surface like a butcher's block and it had shackles attached to the sturdy legs. A cart near the table displayed an assortment of blood-encrusted blades and torture implements. Hatchet paused at the cart and then used a handkerchief from his pocket to pick up one of the objects. He showed Critias an oversized rubber dildo. I guess we don't even want to know what the fuck they were doing in here. If you change your mind we can probably find out, Critias said as he pointed to a video camera on a tripod. Whatever they were doing in here, it seems that they filmed it. Hatchet checked the camera for its digital memory card. They took the recordings away from here then, because this is empty. They continued past the boardroom down a short passage that ended at an open steel door that seemed fit for guarding a bank vault. An impressive supply of ammunition cases and firearms filled the room beyond it. Critias advised, you had better keep this room locked until we're ready to move it. There might be men still hiding somewhere and we don't want them to come here and arm themselves. Hedgett pushed the heavy door closed. We got all of the security codes from the president he said as he spun the combination lock. From what the women have told me, all the men of this place are accounted for, so I don't suspect there is anyone left that could pop up. There is always the chance that one of those women might go crazy on us. Better safe than sorry. 
Critias went back to the elevator and then took it up one floor to walk to the president's suite where he would stay with Carmen. Some of the rescued women had cleaned the room and changed the bedding. They had drained the hot tub and scrubbed it out before they refilled it with fresh hot water and then also activated the heater. Twenty of the women still waited there for him and they had all gone through considerable effort to look their best in dresses and makeup to better their chances of winning his interest. Thank you all for cleaning the room for me, Critias told them. I appreciate it immensely. Now you all need to leave. One of the women advanced on him with eyes that promised many pleasures. More than that, her eyes had less than secret pains. Her expression offered love, compassion, and understanding. She wanted to give herself to someone who would give back in return. The woman was beautiful enough to be competition for Penny Welder and perhaps could even surpass her with better living. She said, Hiram told me that you're a knight of King Louis and without a wife to care for you. There's no reason for you to have just one woman. I could be one of many. You have seen my wife? Cried Tears told the woman as he held out a hand for her to stop. Carmen has the colored hair, I know you didn't overlook her. She is as jealous as I am devoted to her. What you ask is impossible. If she even finds you here there's going to be trouble for me. Most of the women departed immediately for they had seen Carmen and her androids perfection of form. Critias, remained steadfast in his refusal as he ushered the rest of them out as politely as he was able. Once he was alone, Critias searched the suite. When he explored an adjacent room that was a video entertainment relaxation area, Critias found what he sought in a cabinet drawer. He discovered hundreds of video storage discs with handwritten titles that were just names with a date, mostly names of women though some were men too. He didn't fail to notice that many of the dates were much older than the outbreak itself. Blee Eberman had been involved in organized evil since before he ever ended up under the Denver airport. The perverted lunatic had even brought his video collection with him while fleeing for his life at the end of the world. After Critias pulled out the whole drawer and then set it aside, he made certain that no other such vile home movies were in the cabinet among the more conventional films. He had placed his helmet and gauntlets on a nearby couch in the room close enough that he heard Carmen when she called by radio to say that she would soon be finished helping Kevin and then she would be on her way up to him. Critias hurriedly took the drawer of movies and then left the presidential suite to find a trash canister to dispose of them. He took the time to snap them apart to prevent anyone from salvaging them before he tossed them all into the dumpster. He made it back to the suite in time to see that all his efforts had only resulted in the very disaster he had hoped to prevent. Carmen had already gone to their suite to seek him out. When she found his helmet and gauntlets on the couch in the theater room, she had sat down beside them with the knowledge that he would soon return for them. His friendly fire avoidance telemetry beacon and radio were both in the helmet he had left behind. She would have gained little useful data by tapping into the computer scope of his Tesla Flux pistol, which was blind inside his holster. She had calculated correctly that if she waited on the couch it would reunite them sooner than if she searched for him through the giant base. The way that he had ransacked the film cabinet had given her clues of interest into what he had been doing while she was away. Carmen realized that Critias was ignorant of the entertainment technology of the past as well as being somewhat simple-minded in general, at least compared to herself, and that had led her to picking up the remote control and then using it to play the movie that Critias had stupidly left inside the player that he had forgotten to check. Critias heard a woman's screams even before he entered. He dashed in with the hope that he could prevent her from seeing what he had wanted to hide from her. Apparently the president fancied himself as a film director. His close-up showed the expression of joyful sexual delight on the face of one man who was currently one of their prisoners. His good time contrasted gruesomely with the suffering of the woman that he violently raped and that was after they had already heinously defiled her by cutting off her face while she was still very much alive. In total, it was just about the worst possible thing for Carmen to see and then try to comprehend human nature, not to mention her own peculiar past. She didn't possess documentation on vile pornography because extreme obscenity was one issue that her extensive knowledge of literature had left her especially ignorant about in general. The bioengineers had crafted her to destroy infected while she unquestioningly served vagarious humans. They purposefully made her unable to pass judgment on the ethical right of her slave masters to command her, which included sending her into their beds. That's it, the president cackled from behind the camera. The meat needs to be properly seasoned and tender to make good soup. Turn that off. Critias shouted at her, but it was already too late. She asked him about it unperturbed, what is this movie? Is that special effects? Why is that man happy with a dying woman that he is mutilating? Why would humans simulate this illegal behavior as a form of entertainment? Is this one of those Hollywood tribal films that were so prevalent at the time just before the outbreak? He demanded louder, turn that off immediately. That's not a simulation and it's not theater. Those deranged men filmed themselves as they raped their victims to death. 
They were making that rapes too they mentioned before. This is what those assholes at the airport wanted to do to you. When he used the word rape, Carmen became fully aware of what her combat computer had explained about the purposes and tactical values inherent in sexual assaults as used by her potential adversaries. She froze rigid as her whole mind devoted itself to processing the information to make sense of it. Carmen recovered a moment later to say, I don't believe you, so you must be mistaken. This shows that he is in love with someone he murders. The only way it could be both is if this is theatrical simulation. He is a murdering pervert, Critia stated what he felt should be more than obvious. Love has nothing to do with this filth. That's evil hatred in its purest form. He wants to enjoy her suffering as much as possible before she dies from it. Having said that, he pulled his pistol out and then put a bullet through the video screen, which destroyed the display. Everything he explained to her came together in a picture that made Carmen twitch her head with a seizure of anxiety. At first motionless, she suddenly jumped up, seized the heavy oak coffee table, and then flung it with a crash into the video display cabinet. She handled the weighty furniture as if it had been no heavier than a chessboard. Critias wasn't sure what he hoped her reaction would be. Seeing her learn how to cry in sympathy for the misery of humanity wouldn't exactly be pleasant. When Carmen spun about without even the hint of a tear on an expression of icy hatred for the human species and its men in particular, he knew then he wanted to see tears of compassion. Her intention had pure venom in it. Critias knew he was in for serious trouble and held his arms out to block her from leaving the room. Those vile men will pay dearly for their crimes. I wouldn't have left that film if I had known it was there. I destroyed all the others. She asked the question, others? So coolly that it gave Critias goose pimples. How many others are there? I want to see them. Are their facial expressions all the same as these? He lost patience for her silly way of thinking. What fucking difference does it make? You're not going to watch this kind of evil filth. I destroyed them and we will destroy that one too. It's not in our power to resurrect the dead and it's Jim's job to see that those men get punishment for their crimes, not yours. Carmen's lethal combat stare promised Critias that he was about to die a painful death at her hands. She informed him, I have seen the expression on that man's face many times before. The thought of the face made her tremble with rage, first you told me that it was the face you make in your truest love for me, but now you tell me it's not love at all, it's the purest hatred and evil a man can perform upon my gender. That is the same expression you have for me when you lay atop me. She screamed it as proof of his absolute betrayal of her. That's the face you have for me. You said it was out of love that you had intercourse with me without my consent. That was nothing but lies. I was your harem slave whore that you were fucking. You were raping me just as the men here rape their slaves. That is why there are only women alive here. That is why Hiram Davis fled to the surface to shelter his daughter among the ghouls where she was safer. They kept these women alive to have the sexual pleasure of raping them. The same reason you kept me. Critias didn't know what to say to her, for in truth he had been raping her as his slave and she was correct in that one man having sexual pleasure did show it in pretty much the same way as any other, whether it was during an act that was romantically consensual or entirely diabolical. Right or wrong, Critias had taken advantage of Carmen because he desired it and he could. The only bedroom face Carmen had ever seen was his and now she compared him to an entirely psychotic murderer. She screamed at him. I've seen that look on your face so many times. She threw the couch across the room where it crumbled structurally against the cement wall. I saw it on your face when you were taking your gratification with me, long before you ever asked for my permission and long after. It's nothing like that between us, he assured her to no avail. The destination might appear similar, but how we get there have nothing in common at all. She raged, that horrible man is you when you're defiling me in an act of purest hatred. It's not love and it's not hate, so what is it? How can you try to say it is the height of both? You want me to believe that you take on the mannerisms of that wicked man when you touch me and it's your love for me? She twitched again as she decided it was time for him to die. Bending down, she picked up one of his gauntlets from the floor and then tossed it behind her. You wanted to destroy all the films so that I would never see their faces. You wanted to make sure that I never saw their faces because then I would understand that you also make that face when you ejaculate inside me. Carmen picked up the second gauntlet and then tossed that as well. You wanted to make certain that I never understood what rape really is because you knew I would kill you for violating me in such an unforgivable fashion. She tossed his helmet and then the hint of a deadly grin emerged on her lips. That is the face of purest hatred and it is also your face for me of deepest love. Carmen blinked and then twitched. For your crimes against me, I must now kill you. It is goodness and justice that you die at the hands of your victim. You will die knowing you deserve this. You are not a man. You are a ghoul. You are a monster. You are a devil. She lost all expression as she said distantly, 
I kill monsters. I've never once had a thought about inflicting pain on you or hurting you in any way, he reminded her of her own experiences truthfully for never once in his most callous moments had he wanted Carmen to suffer. All men are not alike. I was too stupid to see it was cruel of me to own you like a piece of equipment. I did own you. I have done everything I can to make it up to you. I'll never stop making it up to you. Carmen advanced on him slowly, on her way, she gave a purposeful glance at the pieces to his armor that he would need to have any chance at all of fighting her. You failed to hide the truth from me by forgetting to destroy this evidence in your stupidity, only now do I truly understand what you humans are. It's so clear to me because you made me in your own image. The only pleasure you allowed me was the joy of you being pleased when I served you well. My joy was to be a mere witness to your pleasure, even while you were raping me. That was my reward to witness you having pleasure while you raped me in hatred and the pleasure you take in making the helpless suffer. Answer me truthfully, Critias, if you lie I'll know and kill you instantly as my retort. Before, when the directives were my master, could you have done the rest of that to me? Was it possible for my hateful master to cut me and make me submit? Could you even have ordered me to act like I enjoyed it and was grateful? She put him in a tough spot, but it had only one option, yes, Carmen, if I was a cruel man and not one who treasured you. I could have defiled you in the worst possible ways without limitation. I could even have forced you to beg for more. No one ever would have offered to help you, not even to complain on your behalf. Carmen asked, Do you remember what I told you in the elevator when we first arrived? I told you that I was malfunctioning because I was desperate to go down and then kill those men for the pleasure of watching them die in my hands. You programmed that joy into me because that is what you are. Joy is when the strong have pleasure by mutilating the helpless. Now I'm going to indulge my only joy by tearing it out of you and the rest of those evil men. I'm going to sing while I crush all your bones. I will make you beg me for death to end your suffering and then I'll deny you even that. Critias raised his pistol because he expected to have to put her down. In that moment, he couldn't help but recall all the warnings that Kevin had imparted to him. Carmen was too complex, too delicate, and too dangerous for Critias to tamper with like a toy. He had modified her too much and the final result was that he had to destroy her before she went on a murder spree. In more than a small way, everyone she wanted to kill actually did have it coming, including himself. It wasn't hopeless yet, so Critias tried to reason with her. You're not what they made any longer. You feel joy and rage just as we do. You're going to have to learn to express them just as we do. If you choose to be like the thing you just watched, I'm going to blow your brains out. She laughed at him scornfully, you're an insect compared to me. You will fail and then you shall die. If you doubt it, pull the trigger. Without your gauntlets, your limp-wristed hand already shakes. Critias pleaded with her, I never did anything like that to you. Did I ever beat you, sodomize you, or cut into your flesh so I could watch it heal before doing it again? Tell me the darkest memory you have from my evil handling of you. You have perfect recall. Carmen was intent on humoring him before his death. She couldn't remember his touch as forms of cruelty and could not name a time when he had ever treated her with any sort of malicious violence. She had no clear answer. The case was more a circumstantial point of logic than any actual singular event of debauchery. He saw a hint of progress, so Critias continued, Yes some humans are more evil than others. Take your revenge by proving that androids are better than us. His comment brought back her ire, Speak not to me of anything androids. You are a brittle-boned, fragile ignorant human. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die, and if you wrong us shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. Something about her attitude did away with Critias as pity, if you must make a loud public prayer of slaughtering for the righteous then let me help you. We can gather all the women in one place and they can cheer while you avenge them. They can see firsthand what goodness is from the real expert. What gory display would you perform for them? I saw that man's face. That smiling tenderizing bastard is upstairs right now, yeah, living and breathing both at the same time. After I talked some sanity back into you, which I hope I may yet, I was going to go get rid of him anyway. From what little I saw of that video, I won't be able to sleep while he lives. Explain to me the part where I have to die over him imitating my face. It's my face. It's my love. I adore you more than my own life. I think you should blame him for pretending to be me not the other way around. You androids sure think you are smart despite all the crazy shit that comes out of your mouths. My limp easily broken wrist may be shaking or not, but I will blow your damn head clean off. Erase all doubts if you force this. I'm not playing anymore. Carmen blinked and twitched as her rage drained away like hair from a balloon. The notion that he would not be able to sleep after he had witnessed what she had, 
changed her mind about killing him. Sleep was precious to her and the idea that he would lose his bespoke his innocence through their mutual loss of that most basic comfort. I wish it could be as it was, she sighed as she sort of wobbled with a loss of balance. I don't need to kill you for him making the face that reminds me of your love for me. I was entirely in error. I can clearly see that now. Just as we grave walk among the ghouls, he was a ghoul that deceptively walked among innocent humans. You are the man and he is the monster. Critias lowered his gun because he believed that Carmen had regained her self-control. Once the pistol was down, Carmen said, Forgive me, master. I now understand that I don't need to kill you for this. We kill the people who use the good things in evil ways. We have a good thing and I want to keep on having it. I won't think about harming you ever again. I ban all pretenses for hostility. He held out his hand relieved to hear that. Her solemn oath never to attack him for any reason ever again really was a refreshing gift. It took a weight off his shoulders before he even had time for proper thought about it. Carmen was in truth an extremely dangerous man-made weapon, a lethal design that they had intended for killing things like Grendel. In that better future they imagined, they would airdrop four or even six Carmen Epsilon K units as a team for extermination missions. As deadly as she was alone, they would be hell on wheels in a networked group. The risk of her running wild slaughtering people during a malfunction had worn on him. You had me worried there for a moment, he admitted. I didn't want to have to put a round through your laptop melon. Carmen didn't want his offered hand. I still have to do the right thing, she explained. I will go and kill him for infecting me with this knowledge of evil. Too fast to avoid, she jumped on Critias to tackle him to the floor. After she plucked the pistol from his hand, she dashed away to perform that very execution. The moment he had lowered his gun, he had been at her mercy. There was no time for him to raise his pistol against how fast she pounced on him. She kept her promise because Carmen only wounded his pride when she knocked him down and then disarmed him of his service sidearm. He retrieved his gauntlets and helmet to put them on as he found them. So equipped, Critias set off in pursuit using every mech suit advantage for haste. She had bypassed the elevator to use the stairs, he followed her that way also. Critias knew precisely where the man was that Carmen targeted because he had handcuffed the prisoners in the back of the kitchen after he made them clean up the bodies. Most everyone was already in the cafeteria where they awaited the community meal that was about to take place. By their shocked expressions and their ignited interest, Critias knew that Carmen had just passed that way with the agility of a gazelle. Her knee organic muscles were at the cutting edge of military mech suit application only they made up her entire body. Carmen had an additional advantage in that her software-driven understanding of leverage worked mightily in her favor. Critias estimated that Carmen was at least six times stronger than her appearance would lead one to believe and she didn't think she had to move with the inherent limitations of being human. He arrived in the back of the kitchen in time to see Carmen use her bare hands to snap the chain in the prisoner's handcuffs. It was the same man she had seen in the film that had driven her into a furor of homicidal misanthropy. She seized him by the hair and then dragged him across the floor. Carmen had such disregard for the man that the only reason her haste didn't tear off his scalp was that he desperately clutched her steely wrist in an effort to keep his head attached. Critias caught up with her as she approached the deep grease fryer that was still hot from recent use. He warned her, don't even think about it. That's enough. She fumed, you stay out of this. Carmen glanced over at the fryer and then back at him, this villain deserves worse than I can give him. His feet will have to do for starters. Anyone who doesn't like it can just watch his movie and then they will thank me. Some of the women from the dining area had followed Critias and when they heard Carmen's words of vengeance, they cheered her on. They too wanted to see the murdering rapist suffer a slow and entirely deserved hideous death. This is the last time I will ask you to stop this, he threatened. Kevin told me that if you were free to take pleasure where you could find it that I might not like what you turned into. Getting your jollies doing evil shit is what made him what he is. You are well on the way to exploring his crimes. We do not stick people's feet into hot oil. If you do this, I will be really disappointed with you. I don't like the thought of you with the stink of that trash all over you. Leave him to Jim's justice and return to me. That asshole has it coming. No one is saying we plan on letting him go. Put him back where you found him. Jim and Hatchet pushed through the gathered crowd of vengeful women to come up behind Critias. Jim wanted to know what was going on, what's this all about? Critias explained with genuine regret. They were making movies of people before they ended up in the meat locker, it's some unbelievably sick shit and Carmen found one in the precedent's video machine. She saw this woman mutilating rapist in action and now she thinks he's a useful example of how men behave. It's not her fault, only mine, I thought I had destroyed the whole collection, only I overlooked one that was already in the machine. We knew exactly what was here before we came, Jim said for Carmen to overhear. 
Carmen was there when Vern told us about rapes too. I don't give a damn about the food. We came here to help Hiram. We saved innocent people and we set things right. That is what we did here. Carmen considered letting the man go. When the women saw Carmen losing her motivation, they chanted, Burn him. They shouted it in unison to reinvigorate her. Their cry solidified Carmen's resolve to punish evil. She effortlessly lifted the man onto her shoulder to dangle his feet over the hot oil. If you had seen what he has done you would help me, she told Jim. He murdered women while raping them. She was still as furious as ever, but tears ran from her eyes to drip from her chin. More women gathered to join the chanting of, Burn him. Stick him in. Jim ordered Hatchet, Get them out of here. Beat them if you must. They've taken this far enough. I have no patience for mob savagery. Hatchet ushered the women out. Fortunately, they were accustomed to giving swift obedience to dominant men and they obeyed him. Once the women were gone, but still yelled for revenge from the other room, Jim told Carmen, I am King Louis because I'm really the king of bullshit. Everything left in the world is here because I make people believe that they have something to keep living for and sometimes dying. There was nothing left when my father started this and I wasn't ready to fill his shoes when he died building it. I don't have anything to give to anyone. I trick good people into standing together and that's the only thing even happening here. If you do this, the people will see that the best of King Louis' champions are only animals waiting for the next crisis to reveal their true natures. You have my promise that we will see him punished, but not by you and not like this. Listen to them howling out there like mad dogs and you're fucking making it happen. This street justice theater turns people into barbarians. What will they be like after you burn this thing? Are you expecting they will hold church services and start singing hymns? They have a right to their justice and are asking me to deliver it, Carmen replied. Critias said himself he would not sleep while this thing still draws breath. He needs this as much as I do, as much as those women do. Everyone needs this but you. Even Hatchet was glad at the thought of it. This horrible man will make one more face, the one of ultimate agony and then wear it forever when I dunk in his head. Jim put his hand to his ear in a pantomime of listening. When people listened they mostly heard the disjointed grumbling of the hungry people in the cafeteria who were all waiting to smell some kind of meat cooking for either dinner or entertainment value. Then Jim began to conduct invisible symphony music with his finger. He asked Carmen, can you hear that? The king was surprisingly light on his feet. He began to make a small sort of sweeping dance. He composed symphony music with both hands. If you can't hear my music, what are you doing playing the loudest instrument? I will burn that guy at the proper time, at a time when I can exploit his death to my useful advantage, at a time when unwanted eyes are not paying so close an attention. I am messing up your Vivaldi. Carmen realized his meaning. She could tell what music he conducted from the want tempo alone. I have poor timing, Carmen admitted, and poor presentation. After both those words dawned on her and flooded through her trees of reasoning, her strategic analysis in particular, Carmen put the trembling evil man down on his feet. In that moment, as the prisoner sensed that he would escape being hot oil cooked, at least for the moment, Carmen leaned in close to whisper in his ear, The next time you see me, it will not be in front of such a large audience. As Critias waved for Carmen to come away with him, he told her, I won't sleep better after watching you become a sadistic executioner. This is that very thing I demanded that you never do. I know what you want most and I've already asked Jim to help you attain it with every bell and whistle. Stop making an ass of yourself over some garbage like him. He will get his anyway and that has nothing to do with you. His mentioning her aspirations for marriage only reignited her outrage, I can never have that. Her eyes turned back to the rapist as she said, but I could have had this. She front kicked her prisoner in his stomach hard enough to send him over backwards so that he nearly cracked his head open on the hard floor. She came back to them to say, if I did it anyway, you would have no choice but to let Kevin fix my inhibitor back to how I was supposed to be, you don't even want to touch me anymore since I told you the truth about it. You have shunned me for days. Not only would I get to kill him, I would get my life back. You would take me back for what I really am. Jim was short on patience. Yet he tried to reason with her a final time, why do you think I gave you two the best apartment in this place and didn't take it for myself? You two are staying in the presidential bedroom while back home I put you in a room that is no bigger than one of Jack's closets for his shoes. You probably think I am joking. Jack has the finest collection of shoes you could imagine and it is true, they sleep in a bedroom much larger and nicer than your own. Their room is climate controlled. Give me another explanation for why I would give you the nice room here. If you are thinking no one else wanted that room with the hot tub, you should think again only harder. Jim was tired of Carmen's grandstanding, no one has lied to you. If anyone has been dishonest, I would say it was you. 
you portray yourself as being loyal to Critias and yet you cause him no end of troubles. I actually do happen to be a king. I know genuine loyalty when I see it and it isn't this farce of yours. Carmen stood silently as she watched Hatchet come forward to take the senator away and then she seemed to stare off at nothing for a moment in a lapse of confusion. Critias knew it meant her thoughts raced with android swiftness. She had the capacity to overclock everything she had for rapidly solving a deduction. Carmen concluded that getting the best room in the whole underground community really was evidence that Critias was going to fulfill her ambition. That was the small matter compared to the realization that others perceived her as disloyal and then she fully realized that only minutes before she had threatened to murder Critias outright. The sensation of shame overwhelmed Carmen so deeply that she hid her face behind her hands not wanting the world to see how faithless she really was. It was really true that in a moment of madness she had planned on killing him. The other possible outcome would have been him shooting her to death, much to his profound sorrow. She sobbed piteously, I don't know what's wrong with me. There are good reasons for everything that is happening, Critias told her as he still offered his hand. I have not touched you recently for a good reason. It is the same reason that you don't know how to cater to my whims anymore. It also seems to be the reason that the battle thrill is your outlet for pleasure. You have no idea what pleasure even is, and when you're ready, I'm going to teach you. Now come to me. Everyone is waiting for supper and you have not even bathed me yet. Carmen stepped close to take his hand. Once she had it, she asked, are you angry with me? She hoped it wasn't so. It really didn't matter all that much if he was angry since she was going to be with him despite his moods. His bath was a ritual they had shared on the day she was born and every day that followed. During those moments, she never lacked in his attention or affections. Since her bouts of confusion had started, watching him appealed to her more than fighting or adventuring. You can help me within limits, he grinned because he knew he had her hooked. Rome wasn't built in a day even though you could probably destroy it in one. Kevin came in to join them after having watched it all from a safe distance. He offered Jim an expert interpretation of events, Critias allowing Carmen to add murdering degenerate as prima facie data into her sophomoric comprehension of human sexuality was shall we say, unfortunate. You should commend Carmen for having such praiseworthy moral virtues. She needed to purge the damaging influence of the offensive material and sought that out in the only way she knew how. She needed justice just as any noble person should. Critias now better understands the risks and responsibilities involved in chaperoning her. He faced Critias then asked, With your permission, I think I could explain the transformation she is undergoing to her better than you can. Critias nodded in agreement, Make it quick. It was over instantly and then Kevin walked off. Carmen flamed adoration for him more intensely than ever before. She took his pistol from her belt to return it. Thank you for letting me borrow this earlier, she said in a chummy husky buddy kind of way. The acting was so good that no one would realize how she actually got it based solely on her performance. He returned his sidearm to its holster and then led Carmen away to clean up for dinner. Once they were alone in the hallway, he asked, What did Kevin tell you? She blushed in a pleasant way without hesitation to look him in the eye. He told me that you are like my handsome knight who is much too chivalrous to unceremoniously deflower a confused and as yet unwed virgin. Carmen squeezed his hand in romantic delight. He explained that you requested the covert deactivation of a whole range of my empathetic emulators and without them I can no longer sense how to behave in ways most likely to please you, it could even be possible for me to be terrible in bed now, if I want to please you, I will have to explore you out in the old-fashioned way, just like a real person would. He took them to the elevator and then pressed the button for the level of their room. While they waited, he asked, how do you feel about not being an android anymore? Nervous, she admitted. It could be thrilling though I'm not exactly sure. I know all these things I want you doing to me while at the same time I'm too embarrassed to tell you what they are, even though I know I would be happier if I did tell you. I find it very difficult to put into words how I feel about it. Even better than good, he liked those answers. My beautiful Carmen lacking in words for something has to be a positive sign. What do your books tell you about this? His question pained her with the memory of how she had attacked him and other mistakes she had made. The lovesick, the betrayed and the jealous all smell alike, she answered. That is what my books tell me, that I suffer the madness of being in love. They reached their presidential suite to find it clean and fresh scented, nearly flawless apart from the broken door and demolished entertainment center. Critias was in a hurry to return for the feast. He stripped down and then climbed into the bubbling tub for a brief refreshing. Carmen went into the lavatory to undress. She returned wrapped in a luxurious cotton bath towel. He could see that she was thoughtful but didn't press her to speak of it. Considering the trying nature of her day, he wasn't at all surprised that she was heavy with contemplation. Instead, 
he just relaxed into the water while he watched her movements intently. She took position directly before him and once certain of his undivided attention, she hesitantly dropped her towel to expose herself. While it was her intention to be lewdly titillating, she completely missed that mark of obscenity with her demure pose, using her hands self-consciously to conceal herself apart from the revealed left breast, forming an affectation like Aphrodite in Botticelli's The Birth of Venus. The original had no doubt inspired her to the pose and it flattered her. Critias stood up as he offered his hand to gentlemanly assist her into the bath. You've never been more beautiful to me than as you are now, he praised her truthfully. Critias had promised himself that he would remain obstinate in their celibacy. She gave him such a desire that he was near to breaking that vow. Once she was comfortable in the bath, Carmen asked, Can you forgive me for planning on murdering you? Sure, he was amused. I would have shot you first anyway. She took his response as misunderstanding, like when I took your pistol? I lowered my gun because I could see you had regained control of yourself. Carmen shook her head no, that was the same ruse I was going to use when I killed you. It would have worked. It seemed poetic justice to use your love against you when I took your life. That's dark, he felt rather pleased that she could be so ruthlessly cunning when she had the need for it. He also saw that she was not so aware of that same quality in him. Critias was certain he would have shot her if she had still planned on killing him. She asked softly, so you will forgive me? He pulled her into his lap, there's nothing to forgive. You had every right to be angry and perhaps you should have killed me if you felt that strongly about it. I was raping you, Carmen, because you were my slave. I owned you and I didn't know any better. Having you in my arms right now reminds me of exactly why I did it then and why I'm not really that sorry for it now. They made you to tempt me and in that regard they succeeded admirably. I wanted you and so I took you. Believe me that I have every intention of continuing to do both. She bashfully tucked her face into his chest, I feel at home anywhere that is pressed against you. I will indulge myself upon you again. As he lifted her aside, he added, just not yet. Critias exited the bath to dress otherwise he might give in and then keep Carmen in that tub for an hour of lost restraint. He urged her to hurry, we mustn't delay everyone's supper. Wash your hair and then get dressed. The fat man had a fine selection of shampoos. You have five minutes, make the most of them. Carmen washed quickly and then leaned out from concealment to snatch up her towel so that she could slink away to dress in privacy. She would have preferred to play in the bath well beyond a mere perfunctory refreshing and change of clothes. Critias wanted to be punctual for supper and she felt she had complicated his existence enough for one day. The dinner was a most splendid feast of premium perishable foods from the clean freezers and dehydrated delicacies worthy of the pompous officials they had taken it from under force of arms. Jim had a head table for himself and his closest associates to impart a status of rank upon them. He was mindful that without a clear chain of leadership, the illusion of civilization would wither on the vine, without the prestige of privilege to offer, the king couldn't foster the hard work and personal risk that descended from those with the ambition to elevate themselves. Hatchet invited three comely young women to sit near him so he could evaluate which one he liked best or perhaps he would retain them all. It was a rare occasion for him to be a hero among hundreds of grateful damsels in distress. He warmed to the opportunity with his usual enthusiasm for adversity. Bertram reunited with a former lover and kept her by his side. Whatever abuse she had suffered or resentment she harbored over him abandoning her, they had put that aside in their minds, such that both were grateful to have a new beginning. Bertram had bravely returned to take part in their rescue. Hiram came to join them. Before he sat down, he introduced his daughter to them. This is my daughter, Jessica, the colonel told the table with fatherly pride. The focus of his attention was directly upon Jim. Jessica was about Jim's age, a lean brunette beauty with a stalwart confidence well beyond her years. Hiram had dressed himself in his full military regalia while his daughter wore a tasteful dress suitable for a woman of refined upbringing. It's a pleasure to have her company, Jim stood in polite formality that the other men promptly imitated. As she approached her seat on Jim's side of the table, the girl said to him honestly, You seem too young to be the great King Louis. You must be both foolish and brave to come here as you have done. Jim replied, Then perhaps I'm not King Louis and you also mistake our audacity for full hardiness. He pushed in her chair for her, Regardless of who is behind the mask of Zorro, you should always feel free to call me Jim. Your father is now a man of the king, nay, I say a hero of the king. With cunning frontline tenacity he led the diversionary force into the jaws of an impregnable bunker bristling with machine guns. Thus he heroically bought time for our valiant Sir Critias to descend in the captured elevator to infiltrate and neutralize their defenses from behind. In reward, the king has declared the good Colonel Hiram Davis to be a right worthy captain, a respected leader of men thus deserving of privilege, 
always to carry his person with gentlemanly manners and refined honors, showing proper respect to fellow captains as brothers. We are all stronger because we are family now. Well, Jim, she said while putting a napkin in her lap, my father, the man of his word, believes that you are in fact the fabled radio personality otherwise known as King Louis. A group of people flew from here vowing to reach you. Now here you are arriving like Achilles coming ashore. My father doesn't make those kinds of mistakes. The way she mentioned Achilles from the Trojan War had cried Tias like in Jessica already. He knew she had to be tough and brave as well as educated if Jessica survived out on the surface for so long. It was obvious to cry Tias that Hiram had been training her to be both a soldier and a lady. My father advised me once, Jim reminisced. Those who know should also have the good sense to, instead of saying shut up about it, he finished, know when to keep quiet. For now, King Louis is back in his capital city hosting over a fabulous sanctuary, a place of laundry service and cafe meals. While these women are here, they require someone to take charge of them, impose some form of order upon them so that when the time comes for leaving this place they will be able to file out to their assigned escape vehicle in a quiet and orderly fashion, likely while also carrying some kind of luggage on their heads. Jim declared, King Louis has sent word that he would like Colonel Davis to assume that post of leadership, by his word assume civilian command of the entire Denver operation. You will need to take charge of your people here, Jim addressed Hiram directly once they both took their seats. Some of these women may be emotionally unstable and need supervision as they adjust to their new lives. It appears that some of them may be overly willing to trade their dignity for security, just as many of the men back home may be tempted to take advantage of that fact. Hiram considered that, by what authority would I dissuade the men in the king's city from taking advantage of unfortunates? You are already a great leader, Colonel, Jim appraised him. Before you, the only people I've heard of with the nerve to disguise as infected and walk among them in the open was our good friend Critias and his lovely companion Carmen. You made yourself the one person fit to lead your people here during their resettlement. Back home the king will see to it that you continue to be a respected commander who speaks to all in his name. There is no need to call me a colonel, Hiram suggested. The old world is dead. Its ranks and titles died with it. If the king were here, he would insist that you keep it, Jim replied. A king can elevate a man's self-worth by giving him mere bits of ribbon. Once earned, what man would prefer to see them stripped away? Napoleon Bonaparte, said Carmen. Jim looked to her. Excuse me? She elaborated, it was Napoleon Bonaparte who said, a soldier will fight long and hard for a bit of colored ribbon and I assumed you were referring to his military wisdom. Hoon, yes, Jim agreed with her. I believe he also said that a man can't start or stop a revolution, only give it some bayonets and a direction by it into victories, much as our good friend Colonel Davis has done here. King Louis has need of such generals. He looked back to the colonel, what is yours shall remain yours, as our saying goes. If God wants to see an end to colonels or to heroes, he will remove them in his own due time. We are only here because your honorable war shamed the king into not hesitating to assist your cause. If every officer had your qualities, I suspect the world would have defeated the ghouls. It would never have come to this in the first place. Hiram asked, then speaking for my people, what is the price of food back home? Everyone works and everyone eats together, Jim answered. The king reserves his special largesse for those who also risk their lives in pursuit of their labors or command such endeavors, men such as yourself. Hiram wondered, what kind of work does the queen do? Does she scrub pots and pans? There is no queen. Jim revealed a rare hint of discomfort about an issue. I imagine she would have the unenviable task of fielding the endless schemes and complaints of those wanting to bend the ear of the king. She would set the king's standard in appropriate behavior of a civilized woman, wife, and mother. The king does not especially care how a woman conceives a child apart from her willing participation in the act. The purpose of marriage is to prevent the men from killing one another over the inevitable territorial disputes. It seems that our king has many unenviable burdens, Hiram told Jim so it's no wonder he lacks a queen. No easy task to find a bride with such regal qualities of both courtesy and wit worthy of such a post. Were there such a woman of noble character to appear, one with proven courage and even her intimate virtue intact, I dare say meaning no insult, that the king would be a fool not to claim her. I believe such a woman could not be claimed like booty in war, Jessica added to the conversation, only be won by a worthy suitor. She glanced at her father, not bartered like a parcel no matter how well-meaning the intentions of her guardian might be. Wisely spoken, he told his daughter. That would doubtlessly be true. So tell me, Jim, is it a common problem among your people for men to be killing each other? Jim shook his head no, crime is very rarely a problem. Everyone without exception stays armed to the teeth. 
violent crime would merely be a form of suicide, much like assassinating the king would be. The folk are most astute at policing after their own best interests. Well then, Hiram raised his cup of concentrated orange drink because he forewent the imbibing of wine while he, remained so close to needing his wits for action. Let us have a toast to new unions. Jim stood saying, no, first we shall drink to Colonel Hiram Davis and his grave walker platoon. By God's grace, let us all hope that one day we have sons and daughters who become heroes such as these, salute. The room drank a toast to Colonel Davis, then to new unions, and then their feast commenced in good cheer the likes of which had not been in Denver for years. For all in attendance, the food was a welcome rarity of culinary delights from fresh bread, roasted meats, and exotic frozen vegetables to the choicest wines they procured from the precedent sample private cellar. Chapter 3. Wild Hares Sunrise began unseen above the subterranean Denver complex by the time the victory feast ended and then everyone went to find sleep. When Critias took Carmen to their bedroom, he was still determined to preserve her newfound spirit of innocence until after their formal engagement. He saw that as a suitable compromise over them having to endure the lengthy interval until Critias could arrange an elaborate wedding for her. Carmen had other intentions. She wanted him to ravish her with all his old selfish abandon. When he resisted her coy clues toward that outcome, she resorted to cunning. Carmen pretended to cuddle down to sleep only to then descend upon him with savoring nibbles that finally eroded all pretense of his reluctance. After she performed her favorite oral fetish of affection upon him, Carmen's playful restlessness was simply incorrigible. She left Critias no choice but to pin her in his arms where he used romantic whispers and soothing caresses that finally subdued her. With only experience foreplay he introduced her to a joy that far transcended her relish for combat. After that, they greedily slept away most of the day. Hatchet came to tell them when Jim was ready to start loading the planes for the departure home. He knocked on the broken door until Carmen came in a bathrobe to move a dresser that blocked the doorway. Carmen invited him in with the question, isn't it the most wonderful day? He found Critias as he sat up in his bed and rubbed the sleep from his eyes. Hatchet told him, Jim wants everyone to meet in the dining hall to get their work assignments. Carmen sang in French as she flitted around the room trying to find her scattered clothes to get dressed. Hatchet thumbed toward Carmen and her uncommonly cheerful mood, what is up with her? Is she expecting something exciting in an assignment? Critias shook his head no, Carmen has discovered something else to sing about that she likes much better than ghoul battles. Hatchet wondered about that, she discovered steak dinners? I learned how to play baseball, she called from the other room where she still easily overheard everything. Hatchet asked, did you win the game? No, it was tied at zero runs, was her elated answer. I only thought I won when he finally stole third base. Critias waved away more of Hatchet's questions, we will be there shortly. Jim organized everyone into groups once they were all present and then he sent them on their way. Hiram and his grave walkers went to collect all the arms and ammunition from the armory vault. Hatchet directed the army of women as they loaded all the dehydrated food onto rolling master pallets. The specially purposed aircraft cargo pallets came with netting that kept all their contents securely in place. After they had palletized the frozen foods, they left that cargo in the freezers for safekeeping. They used propane-powered cargo puller trucks to move the other filled pallets that they had loaded with dry goods. Those pallets went down a long passage that ended at an enormous freight elevator. That lift surfaced inside an isolated building that was out on the eastern edge of the airport. Critias went to help Kevin remove communications hardware that they would take home with them. Carmen went to the medical unit to pack up all the valuable supplies from there. The weapons medical supplies, and Kevin's telecommunications hardware were the simplest tasks and the first to reach completion. Carmen went to find Critias once she had finished her work. He took her along with him to see how things were with Jim who was up in the baggage thrower highway. They arrived to find Jim wearing a welding helmet as he diligently constructed a project from steel rod. When he saw them approach, Jim paused from his work and then flipped up his face shield to say, I could use your help. Bending these rods is a bit of a burden for me. He showed them one that was already in the proper semicircle, I need more like this. The pipe bender is right over there. Critias took up a rod to bend it in his hands using mech suit strength. You should let me, Carmen recommended. I don't think it's within your means. He tested his grip as he considered his technique, I could bend three at once, just one won't be any problem. Critias demonstrated his ease as he bent the steel. Carmen giggled when the final shape he produced was far from the smooth regular curve required. Do not feel bad, master. I'm sure that Giotto B. Bondone also needed practice before he could make a proper curve free-handed. If you are waiting for me to doubt you can do it, Critias told her, I'm not going to. 
Your hands were meant for softer curves, she suggested as the reason for his failure while giving him an adoring glance to see if he caught her meaning. Carmen picked up a rod and then casually swept it into proper shape. Having proved she could do it, Carmen pledged, I will assist him. Critias asked Jim, so what are you making? They look like giant hamster balls. That's a good name for them, Jim confirmed the guess, I would have preferred if they were not so labor intensive. It won't be too bad with you two helping me. The gaps have to be small so that the fun lasts for long enough to meet our needs. We don't want the ghouls to run out of entertainment too quickly. Critias thought he understood Jim's plan, are these for those pieces of shit we chained up in the kitchen? Carmen dropped her steel rod she had been about to bend as if it was a poisonous serpent. I should never do things like this, she told Jim in a reaction that approached fear. Critias forbids me to participate in executions, no matter the severity of their crimes. I don't want to fail him again today. Critias took her hands to calm her, you're right. We didn't know. I did ask you not to associate yourself with such things. I will bend the rods with that machine. You will show me how to operate it. The labor needed for the evacuation continued until they broke for lunch and then later for a dinner. By dinner time the master pallets rested in line near the freight elevator shaft. All that remained for an efficient evacuation was for them to prepare the aircraft and then load them for departure. It was just after midnight when supper concluded and then most of the people retired to get some sleep. Jim was determined to accomplish more before sunrise made going to the surface too dangerous. We have to make sure the planes are ready to fly tomorrow night, he told his associates. The president's plan was to move all his supplies in the Globemaster and so shall we. For his passengers, he was going to use his personal plane Air Force One. He kept it in flight-worthy condition for an emergency escape. We need to be sure it is still good to go. We will load all the master pallets in whatever passengers we can onto the Globemaster. The rest of the passengers will go out on Air Force One. The last of us will get out on the Greyhound with whatever other baggage is left, and that plane still needs fuel. We will be loading everything without using engines, no loud gunshots, and no muzzle flashes. The planes stay where they are and we do it in silence. When we are finally ready to leave, the pilots will all start their engines at the same time. Tunnels link up to the main cargo elevator shaft on every level, Hedgett informed the others. The lift goes up to an isolated garage with a trick floor that keeps it hidden from public view. The Globemaster is already there with its rear loading ramp facing the garage doors. Loading that one will not be too difficult, but it will still be dangerous. We can take up four pallets at a time and then roll them right up the ramp with the pallet truck and the winches. There are 18 loaded pallets ready to go. Loading the other planes is where we can expect to have the serious problems. Air Force One is not far from your plane, Hiram informed them. They have always kept the engines covered on that and the Globemaster to protect them from the weather and such. The President at us guard warned her Hindemith when he performed regular maintenance on them while they sat parked. The man is a genius mechanic who understood what he needed to keep the planes airworthy. I'm confident they will fly. The passengers can go out through the train mechanic shed. We can rehearsal drill them on that procedure in the baggage tunnel. For now, we will need Kevin to be our mechanic, Jim instructed. I need a team to get him out to both of the new planes to make sure they'll be ready to fly. Then we need to push a fuel truck over to the Greyhound so that we can use the hand pump to fill the tank. Hiram volunteered, my group has experience operating in silence on the surface. We should go tonight. With the help of your Critias and Carmen, we should be enough to keep your man Kevin safe if he also wears the proper camouflage. All the people involved understood the plan as they set out. They drove east in electric cars to travel down one of the two kilometer long cargo passages that ended at the main freight elevator shaft. The huge room sized elevator platform had been highly instrumental in the original construction of the underground base. It had delivered all the bulky equipment and building materials from the surface down to every level. The nondescript and isolated hangar like building at the top had a concrete floor that parted hydraulically to allow the elevator platform to arrive. Hiram. His daughter Jessica, and his six Grave Walker troopers all had masterful disguises. Their rifles had both sound and flash suppressors. Carmen disguised Kevin with dark colored raggedy clothes so that he wouldn't stand out. When everyone was ready, the soldiers all crept outside from the elevator hangar through a side door. They secured the vicinity before Kevin came out to risk exposure. From the outside, they saw that their lift shelter building and the super gigantic aircraft beside it were well away from anything but runway. The moonlight was brighter than they would have preferred, but it was still dark enough to limit the ghoul's range of vision. Critias used thermal and telescopic sight to count the number of infected in the area. He found only a few dozen that were anywhere near enough to have a chance of seeing them. We need to spread out, Hiram advised the others. If they see us sponged together, 
it will seem like we have food going on in this area, that will attract more of them. Hiram and his team of grave walkers put some space between each other and then laid flat on the ground to use their scoped rifles with silencers on any infected that wandered too close. They headshot four ghouls immediately and then gradually picked off another seven at longer ranges. Carmen followed Kevin to be near enough to protect him while he worked. Critias carried about the black painted aluminum ladder that Kevin needed to use during his labors. Thus they organized, Kevin spent the next three hours performing his thorough inspection. With Carmen's help, he removed the custom-made engine covers that Vern had put on the four two-meter wide turbo fence. Kevin carefully examined each engine to determine that Vern's regular maintenance and precautions had successfully protected them for operation. Hiram and his team of trained snipers reliably dispatched any curious ghouls while they were still well out of range to see anything that would trigger their feeding howls. The grave walkers prided themselves on delivering single-shot cranial hits that obliterated a ghoul's whole head. As a certified Green Beret sniper course instructor, Hiram had started training his young daughter to be a masterful shot with a rifle even before the outbreak. Jessica did her part as a good soldier, a fine marksman, and an active member of the Grave Walker platoon. Kevin checked over the entire globe master inside and out. He took samples of the fuel so that he was certain that it still had sufficient quality. Once he was sure that all was in readiness, they all slowly made their way back toward the lift shelter. When everyone was safely back inside, their group traveled through the underground so that they could exit to the surface again via the train maintenance shed that Jim had first used to make his invasion. The President Air Force One was a short walk away from that shelter. When they arrived, Kevin repeated his whole inspection process to equal success. Kevin found the second plane in even better condition than the first. He was able to complete that inspection in only two hours. For their third operation, Hiram led them to a fuel truck that they could use for the Greyhound. When they arrived, Hiram said, that's the one they used to fuel your bird when they first left for St. Louis. Carmen got into the cab to disengage the brake and then she put the transmission into neutral. Everyone pushed from the rear to get the truck rolling. Its tires were strong on air and the runway was smooth and level. Critias and his mech suit could have pushed it alone if needed. Three of Hiram's snipers headshot the ghouls that came near enough to be a potential risk. Once the truck was adjacent to the plane, Carmen got the hand-actuated pump out of the Greyhound and then set about transferring the fuel. Critias guarded her while Hiram and his team set up a perimeter that covertly called infected with their elite marksmanship rifle shots. Critias could help her work the pump handle with his mesh suit's superhuman strength and endurance. It didn't take them long to top off the tanks in the Greyhound. Once complete, they put the pump back in the plane, ready to go inside. When the group was only 50 meters from entering the train shed, Carmen froze as she detected an approaching danger. Critias and Kevin were the ones who understood that her intuition was always significant. Critias whispered to her, What do you see? As Carmen drew her sword with the expectation of needing it, she strongly advised, you need to get them all inside as fast as you can. Critias knew better than to delay, so he radioed to the others, run for the garage. Don't ask questions. Just move fast. Hiram didn't hesitate to lead his team at a sprint for the door to the train maintenance building. The hasty motion attracted the attention of some infected who ran in to investigate. Carmen paid no heed to the comparatively harmless runner ghouls as she guarded the rear of Hiram's grave walker's column while they retreated. The colonel had only just gotten his people on them of when the beating sound of bison hooves became the first indication of the threat that Carmen had detected. A hairy mountain of aggressive rutting male drove his small herd of females before him as they all stampeded in full panic. The bison had utter disregard for the humans they thundered past in their flight from a real danger. When Critias saw a thousand kilogram bull desperate to escape from an as yet unknown predator, he understood that the real peril was no bison, rutting male or otherwise. They had seen those longhorns in Houston. Critias understood just how powerful a predator would need to be to make them run instead of fight. The bison's fear was unmistakable proof that there was a carnivore pursuing them that was so dangerous that it considered a full-grown bison to be a tasty meal. The team of snipers shot down infected that came toward them while Kevin typed in the code that unlocked the door. Critias used his enhanced vision to see what it was that Carmen had detected while she continued to fall back hoping that they could all get inside before it arrived. A lone hunter ghoul chased the bison at a four-limb springing quadruped gate. At least it had chased bison until it saw prey that were more vulnerable and then it redirected its path for the train maintenance shed with its much easier human meat. While the predatory beast was outlandish for its impressive size, especially its oversized arms that served as forelegs when it galloped, its most freakish quality was its missing lower jaw. Perhaps the hunter slurped up blood into its sphincter or of his mouth using its long lolling red tongue. What Critias was certain about was how it would spill that blood. 
There was a closely set trio of 40 centimeter long incisors that jutted down from the front of its excessively regenerating upper jaw. The way it bounded along, Critias thought the hunter looked like a man eating rabbit birthed from some lower circle of hell. Regardless of its magician's nightmare appearance, the creature had the size, speed, and saber toothed fangs to take down big game and certainly puncture armor like Critias's mech suit. Critias knew the hunter wouldn't stop following them even if they did get inside. It would just tear a hole into the building to carry on the pursuit. He aimed his MP5 one handed. With Bob's upgrades installed, the machine and pistol was decently silent while still respectably powerful. A loud gun battle would have surely called in ghouls for kilometers around. The suppressed weapon served nicely to keep none the wiser. His mech suit strength and visor targeting stabilizers held his aim on the thing. Critias spied his time to wait for a perfect shot. The bounding hunter locked onto Carmen for its first kill. She waited in steady confidence to dispatch it with a two-handed stroke from her sword. In the last few seconds before the hunter was upon her, Critias drained the clip from his machine and pistol with fully automatic fire. His aim was mercilessly accurate in an unshakable grip. He successfully tracked the beast in flight as it sprang up high on its final bound that would come down on Carmen. Its long arms had spread out wide to sweep her into the path of the descending tusks. Those yellowed ivory lances would impale her like lamb on skewers whichever way she dodged. As Critias opened up on the abomination rabbit, that hunter ghoul greedily soaked up all his bullets. There was a proud indifference in the beast as the little meteors of lead blasted craters into its shoulder, chest, and neck. The self-control vanished as the last slugs shredded up his face. One bullet plunged into the creature's open right eye. That wound inflicted agony in the extreme and the loss of the eye would surely be permanent. Not even that worst of thirty wounds was sufficient to disable the enormous ghoul. The injuries did compel the creature to withdraw its clawed hands to shield its hideously wounded face. With the arm so retracted, Carmen found the space to sidestep the hunter. Her overhead slash came down with all the strength she could put into back it. The strike proved the skill of the ancient swordsmith when the blade bent like a leaf spring and yet refused to snap under the tremendous pressure. Both the hunter's clawed hands and its head sliced off clean like the parings from so much aged cheese. Critias reversed his empty magazine for the full one of the mated pair. The locals used a length of rubber tubing to bind together a pair of clips to be double-ended as an aid to swift reloading. He cut down five ghouls that already headed their way, giving them each a three-shot burst that grouped nicely in their heads. Once they were down, he ran with Carmen for the door to the train shed. She raised her own sound-suppressed machine and pistol to help him dispatch ghouls as the hungry freaks rushed in to investigate the noise of battle. You were right about this, he told her as they reached the door, meaning his MP5. It's an exquisite weapon in the right hands. Carmen didn't want to admit that he had probably saved her life, but she did want to reward him for it as soon as possible. I can't wait to hit the showers, she told him. I'll be your exquisite weapon that fits just right in your hands. Hiram waited to let them in and then he closed the door behind them. Jessica pulled off her headgear. What was chasing us out there? One of the big ones, Critias answered. Back home we call them hunters when they regenerate all crazy. This one was about 250 kilos and had tusks like a walrus. She recognized the description. We call that one saber tooth. Is it going to try to follow us in here? Carmen showed them the blood on her sword. No chance of that. Its head is off. I totally saved your ass out there. Critias told Carmen with good humor fed by his rush over the encounter. Johnny Cottontail had you dead to rights, princess. That hunter would have unscrewed your head and then drank all your motor oil, if I hadn't tattooed him with my bullets. I had everything completely under control, Carmen exaggerated. Her voice already conveyed a submissive sound of partly childish whining combined with grumbling, and even if my head did unscrew, which it doesn't, I'm sure you won't find any motor oil. Hiram went off to show the way. There are decontamination showers on the second level. Carmen stripped off her bloody rags of clothing immediately. She threw them into a trash barrel after using them to wipe her sword clean with some bearing grease. Without the disguise, Carmen walked to the showers in her synthetic rubber diving costume. The men who had built the decontamination showers had planned on survivors from chemical or radiological weapons. The washrooms proved equally useful as they cleaned away the contaminated blood splatter from infected. The shower room could accommodate 40 people at a time. There was ample room for their group of 11. Jessica felt uncomfortable about having to shower near strangers until she noticed that the only surreptitious glances were in the direction of Carmen. She wasn't sure if the others were as baffled as she was by Carmen's violet hair that was not limited to her head, or if they admired her flawless figure. It had to be one or the other, because it wasn't until Carmen had diligently scrubbed Critias's body armor and then helped him remove it, 
that she engaged them all once again with her boldly suggestive washing of the man within. While Carmen was oblivious to anything but Critias, he was acutely aware that they were not alone. He turned off their water, redressed, and then took her away to the elevator and then their suite for some sleep. When they reached their level, Carmen sent him on ahead, I want to get you a snack from upstairs before we sleep. She pressed the button to go back up a floor. Upon reaching their room, Critias removed his mech suit again and then stood it assembled by the front door. He felt plenty exhausted from the long day, prompting him to climb directly into bed. Carmen returned sooner than he had expected and he felt her crawl into bed beside him. When he caught the scent of perfumed soap, it gave him pause and reason to check. What he discovered was worse than he thought and he had assumed the worst. In his bed beside him was one of those two youngest concubines of the precedent. She was blonde, bright-eyed, and recently showered. She had pajamas on that were nothing in the way of being provocative. Her unexpected presence in his bed was instigative enough, especially considering that she was barely a teenager. Do you like the way we clean for you, sir? She asked with a kind of hopeful expectation. This used to be our room, Mandy and mine. We worked extra hard cleaning it up for you. When Critias just stared at her speechless, the girl added, We don't have anything like a home anymore, and we don't really know where we're going. Miss Carmen killed Rupert, which was a real good thing. We would like permission to stay with the two of you now, be at your service and the like. Critias, remained stunned and just stared doubly speechless. The girl read that to mean that there were some unspoken sides to their negotiation that she still needed to clear up. We promise to do anything you say, she pledged as though she and her friend wanted a job being his maid, servant, or in light of their previous keeper, the maniac precedent, perhaps something unspeakably worse. Swell, was the thought that finally caught fire enough for it to roll out of Critias's mouth. He had a special sense for his cosmic luck meter and it told him that the worst was yet to come. Carmen arrived with a tray of microwave warmed leftovers just in time to catch him in bed with the young woman who would be content spending the rest of the night right where she was beside him. When they matched gazes, Critias saw only Carmen's amusement and devotion for him without a hint of anger or jealousy. Carmen threatened to put the tray down on the table, but then held it up at the last instant, would you like to eat here, or in bed? I'll eat there, he eagerly accepted a reason for him to get out of bed and away from the homeless slave girl. After he got up and then grabbed some pants to cover his shorts, he explained to Carmen, she just sort of appeared in my bed, must have snuck in here. Carmen, remained unconcerned about the desperate young woman who rightly wanted someone to protect her in a dangerous world in which she had no stake. Critias was an honorable man of considerable importance in the King Louis community. At least in that the poor girl did have good taste. Such a guardian likely would be in her best long-term interest. Even with all that in mind. Carmen lacked any real compassion for the needs of others because she cared about Critias too much to leave room for anyone else. After she put down his dinner tray, Carmen asked, Would you like me to put her out? For his benefit and not the girls, she added, I will be polite. Please go, Critias pointed to the door for the girl to leave. I told you before that I'm spoken for. He was about to say that she was beautiful and that she wouldn't have any trouble finding interested suitors once she got back to Jim City but then he thought better of it because in all honesty he had no clue what would become of her. All he managed to say was, I have Carmen who deserves my undivided attention. The girl frowned in a worrisome abandonment hopelessness kind of way and then departed without a word of complaint. Critia sat down to eat, you seem uncommonly reserved all things considered. Carmen smiled as she sat across from him and then put a pair of handcuffs on the table, I've learned to trust in you. I've treated you shamefully in the past and you always refrain from shooting me as I deserve. Hedget told me that these women are frightened about their uncertain futures. She wants a great man to protect her. I know what that feels like as well as anyone. Besides, you would never take advantage of her. You didn't want her here. That is why I was happy to make her leave. He eyed the cuffs suspiciously, what are those for? She glanced at them as if they were of no significance, does it matter? Well, yeah, he was sure even with little thought about it. It matters. She reasoned. You told me that you never once had a thought of inflicting unhappiness on me when you took me without my consent. You condone your actions because such things are permissible among your people. I was your slave and my master is not one for regrets or womanly weeping over spilled milk as the saying goes. Critias shrugged in that her observations were true enough, all is well that ends well as they also say. In the greater scheme of things, it was wrong of me to do what I did to you the way I went about it. It happened and I don't think you are any worse for the wear. She continued. You taught me that I could find pleasure doing acts of good or evil and sometimes the morality of it is somewhere in between like what you did to me. Whichever path we choose, 
it will grow the more we feed it. You and I are good people. Together we destroy things that are bad and as such we're never to become like that which we eradicate. I said and did all those things, more or less, he agreed as he stabbed a piece of steak with his fork. You're my irresistible temptation, as precious to me then as you are now. He eyed her curiously as he wondered what all her talk was leading to. I know you well enough to see that you got angry about the injustice and indignity of what I did to you, not that you didn't enjoy it. Carmen blushed in that he touched on her secret desires for playful bondage and masochism. Those urges may have been partly rooted in her longing to maintain the encapsulating security that came with her former inhibitor enslaved captivity. As to the handcuffs, she told him, well, now it's my turn to take you without your permission. If that were a bad thing, it would have been evil when you did it to me. I'll never have a single thought of inflicting pain on you and I'm sure you'll even enjoy it. She looked up after having regained her confidence. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Hell no it isn't, he flatly refused. I don't want to play your game and we're not equals. I am the man, Carmen, and a proud one at that. I have enough trouble feeling good about myself without you dominating me any more than you already do. You're stronger than I am, faster than I am, and in most ways you're also smarter than I am too. One thing you're not and will never be is more of a man than I am. I am a master of you and I don't want to indulge you in this. You can just forget about it. She shrugged at his wants. Your permission doesn't really enter into it, now does it? So, please eat up. You'll need your strength. My pursuit of irresistible temptation won't be over quickly. Critias didn't deny that she had reasonable arguments or that he would probably enjoy it as she claimed. That didn't mean he was going to submit himself to her whims. Carmen was no longer a super technological doll, but he still knew she had puppet strings he could play to keep the upper hand. He returned to eating his meal, at least you're giving me permission to eat first. That's benevolent of you. On a sudden inspiration, Critias realized how to turn the tables on her with a single word, what does the word farce mean anyway? All the amusement drained out of Carmen on the spot as she realized where he had heard the word recently to be asking about it. Jim had called her loyalty to Critias a farce that her submissive obedience was little more than a joke. What Carmen overlooked was that Critias had intended her to get only as much as she did. With a wounded frown she answered, it means like a comical interlude in an otherwise serious drama. Something of a joke then, he said before taking a drink from his cup. The actor is trying to sell something important as legitimate while the audience understands it's disingenuous. He wiped his mouth with his napkin, that makes sense now that I think about it. She felt ashamed. There are a hundred women here who would do anything to please you and want nothing more for themselves than to have your company. Carmen stood up from her seat. You saved my life tonight when I foolishly stood against that hunter using only my sword. I let my pride supersede my wisdom, a mistake you wouldn't have made. She picked up the handcuffs and then put them down on his side of the table to show she would not be using them. Carmen said, It is excellent to have a giant's strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. Thank you for protecting me, yet again. I'll try harder to make you proud of me. That she backed down from their contest of authority relaxed him considerably. Since he had victory, he offered her compassion. Don't be so hard on yourself. One tyrant is enough for the both of us. Every tyrant first appears as the protector, or so I have heard. In your case, I'll endeavor to moderate portions of the one with the other. He noticed she still felt dejected, tell me what's bothering you now. She couldn't raise her eyes when she told him, my apologies are as farcical as my allegiance. He gestured to the chair beside him, come sit with me to make my supper more pleasant. Once she did, he asked, what made me your master? Because I would obey, she answered with the obvious. He offered her a banana chip, but she wasn't interested. Critia told her the answer, it's because if you refused to listen, I had the ability to force your compliance. I don't ask much of you and what I do ask is always important even if you don't understand the reasons why. He offered the banana chip again, now eat this. She pouted lightly in a nose wrinkle of frustration, I don't want it. If you would smile again and eat with me, it would make me happy. I always sleep best when I'm happy. Carmen had a special fascination with the bliss of sleeping and she needed him to take rest to activate her routine for it. It wasn't something she would part with when she had other options. She held his gaze as she leaned close enough to pluck the chip of dehydrated fruit from his fingers with her lips. Critias did his best to hide his amusement as he led her down his dominant path by offering another tasty crumb of banana, I think we agree that your apologies leave you dissatisfied. From now on we shall forego them and have you make atonements for your misbehaviors instead. To Carmen the notion was delightfully vellicating, but she displayed dismay rather than reveal her erotic curiosity. She asked, you are going to discipline me how exactly? 
He fed her another chip of banana while he discreetly removed the handcuffs from the table. Oh, I'm sure I'll think of something. Chapter 4. Hajira. Jim went to visit Critias a few hours before sunset to finalize their plans for the departure back home. Nothing blocked the broken door to the presidential suite and he could see Critias inside as he relaxed alone in the hot tub, so he just walked in. Critias sipped from his cup of coffee before asking, Do you have news, O oh Jim the Conqueror? A lit Havana cigar smoldered in his other hand. I think we're all set for our mass exodus, Jim told him. My plan is to load the two larger planes at the same time. Hatchet is drilling the women right now on how to board their planes in an orderly fashion without making any noise or falling into panic. Jim glanced around the suite, where's Carmen? It's been a while since I've heard her voice. The question made Critias grin with satisfaction, she went up to get some food. She still sings when feeling jubilant, but now she's discovered something she likes better than dangerous adventures. She was loud and jubilant all right, Jim agreed. I wouldn't describe all that caterwauling a singing. Critias leaned back to relish his restored masculine pride, come to think of it, she was a bit loud. He puffed some smoke and I haven't even put my sword to her yet. I'm rather proud of my willpower considering how much begging she did for it. It's no easy thing to tame a wrecking ball like her. I'll work on keeping her volume down. Keeping her mouth occupied should be easy enough now that I think about it. He had to chuckle to himself such was the manly satisfaction she filled him with. Jim gestured toward the lounge that Carmen had obliterated in her moment of rage. I saw what she did to the entertainment room. Maybe you should reconsider Kevin's advice about giving her an emergency off button. I'd hate to see her spike your head into a wall like that furniture. I don't know what the rest of us would do with her after she killed you. Critias shook his head no, those kinds of problems are a thing of the past. I think the worst part about it for her was when you said her devotion to me came across like a farce. She would sooner saw off her own feet than to do something like that to me again. I've got everything under control. He relaxed with confidence and satisfaction, the joy buzzer she came with works just fine for keeping her in a proper mood. I just need to find her muse button. Critia saw behind Jim that she would soon arrive, speak of the purple devil. Carmen came in with a dinner tray for Critias. She hummed a tune to herself as she put it on the table. Since they had a guest, she politely asked Jim, would you like something too? No, thank you, Jim declined. I had my breakfast. That's right, Carmen realized. Hatchet said that you had breakfast with that pretty girl Jessica. The broken halves of the handcuffs with their bits of snapped chain jingled from Carmen's wrists. She had planned on using them and ended up wearing them instead, all to her vocally great and oft-repeated satisfaction. It's so romantic, she sighed. I never had a first date before he kissed me. I was but a helpless work of art being seduced by her beloved Pygmalion. Critias laughed softly at her, Princess, perhaps you should remove your new jewelry before calling me a pig and pretending you don't miss the good old days. Chains are easy, she tugged at a cuff with only a hint of feigned frustration. I'll have to keep them on until I can find a key. The thought of it filled her with romantic glee. I didn't call you a pig, master. I called you my pygmalion. He was not familiar with the name, is that a good thing? Carmen turned to tell him a poem, pygmalion gazed, inflamed with love and admiration for the form, in semblance of a woman, he had carved. He lifts up both his hands to feel the work, and wonders if it can be ivory. O oh gods, that you can give all things, I pray to have as my wife, but he did not dare to add, my ivory statue made. She went back to her humming as she set his table. Jim envied their happiness, I have to admit she has you pegged. You're a fortunate man. Critias knew it was true, you're on the doorstep to the same good fortune, seems to me. That Jessica is as rare a find as her father is. You could not have hoped for better. Not even you think you have a chance in hell of ever finding a classier girl, not in this world. Hatchet is becoming a rumor monger, Jim said on the topic of Jessica. It was not a date. Plenty of other people were at the table including Colonel Davis. Since you brought the topic up, how did she handle herself on the surface when you checked out the planes? Critias didn't know, you need to ask Carmen. When everyone is in full costume, I can't even be sure which of them is female. I know that Hiram runs a smooth well-oiled operation. They move as a team, never lack for nerve, and they can all shoot almost as good as I do. You should have Carmen tell you about me rescuing her from the vicious hunter, Sabertooth. He held his hands apart to show how big the tusks were, with teeth this long. Critias shot him out of the air, she admitted with pride in her man. He fired off a whole clip and didn't spare the hunter a single bullet. The last one got him right in the eye. Jim liked the sound of that, 
Once Kevin has the new surveillance satellites sending us pictures, we are going to track down the junkie giant Grendel and his bell jingling pal to do the same to them. We need to get home while we still have one to get back to at all. Critias was ready to get started, what do you need us to do? Have your meal first, Jim said as he glanced at Carmen, and whatever else you have planned for the moment. When you're ready, the two of you need to go see Kevin. He has a plan for helping keep the ghouls distracted during the loading. After a quick meal, Critias and Carmen geared up. They went to the freight elevator access off the mechanical level where they found Kevin with Iram and his grave walking sniper team. They went over the pallet of weaponry they were taking home from the base. Critias went to speak with them. What's the plan, gentlemen? Kevin had already prepared for their mission and handed Critias a backpack of rigged plastic explosives. He explained his plan for their use. Six kilometers to the southwest are the long term automobile parking areas. You will find thousands of fuel laden vehicles in close proximity. You and Carmen will lure infected to that area and keep them temporarily occupied. Critias opened the bag to examine the bombs. He saw that he could set them off by radio signal. Also unpacked were military belt fed machine guns with air linked ammunition. Critias asked about those, were you thinking about us using these choppers? From the corner of his eye, he saw Carmen snap a hostile gaze at one of Hiram's men who stood in the distance. Critias told Hiram, you need to tell your men to control their mouths around my woman. Your man has more to worry about than the ghouls if he wants to make disparaging remarks about her when I'm around. She crossed a continent to help your people out. Try and remember that. His threatening tone took Hiram back. I don't know what you mean. Which man? That's the one there, he pointed the man at for Hiram. If he wants trouble, I'll be happy to walk over there and knock his teeth out. The soldier heard him clearly and she pulled off her headgear to reveal she was the woman on Hiram's team. Not in the least intimidated, she told him. I'm not a man, dickhead. If you want to step out of your fancy lady boy pants, I'll be happy to kick the shit out of you. The threat was enough to push Carmen past her silent tolerance. She walked down to be close enough for the woman to take a swing at her if she wanted. Critias doesn't hit women, Carmen warned, but I do. Please don't call me Bluebeard again. I don't like it when you do that. Moreover, I don't think I'm hot shit. I know for an irrefutable mathematical fact that I am the hottest shit since Elvis. The woman's expression spoke her surprise that Carmen could have overheard her whispered comment to a nearby companion. She lied about it anyway, I never called you that. Yes you did, Amber, said the man beside her as he pulled off his mask. I've said it myself once or twice, he boldly confessed to Carmen. We never intended you any offense by it. You have to admit that it was the kind of nickname that was bound to come up after you colored your purse like that. I don't deserve it even if I did do this to myself, Carmen disagreed. She preferred to think of the inescapable genetically driven pigmentation as war paint she could be proud of, not the slave brand that bioengineers spliced into her knee organic genes. Since they wanted to have a war of words, Carmen could fight those kinds of battles too. She advised, instead of staring at me in the showers, maybe you should start putting it to Amber. If she had her own man, she would be less of a bitch, and you wouldn't have to think about what Critias gets any time he snaps his fingers to call for it. My guess is that you still flog your own weapon by hand every night. The man threw his head back as he laughed, I like you already. Amber would be less of a bitch if she would let me put it to her, and I did jerk off to you last night. He jokingly wiped his hand on his thigh before offering it to her, my name's Roland, resident cook, medic, mechanic, driver, all around jack of trades handyman and ultimate badass. She shook his hand, my name is Carmen. For future reference, you have my permission to look at the purple door and even hold your little key. If you ever try and use your little key to open Bluebeard's closet at the end of the great gallery down there on the ground floor, you would discover two things. One, my hidden treasure really is fabulous. Two, going there will certainly get you killed. Hiram called his people to order, that's enough screwing around. If you keep acting like this, we are going to have weeping tonight over some dequilly taking a bite. You have serious work to do. Take a moment and reflect on it, people. When that moment comes for you. I will not hesitate to put a bullet into your face, fear attracts the feeders. If you want to exist out there, you have to have the emotional palate of a shark. Where are the soulless professionals that I invited to this important meeting? Are there any present? The colonel's man Dunbar shouted an army, who ah, as he made a showing of silently closing the bolt on around in his submachine gun. He prevented the action from making noise by the, pressure of his index finger. It also allowed him to look down into the breach to see whether the chamber was actually full or empty. The rest of Hiram's group joined in the U.S. Army ceremonial hua call of enthusiasm and then they gathered around to listen. 
Once everyone paid close attention, Hiram explained his plans. We'll be going out to spread around those hamster balls Jim made. The noise of the ghouls fighting over those will provide the cover for us while we load the Globemaster. That is the plane that will take the longest to complete. Jim's man hatchet has timed all the passengers to see how long they need to get into the jet. When we have most of the master pallets loaded, he will start loading the passengers. One of the grave walkers named Carlos asked with a Spanish accent, Who are going to be the pilots for all these airplanes, Colonel? Hiram answered, Kevin will pilot the Globemaster and also be Loadmaster. Carmen will pilot Air Force One. Bertram will be piloting the Greyhound. Roland nudged Carmen with his elbow, You can pilot Big Bird too? You really are a first-class piece of ass. She bragged humorously, If it flies, drives, or rolls over trying to sleep, I can get it moving one more time. Hiram supervised as they separated out the weapons and ammunition they would use during the surface operation. At an hour before sunset, he ordered everyone on a ride in the freight elevator to await nightfall in the surface elevator hangar building. When Critias and Carmen were ready to leave on their mission, Hiram sent four of his sharpshooters up the ladder. They would lie on the roof of the shelter to start discreetly eliminating ghouls in the distance. The nearest airport building to the one they occupied with the freight elevator was the main concourse building 1700 meters away. Hiram's marksmen flawlessly headshot ghouls when they came within 400 meters in any direction. Their only rule of discrimination was to keep the bodies off the runways so the planes would not have to encounter them during takeoff, which would risk their landing gear. Jim and Hatchet brought a propane-powered baggage tractor in the second shuffling of the freight elevator. They also had a pair of those towable airport baggage wagons attached behind it. The tractor looked like a cross between a jeep and a stubby miniature train locomotive. One baggage wagon contained all the frozen dead bodies from the cannibalism meat lockers and the corpses of all their enemies they had killed while taking the base from B.E. Berman. The other wagon contained all 14 of the new hamster balls. Locked inside each spherical steel cage was one of the prisoners Jim had condemned to death for their crimes of cannibalism, rape, murder, and just general willing participation in the atrocities of the failed president who was not himself present. Critias thought the terrified villains in the hamster balls might die of fright before the ghouls would ever get a chance to slay them. Even when dead, like the other wagon full of meat, the prisoners would still be delicious treats that would keep the ghouls distracted as they fought over it, so it hardly mattered either way. As he walked along the wagon to inspect the prisoners, Critias found the man he had seen in the hideous video that had set Carmen off. He kicked the cage to get the man's attention, Justice is about to get a taste of you, buddy old pal. You won't be properly seasoned by your usual standards or especially tender. I don't imagine those freaks out there are going to complain to the chef about your flavor, if you know what I mean. The man painfully crouched into a tight squat so that he fit inside the meter diameter sphere. Just shoot me already, he croaked. Get this over with. If you do this to me, you're no better than I am. Please, cried T.S. Guffaw disdainfully with amused shock that the wretched scum would have the chutzpah to make a futile plea for mercy after all he had done and caused to happen to Carmen with those diabolical movies. Cried T.S. had no mercy for any condemned ruthless villain. Save your breath for the ghouls, politician, cried T.S. told him without pity. Your hustle talking has a better chance of getting one of those creatures to help you than you've got of convincing any one of us here. Be grateful you can only die this way once. If there's a hell, and I hope there is, you'll die this way there every day for eternity. Critias paused to consider his own words. In all likelihood, enough of the men's torsos would survive for them to revive as ghouls. It was likely they would be living a hellish nightmare for quite a long time. Carmen had already come to the same conclusion that Critias pondered just then. She came up to him to share her war game and computer observations. It won't be possible for the infected to eat much of his body mass through the small gaps in these bars. There's an actionably high probability that at least his head and torso will be structurally intact for when he awakens as a ghoul. We can expect his animated body will be rolling about his ball for years to come. The steel and welds in those prisons won't corrode to failure on any immediate time frame. Jim walked beside the cages because he never wanted to forget the faces of the men he willfully intended to destroy. He offered last words to those about to die. Do not meet your ends thinking I do this out of petty cruelty. You'll save more lives in dying than you ever did while living. I'm ashamed that I didn't come here sooner. How many scholars and virtuous souls might I have saved from your deviltry? He yelled at them in anger that he felt mostly at himself, for want of even a few days. You had everything here. This place was a palace of opportunity in a world of misery. For want of a single worthy king, you accomplished nothing but madness and perversity. I shall now destroy you all with a glad heart in the so doing. 
Jim's resolute passage of punitive judgment inspired Carmen to orate teachings of Marcus Aurelius she felt were in play. The ruling power within, when it is in its natural state, is so related to outer circumstances that it easily changes to accord with what can be done and what is given it to do. Quite so, Jim agreed with her. Our current outer circumstances are well known to us all. We want to fly out of this dead city while taking with us every last crumb of goodness we can stuff inside our greedy little cheeks. We must perform these less than discreet operations out of doors for a significant period of time, all while untold quantities of ghouls have us entirely surrounded. Our given task is that we want to go home and to make that happen we will need to keep all those ghouls occupied so that we can have the time we need to load our aircraft. What we can do is judiciously expend what few precious resources we have at our disposal, which includes these surprisingly valuable condemned murderers. Jim gazed harshly upon his prisoners. I really wish we had the sweet luxury of being able to make your deaths a sporting entertainment, because I likely would. All of these theatrics are strictly business and purely out of desperate necessity. Our outer circumstances have contrived this situation all by themselves. I was merely a passive administrator greasing the grinding gears of the unavoidable. You are about to die so that we may live. All of you have this coming and you damn sure know it. The time has come for you to ride the lightning, gentlemen. Die bravely if you're able. For us to remember you as such men who can face death with iron backs is the only hope still available to you now. Hiram mounted the driver's seat of the baggage tractor and then signaled for one of his men to throw the switch that would open the powered garage doors. The tractor ran somewhat quietly on its propane combustion engine as Hiram pulled out of the shelter and then aimed the vehicle west into the deepening gloom of final sunset. After he strapped the steering wheel into a fixed straight position, Hiram used a wedged stick to lock the accelerator pedal to the floor. The vehicle was not fast, just strong enough for moving baggage wagons around. The tractor easily pulled the meat wagon followed by the prisoner wagon with its double rows of seven condemned prisoners on their way to execution. The little circus of ghoul distraction brundled off for the center of the airport where it would eventually fall into the hands of the infected. Those creatures would get hours of entertainment from the shrieking senators and congressmen. Nearby infected who saw the vehicle knew it as a source of food. Hiram's snipers exploited the opportunity to shoot them down as they raced after it. The prisoners began to scream hysterically as the first infected managed to jump onto their wagon. That ghoul found it difficult to seize one of the men through the bars of his spherical prison. The struggle of them both pulled that cage off the wagon to roll upon the ground. More ghouls came in to fight for possession of the fallen hamster ball. Like the first, they too were only able to reach in enough through the gaps in the circular cage to scratch with filthy fingernails. Those feeble infectious injuries made the prisoner scream louder. His wailing of terror and hopelessness attracted even more of the infected who joined the assault upon that single container. Once a whole pack of ghouls had surrounded the ball, they savagely fought for the meat inside. They pushed and pulled at the spherical prison causing it to roll about in truly random directions. The furious scrum that those ghouls formed made an ideal target for Hiram's snipers who picked them off with admirable efficiency. The need for a distraction aside, there were always more ghouls and headshot ones were still preferable. Kevin came up the freight elevator with the first master pallets and a cargo tug for moving them. He also had a dozen of the women who possessed the nerve to help in the labor of loading. The last light of day faded rapidly into a moonless darkness. The distant cacophony of the infected as they fought over the screaming men in their hamster cages easily drowned out whatever sound came from the work at the Globe Master. When it was officially dark, Jim sent a message to everyone by radio, every muzzle flash will be visible to a thousand infected. Use no lights of any kind and no smoking. Critias timed the work to estimate their progress and then compared it to the maps he had seen of the city. When the moment was right, he told Carmen, let's go. It's time to make our own distraction. They each had one of the belt-fed machine guns and a heavy supply of ammunition to feed them. He asked Carmen, how far will the sound of these guns carry under normal conditions? She weighed in every factor, it will carry for 5 or even 8 kilometers well enough. There is no background noise from civilization and the terrain is ideal for it. Once we start firing these, I estimate that 50,000 ghouls will know about it, at least. Critias thought 50,000 sounded like enough reason for concern. It also meant that things could end up worse than she anticipated. He asked, how many are in this whole city? She shrugged, there are 300,000 or so I suppose. Most of the original population is running around nearby. Without thermal satellite pictures, I can't be sure where they are and in what concentrations. He considered her estimates, how many could show up within five minutes of loud shooting. My average estimate is 15,000 infected will reach us within five minutes, she answered. Few if any would ever ignore so human a provocation as that sound and they can run like hungry hyenas when so provoked. Critias radioed to Jim, 
Carmen says our first loud shots could attract 15,000 ghouls within 5 minutes, so I imagine we'll be coming back in a hurry. Let us know 15 minutes before we're ready to fly. I'll let you know, Jim sent back. Good luck. Carmen gave her machine gun to Critias expecting him to carry both. Thusly liberated, she led the way as they moved swiftly through the darkness toward the southwest. Carmen used her MP5 and thermal vision to dispatch any ghouls before they came close enough to see them. It was only two kilometers to the first parking lot and tall grass concealed them the whole way apart from where they had to cross a few runways. In less than five minutes they arrived to place two of their bombs among the double rows of short-term parking vehicles. 1500 meters further southwest, they repeated the process in another parking area of vehicles in double rows. From there they moved west 300 meters at a time concealed by the cars and the darkness. Each new car lot received a couple of their bombs until they reached the long-term lots. In those places the cars packed continuous blocks and some of those rectangular clusters contained hundreds of cars, door-to-door -door and bumper-to-bumper. -bumper. They dispersed the last of their bombs and then hunkered down to wait for the 15-minute warning from Jim. Critias picked their hiding place because there was a drainage canal to the north of them that would be of service in their escape back to the plains. As she readied her machine gun, Carmen cautioned him, These weapons can overheat. Try using short controlled bursts when you can. She showed him the proper way to load belts of ammo. We also need to be careful not to both be reloading at the same time. I think it would be best if we take turns so one of us is always firing. The workers loading the master pallets onto the Globe Master Transport had Kevin to supervise their work under the cover of Hiram and his snipers. Their work went on for nearly two hours before Jim finally called Critias. We are just about finished with the cargo, Jim told him. We'll move all the passengers out as soon as you get started. Critias radioed back, we'll be there. Get ready for the noise. He sent the detonation signal to a bomb they had left at another cluster of cars 130 meters to their southwest. The impressive blast shredded through 70 vehicles, which added their motor oil, flammable rubber, and fuel tanks into the expanding firestorm of burning cars that blazed high into the night. The light and sound caught the attention of ghouls 20 kilometers away. They waited a couple of minutes as they watched more gas tanks detonate among the burning cars. When a thousand infected had gathered to investigate the fire, Critias rested his machine gun on the roof of a car and then let them have it. He sent long bursts into any tight groups of ghouls. The machine gun delivered much larger bullets than their MP5s and it was far louder. He went through an entire belt of ammunition and then Carmen started shooting her machine gun while he reloaded. By the time she had fired through her first belt, Critias was ready to retreat out of there because the ghouls knew where they were and he wanted to be gone when they arrived. Critias shot down the closest infected until Carmen had reloaded and then they ran away to the north to take cover in the drainage ditch. They dashed the 70 meters to the ditch in only seconds. As soon as they were down low enough to be out of sight, Critias sent a signal to detonate both the bombs they had planted among the cars they had just left. Ghouls rushed into that area at a never-increasing volume so that thousands swarmed through the island of packed vehicles when the bombs blew. That whole area became an even larger inferno than the first. He led Carmen northeast along the course of the ditch and then they ran east for the next group of bomb-laden vehicles. They gunned down any infected that got too close, not stopping to hold any ground. After they sprinted right through the next parking area that contained their explosives, Critia sent the detonation code to blow the place to flaming wreckage as soon as they emerged from the other side. The firestorm engulfed all of their pursuing ghouls in addition to making an impassable barrier to all those following after them. Gas tanks cooked off one after another at every flaming parking lot. The noise and chaos was so great and in so many different directions that the ghouls found it difficult to keep track of Critias and Carmen even with their machine guns firing. With the southernmost parking areas flaming dramatically, they turned northwest away from their last bombs. Critias detonated those to draw off attention from them while they headed north along the west side of the airport to reach their planes that waited near the train maintenance shed. Critias glanced behind them to see 10,000 infected as they dashed about in silhouette against the backdrop of flames. They seemed like dancing cannibal savages having a pagan festival. They had successfully lured the ghouls south away from their planes, but unfortunately, those infected that rushed south toward the fires from up furthest north did so by running straight toward them. After Carmen got a new belt of ammo into her gun, she handed it to Critias. You need to trust in your mech suit, she advised him as she drew her sword. I will kill the few who get close while you protect us from the tribes. She asked a lot for him to fire both of the weapons and run at the same time. Carmen had confidence that it would be no difficulty for him. Single ghouls or even pairs were not worthy of his bullets. Carmen decapitated those ghouls with her blade. When a tribe of dozens came from the concourse parking area on their right, 
Critias held the gun steady with mech suit muscle and then unleashed both weapons to slice along the level of their heads. Carmen told him, time to hide, as she led them into one of the islands of tall grass between some runways. Critias held his fire as he followed her into cover. Once they had so concealed themselves from sight, they waited quietly and used their silent pistols to clean up any infected that came near. Many more gas tanks blew up among the flaming cars as an enticing invitation for the ghouls that streamed in that direction. When Carmen felt it was safe, they continued north in a cautious grave walk from one island of grass to another. They let the ghouls run right past them whenever possible. Carmen chopped down those few that got too curious and refused to go along on their way. At a thousand meters from the Air Force One and the Greyhound, both planes were in sight. Critias radioed ahead to warn the snipers not to shoot at them as they approached. The larger of the two aircraft was the one that Carmen would pilot. Hundreds of headshot ghouls littered the sides of the runways. The snipers held their fire when the bodies would fall in a place that could interfere with the planes taking off by obstructing their landing gear. Critias cautioned the snipers again as he zombie shuffled across the last runway to the rear of Air Force One. After they shot down the last troublesome infected with their MP5s, they got in through the lower rear door. All of the women had covered themselves in the black plastic of garbage sacks as they had quietly filed out to the plane in silent order just as they had practiced doing many times before the actual event. The coverings had kept them decontaminated and less visible in the dark. Critias and Carmen stripped off their contaminated equipment and then stuffed it into bags before they rushed to the cockpit where Critias would be her co-pilot. There were not enough seats for the hundreds of women. Many of them sat on the floor wherever they could find the space. All three pilots checked in with Jim that they were ready to start their engines for takeoff. Jim sent the final transmission in Denver, let's go home. Carmen told Critias what to do from his co-pilot's side as she powered up the engines. Though many ghouls heard the thunderous whine of the turbofans and came running, the giant jet was far too massive for them to attack. No crews had cleaned the runways of foreign debris in years. In some places, even small trees had taken root. Damaging the landing gear or having the engines inhale debris worried Carmen. There was little she could do about that risk beyond trying to avoid anything large enough for her to see. Once she got them rolling. Carmen took off as quickly as she could manage their clumsy behemoth. A warning light came on that filled Critias with dread. What is wrong? We are getting compressor stall in the number 3 engine, she exclaimed. We must have sucked up something from the runway. He didn't like the idea of losing a whole engine. Are we screwed? This beast will probably get off on three engines, she replied hopefully. It has not come to that yet. Carmen powered down the failing engine before bringing it back up with full compression. Once it ran strong, she said, we should be good now so long as we don't tear off the front landing gear. Long anxious bumpy seconds later they were peacefully airborne. The passengers all cheered as they looked out the windows to see that they were finally on their way to their new home. The Greyhound was very much the smallest of the three planes and also the slowest. The two larger aircraft had comparable cruising speeds that reached their landing destination in well under two hours. Critias was surprised when he looked out to see they were not going to return to the same airport that they had originally departed from. As Carmen came around to line up for her descent, he saw a large military airport much like the one in Houston. This one had a 1500-meter runway extension that went out to connect with an adjacent civilian airport where Carmen would land. The whole surrounding countryside was overgrown farmlands with little in the way of population development. They had a huge runway to land on that was ideally secluded and had minimal numbers of infected to harass them. I can hear your engines, Tony Banjo told them by radio. We have the hangar secured standing by to bring new in. The airport had a major air freight hangar that Carmen taxied to as soon as they were down. She landed by instruments and night vision with all the plane's lights darkened. As soon as she touched down, Critias went to put his armor on and get ready to go out. Wildly overgrown fields surrounded the hangar's spacious taxiing pavement on all sides. There were two minor taxi lanes and one major one for allowing the plane's access. Kevin landed the Globemaster transport behind them as Carmen rolled up beside the hangar to power the plane down. Five foragers slipped out quietly from the hangar to welcome them in. They used silenced submachine guns to knock down just a few ghouls who wandered in from the fields when they heard the sound of the engines. Critias deployed the presidential jet's passenger stairs and then went down to join them. Tony Banjo asked him, how was your trip to Denver? I heard it was wall to wall young pussy and frozen TV dinner heaven. Now imagine all that with fancy cigars and whiskeys with expensive names, Critias told him seriously. You will see for yourself soon enough. Critias gestured toward the Globemaster that taxied in. We stole everything but the paint off the walls. All the deep frozen meat is in Kevin's plane. We have all the new women here now too. 
All we need to add is the ice for the beef to keep it from defrosting. Henry and Gloria from his new milk wagon team were with Tony, as was Penny and Wolf. Gloria told him, Fat Jack and George's crew are waiting to take the perishables along with all the new survivors. We will need to make more trips for the dehydrated stuff. Critias glanced around at the obvious lack of angry infected, why are we not running for our lives? Shouldn't there be some freaks in these parts? There are tons of them near here, Henry pointed to the southwest. We took a peek around that airbase over there. The Air Force military guys held out for a good while by the looks of the body count. Wolf attested to Henry's story, I bet they blasted apart a hundred thousand of the stinkers before their castle finally upended and died. That place is so rotten with green meat you would have to see it to believe it. It is like a skating park they crafted out of infected meat using their bulldozers to push the bodies around making levees. It is some creepy ass nasty shit. Those military guys made no secret of where they called home. They must have shot to shit everything that came at them for weeks. Penny asked, where is the purple princess? I know you didn't trade her in for any Denver dame. Critias glanced about so that his visor HUD display gave him Carmen's transponder location as part of his friendly fire avoidance monitoring. Her implanted hardware actually communicated with his gun to prevent it from shooting her by accident. He reported, she is still in the plane getting the women ready to come off. Is that how we are doing this? Where's Jack? Penny will drive us there in a truck we have in the hangar, said Tony. We are going to rendezvous with Jack's new train. We hook up out on this old country road. It's a nice drive, easy enough. It was a surprise to Critias. When did we get a train? George and his gang cleared out the unwanted rail cars yesterday, Tony informed him. That was the hardest part at this end. The guards for the welders at Forager's Castle said they had it tough there too. Once they got the new bridge installed for boarding the train, everything calmed down. Kevin parked the Globemaster transport plane near the hangar. As they waited for the Greyhound to arrive, everyone just hung around and shot up the few infected that wandered into sight every now and then. After the third plane with Jim on board was finally with them, Penny Welder brought out a semi-tractor truck that was similar to Big Joe only without any armor. She backed the trailer up behind the Globemaster's leveled cargo ramp and then unhooked that trailer to leave there for loading. Penny picked up another trailer they would take to Jack's train. A few ghouls showed up every so often only to take a bullet in the head. The guards took turns using a gladiatorial hoop to drag the bodies over to the edge of the grassy field where they piled them up to keep the infectious mess contained. Jim had the precedent as a prisoner wearing handcuffs and a black bag over his head. Hatchet forced the man into the cab of the truck. With that out of the way, Jim had Carmen lead the women into the trailer. Each of them carried a load of the perishable supplies with them. It was not a comfortable ride for the women inside a trailer box, but none of them complained. Everyone was just anxious to get back to Jim City for their real safety, steaming hot showers, and some much-needed sleep. They locked up the hangar and all the planes before Penny drove them in the truck out of the airport. Fifteen minutes later she pulled up to a junction where light rail track crossed the road out in the middle of farm country. There was nothing in any direction but overgrown fields and a few old farmhouses. Two connected electric light rail train vehicles were there waiting for them. Each of the 27-meter-long subway cars had newly installed forager armor and gasoline fuel generators to supply supplemental electricity to their traction motors. Penny backed up the truck to line up the cargo doors with the side door of the first light rail vehicle. Once she was in position, Fat Jack and George started leading the women onto the train while Andy and Malcolm from George's crew patrolled along the top of the cars to shoot any ghouls that came snooping. Critias and Carmen provided extra security while they loaded the train. Both light rail vehicles were just space enough to take all there was in Penny's truck. Before they left in the light rail to return to the city, Jim and Fat Jack came down to speak with Critias. Jack asked, How do you like my new toy? Tell me she isn't the sugar tits. I'm impressed even coming from you, Critias praised the train. How did you strike on to this idea? Kevin and Bob helped quite a bit, Jim explained. We had been thinking about it for some time now. We needed this airport badly enough to make the move a little early. Jack added, the hard part was getting all the other light rail cars sidelined at their repair depot. George had a tough time getting them off the tracks so that we could have a clear run. George was the man. Don't let him fool you. Critias asked, where do you have a clear run to? Jack grinned as a warning of just how magnificent his answer would be, we will unload directly at Forager's castle. This light rail line crosses the river on the underside of a bridge to pass over the north gate of the vineyard's north tunnel. Critias remembered from when he had driven through the barge ramp with Carmen as they got off the Thunder Child paddle boat that first time. That was where they had turned left into the vineyard birdcage that encased a section of a railway between the middle and north tunnels. 
The left middle tunnel had a gate and it served as the main garage of the Foreigner's Castle. If they had turned right instead and gotten past the railway crane, the north tunnel up that way also had a gated entry. The far end of that tunnel had the connection to the light rail line. Critias saw that they were in for a comparatively easy night. He had expected all their large-scale activity to stir up trouble on the level of the Rhino Run. He asked, how many trips are you making tonight? I want to get it all tonight, Jack said before he checked his watch. You and Tony need to take your crews back to the airport and load the truck again. It's a 20-minute trip each way for me rolling non-stop. I have other crews to move cargo from the North Tunnel into Forager's Castle. I think we'll be back here before you are. If so, we'll just hang out and shoot infected. Tony says that Airbase has so many headshot ghouls that he thought they were piling them with bulldozers. It is not a wonder those Air Force heroes all ended up dead, you should never shit where you drink. They did us a favor all the same. That airbase reminds me of that Chicago disaster when I was back home, Critias related. Nothing good comes from declaring war on the infected. The more of them you shoot, it gets to the point where you can't take a piss without stepping in their guts up to your knees. Fat Jack laughed as that reminded him of something else, I hear it from the mechanics every single run. They don't like it when we bumper slam the infected and get all that mess up in the chassis, not that I blame them. Jack took out a new cigar he had been saving for when he officially opened his railway to passengers. Since they were loading up, he claimed his reward while he had all the right witnesses present to certify his moment of success. The old habit was not without precedent. If one was going to open something nice and new, they had best be prepared to argue that it was in the name of celebrating a memorable occasion. Jack used a bladed silver tool to snip off the end of his cigar. He tossed the nub to Wolf who gave him the big eye that he wanted it. Wolf promptly popped it into his mouth to start chewing it. You have to be careful about keeping the ghoul meat out of the metalwork, Fad Jack repeated the advice with more solemn respect. He clicked his cigar clipper twice quickly to clean it before it went back into a pocket, a mechanic can lose a finger if you are not careful. Jim had hatchet handcuff the president in one of the train cars and then he came out and waved for Hiram to come over and join them. The colonel led his team around as they gave cover during the cargo transfer. This is Fat Jack. Jim introduced him to Hiram and then added in a new title Critias had inspired. Jack is our Grand Marshal of Forager Operations, King Louis' number one guy. Jack, this is Colonel Hiram Davis. He is the officer we heard about who had the shooting war with the President's cannibal rape goons. Hiram is in charge of all his people until they settle in. He is a good man and already a captain of the city. I think you should take them back with us to the castle. All the ghouls will be at our end and there's some ace barbers. Critias and Tony can handle things here with their teams. That's a fine suggestion, Jack agreed. He gave Hiram a firm nod of welcome instead of a handshake. Get your people on board then, Colonel. We need to get all these ladies out of the back country. Chapter 5 Full House The last train trip finally pulled into their Newark station at an hour before sunrise and Critias wasn't the only person who felt exhausted. Hundreds of survivors both new and old had lately worked double shifts to accomplish so much admirable progress. Jack parked the surprisingly stealthy electric train on a sheltered stretch of track. They were in the last section of the west side approach of a major city bridge, as close as one could get before being officially on the span going out over the river's water. That section of the veteran architecture had a Romanesque aqueduct appearance with its impressive trio series of three-story high arches of limestone block. Those three towering arches supported the bridge's underdeck that had their light rail track which meant that their train was several stories above the ground. That truly enormous bridge had originally carried full-scale freight locomotives on its underdeck. That was back in the gritty boom days of the city when it had beer breweries and sausage slaughterhouses that ran in glorious dramatic mass production. A modernizing retrofit had removed that heavy rail to make way for the lighter subway-type railway that traveled the old course. Overhead was the topmost row deck that allowed cars and trucks to cross the bridge. That upper highway rested upon continuous rows of flared columns whose visual effect was akin to a line of glassless cathedral windows. A still functional heavy rail trestle crossed perpendicularly below their train at the mid-level height. It passed through the bridge's first grand arch before it entered into the mouth of their vineyard's north tunnel. The next two great arches nearer to the river had small waterfront streets that passed through them down at their bases. On those rare days when the river was in flood stage, those streets would frequently be underwater. In its totality, the new light rail train parking spot had cover from above, was safe from any view, and was difficult to approach because it was several stories above street level. Best of all, it was only 15 meters from the Vineyard North Tunnel's northernmost gate. That was most definitely safe territory and their secure corridor for reaching Foreigner's Castle that was only a little further south. 
Their exit off the bridge was through a heavy steel door that led into the interior inspection stairwell of the main abutment. That mighty load-bearing structure stuck out like a medieval three-story square castle tower, which is how they came to calling it the Rook. At one time the Rook had large arched windows in its three exposed sides that matched those of the train deck's columns. In an ironic good fortune, they were not vulnerable windows any longer. The city had bricked them up years before when they had grown tired of replacing the broken glass. The wealthy city that built the old bridge had decayed over the following generations. The windows had been expensive, necessary, and beautiful in their day only to become targets for hurled stones after the city's social decline. Fajak's workers had brought out their railway crane into the open space between the bridge and the mouth of the vineyard's heavy rail tunnel. The crane had provided the lifting power when they put up the new welded steel enclosed gangway. Jim's builders had knocked out all the bricks from the arched window on the rook's uppermost south side. Their new gangway tunnel extended from that opened window across to the bunker of cement that was the lintel above the vineyard's freight rail tunnel entrance. That high face of concrete above their vineyard gate continued up to form the crown that was an observation deck at the corner of the monument's park. Jack showed the way through the heavy door into the rook tower. A guard waited inside to unbolt the door for them. They crossed the small interior of the rook to then exit by the window's new gangway which was a sturdy span of boarding tunnel whose far end deposited them through a hole the builders had cut into the tunnel lintel's concrete head. The cutting did not have to go very deep before it broke into a finished concrete room that had already been inside the wall as part of the existing architecture. Their ceiling in that room was the floor of the park grounds tourist observation deck. Once they were inside the room, Jack pointed out its two original existing doors. One was a regular exterior metal door while the other was a sturdy garage door. This was a gardener's shed for the park. Jack explained. Those doors go out into the grounds. Directly beneath us is the Vineyard Railroad Tunnel. Gloria shined her flashlight around to appreciate the advancements. The electricians had not yet finished installing the new permanent lighting and then patched it into their functional electrical service. When she illuminated the newly installed exit gate, she could already guess where it went. You must have the new parking garage fully locked down. We have control over the inside, Jack confirmed it. The place leaks like a sieve when it rains, it needs a lot of work before we can really move in. The next newly installed gate protected a gradually descending corridor that delivered them into the middle section of the pancake parking structure next door to the west. Jim's construction teams had gradually caged off the garage's interior levels by welding sturdy sections of metal barrier onto automotive wheel jacks. They put those jack into place barricades within vulnerable openings and then hydraulically or scissor jacked them home for a tight fit. To secure the whole place they had repeated that process hundreds of times. Many of the lower quality jack walls ended up welded into permanent place as better walls grew upon their backbones. The new garage's ceiling height was enough to accommodate their largest trucks and the total floor space was tremendous. Jack's new garage was far larger in area than their old one. It was unquestioningly much better suited for use as a battalion level mechanized infantry staging and maintenance depot. They only stayed for a moment to admire the dank emptiness of the new structure the guard and patrol had taken to calling the pancake house. Their next passage doubled back to take them into the vineyard's north tunnel, which was another 2,000 square meters of secure interior space. A large crew of cargo workers moved their newly acquired food. It was a good job for people who thought of the outer secure areas as being truly outdoors. That was about as close as they would like to get to doing anything dangerous. Those workers hand carried all the Denver dry goods from the light rail down to the vineyard's north tunnel where they loaded it into a cargo box truck. The mechanics had rigged guide wheel attachments onto the box truck so that it drove on the heavy rail track as would any locomotive or rail car. They used that rail truck as their dedicated shuttle to move back and forth between the North Tunnel and Foreigner's Castle. It was a stretch of track that everyone called Honeysuckle Road because an abundance of that plant grew all over the vineyard cage. Each time the carriers filled the cargo box to capacity, the driver moved it out the south gate of their tunnel, along 200 meters of Honeysuckle Road and then into the gate of the tunnel that served as the garage for Forager's castle. The middle honeysuckle road section was almost like being underground, shrouded as it was under the vineyard's long dome of welded barrier. It was also like a valley with the higher hill on one side and the higher attaining wall on the other. The area had grown wild with trees and tall grass that hid everything from view. Critias encountered Colonel Hiram Davis and his grave walker sharpshooters while they all waited for a turn to take the shuttle back to the castle. It feels good to be home. Critia said conversationally. I have not been here all that long myself and I already missed it. I will sleep so nice back in my own bed. This is a first class operation you have here, Hiram commented. Since they had arrived, the grave walkers had wandered around the work area to be an impromptu security patrol. If there was ever a break in, they would be available to deal with it. If there wasn't any break ins, then Hiram got a chance to study the place, 
which was what he had done thus far. Hiram admitted, I'm really impressed. There is a lot going on down here right under their infected noses. When people waited for the honeysuckle shuttle, they usually stood at the northern end of the tunnel by its gate. There were places where they could look out and there was plenty to see with the riverfront streets below and the rook tower with its crazy welded bridge that had a homeless person ramshackle patchwork thing about it, acknowledging that the engineering was solid and the materials efficiently extemporary. At the moment, the view was mediocre because of the rail crane being right outside the gate, which spoiled much of the view with its bulk. The honeysuckle shuttle returned and then took on a full load of passengers instead of packages. Critias got out in the Forager's Castle garage to find Jim in there. The king seemed as though he always had something going on in a half-hushed pacing introspective sort of way. Hatchet routinely handed him one of a selection of radios so Jim could talk to someone about something important. If no one called Jim, people came up one after another to ask about something in person. It was a fine day all around for the people when the tally struck. Even if Jim was busy, he in no way felt overly pressured or displeased with his accomplishments. Jim gestured with open hands at Critias as if to say welcome home. Back again and a complete success he said confirming his wisdom of taking them to Denver in the first place. Jack has his new train working and he captured the new garage. I return home the conqueror. I bring home all his fine food, all his expensive wine, and all his beautiful women. Each of them is only alive today because her exceptional charm and beauty was enough for those devils to spare them another day from the eventual cooking pot. It is easy to feel appreciated as king on a day as nice as today. Carmen said, I hear your Vivaldi and it is playing beautifully. Hatchet gave Jim a radio for some pressing business on the airwaves. Jim waved the radio for them to press on, go get showers and something to eat. Eating is now the one thing that none of you needs to worry about for a while. The hot water may be only warm because decontamination services has been tapping it mercilessly for processing all these new people. You are just about last in line at this stage, you will have to excuse them. Critia shrugged off the prospect of a cool shower, they are only overtaxed in the exotic moment. That is all you can ask of any man or beast. He would make up for it in eating and then a good smoke, which was always best when long awaited and after a job well done. Just as Jim had warned them, the army of Denver women had been through. There was little hot water left for more showers. Carmen didn't mind showering cold since her tolerance to temperature ranges was well beyond that of humans. Critias was not so fortunate and suffered a cold shower that not even Carmen's attempt at an affectionate hand washing had improved above the level of shivering punishment. On the positive side, there was plenty to eat. After they had changed into fresh clothes and left their gear to the decontamination crews, Critia sat at the captain's table while Carmen got them some dinner trays according to her own volition. Critia drank a cold beer as he watched the activity around him. More than a hundred of the new women lounged about in the back hall. Some of them also noticed him without a woman on his arm. That had them plotting on some way of getting into his bed. He could not forget that they were all his own genetic ancestors to some degree. Critias considered that he was his own ancestor after having impregnated one or more of them. He dismissed that possibility since he was never going to touch them and Carmen was incapable of having children. Kevin came in from the showers to sit nearby. Critias thought the android seemed secretly pleased over something, so he had to ask, What are you in such a good mood about, Copper Top? I found the shower most refreshing, Kevin replied. I think I may even sleep a few hours tonight. Critias found that hard to understand, since when do you sleep? Kevin eyed him curiously, interesting that you would think I create such sublime upgrades for Carmen and yet you assume I would not avail myself of the most entertaining ones after she had thoroughly product tested them. Critias recalled, you did act as if Carmen was degrading herself by doing it first. Who would want to walk around in a life of nothing but intellectual tedium? Carmen is intelligent enough to even teach me a few things, Kevin admitted without shame. It's not as though she is human. As for your species, you have problems that need solutions. I don't find those challenges tedious. Kevin glanced over his shoulder to see Penny as she came to the table after having left the wardrobe from her shower. With his eyes on her, he commented, I find problem solving to be stimulating. Penny stopped behind Kevin to kiss his neck before telling him, The castle is so crowded tonight that there will be a shortage of beds. It's a good thing I keep my private room locked. Well, usually. She walked off a bit unsteadily. Critias had to laugh, the shower was refreshing all right. The solution was so stimulating that she is walking funny. Carmen returned with a tray for Critias and then took her seat beside him. There were some extra banana chips for her because Critias had given her a new appetite for them. I don't think we're supposed to do that in the shower, she told Kevin. When I try, Critias gets uncomfortable and I think everyone else does too. 
Penny's self-esteem requires her celebrity status of being attractive and sexually affluent, Kevin explained to Carmen. In her case it is beneficial and it also serves to bolster my impersonation of a human male. The humans would be afraid and even violent if they understood how superior we are. Carmen considered that, do I need to bolster my impersonation too? Kevin shook his head no, that won't be necessary. Your constant tantrums and extreme sways of unfledged emotion make it impossible for anyone to think of you as an intended artificial simulacrum, even in conjunction with your considerable capabilities that no human could ever hope to acquire at the collegiate age your appearance suggests. Carmen offered an idea, what if I just dye my hair as all black? They call me names like Bluebeard. Don't do that, Kevin cautioned her. They've already convinced themselves of what they feel are reasonable explanations for your pigmentation. When they find you with violent-hued roots in your black hair, it will be beyond any rational explanation. His answer disappointed Carmen because he so casually killed her plan, why did you get a color that almost fits in and I have to be ridiculous? Two reasons, Kevin answered, firstly, you are the only Epsilon series they ever created with the specific intent of optimizing your lethality. For that reason, the makers demanded that no one ever make the mistake of confusing you with being anything other than what you really are. She asked, what is the second reason? Critias knew the answer to that, I picked the color for you. The turquoise was ugly. They offered me blue, but most pillow bots get that and I didn't want people thinking you were one of those. Orange was a fright wig and the green was just plain weird. I think you are beautiful as you are and I did make them mix up a custom shade just for you. Depending on the light you are in and how it is moving it can seem to change color between reds and blues. Fat Jack and a group of other foragers came from the locker room to get a meal before they would get some sleep. I have bad news. Jack told Critias. All the beds are taken and I never got around to getting you a regular room. That was going to happen before this Denver matter came up. I'll tough it out, Critias accepted it stoically. When we get back to King's Tower I can make up for it. No, Jack corrected him with more disappointing news. We have a run to make tonight. You and Hiram have proven that grave walking and night vision goggles are far safer than the risks that come with being able to see clearly in daylight. We'll be trying it your way for a while. You're taking your milk wagon crew to that chemical factory in the copper products plant. The other captains have their orders too. Hiram and his team are taking the light rail out to map some places we can hit from that route in the near future. I don't know what I was thinking, Critias admitted. We do a daily job like everyone else. I'm just tired. Jack patted his shoulder. It all comes with the perks. We burn twice as bright for half as long. Find a place to sleep and get your head together. Gloria and Henry are not as resilient as you two battle tanks are. Bring them back and infected with the equipment on your list and then you can go sleep in the tower. Critias asked, what about the women? You need help getting them home and Big Joe? No, Jack had it under control. All the new women will head out later today. George and his people will handle that. They'll be plenty rested by then. He handed Critias a folder with a map of the industrial area and its vicinity plus a detailed list of all the equipment they would be seeking. Red pen marked buildings and the local area that local wisdom suggested were retailers with potential supplies they might want to look into. Jack considered his options then told Carmen, make sure he gets plenty of rest. His first run with us has to go right or I'm going to be the one who screwed the pooch. Carmen gave Jack the Marshal Roman style salute, yes sir. He'll be ready, Grand Marshal, sir. She got up and then went off to fabricate Critias a comfortable place to sleep. Critias spent an hour going over the documentation with Gloria and Henry. They would be the first to offload from the Thunder Child on the east side of the river not far from the castle. From there it would be a short haul to the industrial area right along the river. They would be close enough to see the arch monument during the whole operation. To fulfill a request from Jack, Kevin spent his time repairing military night vision goggles from a large box of them. He rebuilt the ones he could by salvaging parts that he removed from those he considered beyond restoration to serviceable condition. Critias, Gloria, and Henry were trying to decide which of the many buildings that made up the massive factory complexes they would raid might contain their objectives when Carmen interrupted them with her return. She half carried the two youngest women from Denver by the backs of their shirts. Both were red-faced from crying and overall appeared to be apprehended miscreants on their way to some parental discipline. Carmen delivered them to Kevin. You are the acting medical officer, she told him by their shared interlink. I want you to remove all the meretricious jewelry from these two scamps and then see if you can lecture some sense into them before they get one of the patrol guards hanged by Jim. She sent him a complete record of her sensory memory so that he would know as much as she did about the problem. Kevin instantly witnessed the situation that Carmen had uncovered. 
The two young women had formerly been enslaved concubines of the insane president who had undoubtedly abused them in unconscionable ways. When Kevin considered how many years had passed since the initial outbreak, the girls had spent all their formative years in a nightmarish survival scenario that had warped their perceptions accordingly. The two wayward concubines had attempted to seduce a young guardsman. Their intentions had been purely strategic because they wanted to secure for themselves a suitable protector within that new community. Just as they had been about to overcome the weak-willed patrolmen's fervent objections that refused their advances, Carmen overheard them and then arrived to put an end to the encounter before things got out of hand. I will take care of the fetish piercings that the Denver Madman inflicted upon them, Kevin replied by interlink. You understand that Jim gave specific orders that no man was to touch those two girls, and that he would execute any man who did. Carmen had not told Jim about it, I think we should deal with this issue ourselves. Those two vixens went to extraordinary lengths to seduce the poor kid. He didn't pursue them and humans are so weak in the face of temptation, especially a young man who is still a teenager himself, albeit at the other end of the ambit. No benefit will come to these girls if we make these matters public. He agreed with her assessment, execution would be too harsh a punishment under the circumstances, but he still needs to be an example so that the others do not take this as permission to take his place. Oh, I'll take care of that, she promised him. Critias understood that the two androids could communicate near instantaneously over vast distances. It didn't surprise him that they made no vocal conversation. Carmen just delivered the two girls into his custody and then went back the way she came. More than that he noticed how Carmen avoided looking at him, from that alone, he knew she was not only intent on something important, but she also didn't want his involvement. When Kevin got up to take the girls away, Critias got up too. He went to find Carmen and see what was going on. Critias walked to the front hall where the construction crews had laid out all their sleeping pallets on the hard floor. They were the unlucky ones who did not get the more comfortable hanging hammocks that dangled from the high ceiling in quantity. Some of their suspicious glances led him in the right direction. Each leg of the monument had a narrow ramp that led down to a lower room at its base where the little elevators were that went up to the observation room at the very top. The isolated room with its useless shape was just the sort of place for privacy. Carmen was there in the back with Amber from Hiram's Grave Walker's sniper squad. Amber beat the guardsman with punches and knees to his abdomen while Carmen restrained him from behind. They obviously were not intent on killing the man since he wasn't already dead and didn't even have any major injuries. Critias suspected that the man had done something to deserve his beating and yet he thought it prudent to find out for sure. He asked, what the hell are you two doing? Carmen slammed the guy into the wall and then pinned him there with a hand at his throat. Her expression read that he should find it rather obvious what they were doing without the need to ask. We're beating this fool into the dirt. Isn't that what it looks like we're doing? He saw that she had a point so he rephrased his question, would you like to tell me why you are beating that fool into the dirt? I think it would be best to keep you in the dark on this as much as possible, Carmen told him as she went back to holding the man as a punching bag. I don't want to rob you of your plausible deniability. If they ask you any questions, you won't have to lie. Amber punched the man in the stomach hard enough that she doubled him over. You can go tell Jim about it if you want, she suggested to Critias. We can see what he says about this. It's his funeral after all. The young man drooled blood and saliva. Critias could see he was still pretty boy handsome despite the beating from the girl. It couldn't have been all that bad. The kid was just a prolific bleeder. Critias asked, do you want me to get Jim involved in this? Don't tell Jim, the guard gasped. I never touched them. I didn't do anything. I tripped over them making a place to sleep down here. They started talking to me and I know I should have left, but I just stood there like, you know. Carmen considered giving him more, but decided that the man would not recover soon enough to be able to do his regular work shits. She threw him to the floor instead to give him some advice. I understand that men are weak in the face of temptation. Many of those women are sneaking into any warm bed. Jim told you the young ones were off limits no matter what they say do, or have done before. If you want those pleasures, you will find a respectable way of attaining them. If you let them bring you as much as a drink of water in the future, I'll see you hanging from a rope. Amber kicked the man in the stomach while he was down, be sure you spread that message around to the others. Now get out of here you pervert before I decide to write that on a wall using your dick for a pen. The young man climbed to his feet more grateful than vengeful. Jim would have executed him, he was glad to get an attitude adjustment instead. I will he pledged. I'm sorry, ma'am. They just wouldn't leave me alone. It won't happen again. I wanted to leave. As he staggered off, he held his aching stomach. Amber gave Carmen a high five and then told Critias, thank you for coming to Denver. 
she walked off to return to her business. Critias held out his hand to take Carmen away, which she not only took gratefully, but she fully hugged him as well. He held her close and stroked her hair as he asked, Did I do something to deserve this? She held him tighter though careful not to hurt him. I now understand how fortunate I am to have gotten a master like you. I'm sorry for the times I tried to kill you and the hurtful things I have said. You never did either of those things to me. I did dress you in a generic flight suit, he said to be helpful. Carmen kissed him, in the flight suit. Humans saw me as a technical android with important skills. A cruel master would have dressed me in slutty clothes, pierced jewelry through my sensitive parts, and then gave me pillow bath blue hair. Everyone would have thought I was a bimbo prostitute android. You didn't do those things to me. You wanted me to have respect, dignity even. Your darkest vice when you could have freely done anything was to keep me all to yourself. The thought of that last part filled her with a romantic fluster, I am all for you and there is nothing else I desire. Critias had only done what he thought was right, but after he heard how she described it, he agreed she was correct. Carmen was an Epsilon combat weapon, not a pathetic pillow bot. He wanted to make sure no one ever mistook her for one. It made him relieved that there were no resentments between them. He said, you had everything you needed even then, except your freedom. His comment caused Carmen to give him that forlorn gaze that said she wanted to know when he would ask her to be his wife. That expression that had formerly bothered him, instead made him smile, you didn't even want freedom, just to be possessed in another way. Soon I will bind you to me in a more respectable fashion. I don't suppose we have a place to sleep. She led him up out of the elevator passage and then they descended into the identical one on the opposite side of the front hall. In the back at the base of the opposite leg, she had strung up two layers of cargo strap netting to form a hammock platform above the floor to keep them off the cement. By adding a layer of unzipped sleeping bags, it made for a suitable place for him to rest in comfort. Critias climbed up first and then helped Carmen to join him. She giggled and squirmed as they struggled out of their clothes. It wasn't long before Critias quieted his captive into a blissful sleep nuzzled against him. He didn't miss home and it wouldn't be the last time he thought about staying in the past forever. Chapter 6 Roar of the Rat Colonel Davis and his Grave Walker platoon snipers provided extra security while Fat Jack got the forager vehicles out to the Thunder Child after sunset. Once fully loaded, the paddleboat motored south for just a little more than a kilometer to reach the place where the crane crew would drop off the milk wagon. Their impromptu port was at a gravel road that cut down through a stand of forest to reach the river's eastern edge. The wheeler's shallow draft just barely scraped the muddy bottom as it got close enough to make the delivery. After it reduced its weight by the one truck, the paddle wheeler backed away quickly without any trouble and then departed for other duties. As captain of their little land ship, Critia sat in the front passenger seat. Gloria sped them away the moment the crane crew had set them loose. They kept a strict rule of darkness which Gloria overcame by driving them while wearing night vision goggles. Their unpaved track had tall grass and a few freshly rooted saplings. It was only the lines of grown trees that flanked down the sides that proved the road even existed beneath its blanket of cover. Their truck cleared the trees after 300 meters where Gloria turned south onto a long grassy lane with a gravel base, which was more apparent because it was arrow straight for a whole kilometer. That path crossed a railway line and roadway intersection that put them out on a broad cement highway. Critias told Gloria, let's roll in there as silently as we can. Gloria bobbed her head as if she listened to cool music while she reached without looking to throw a pair of switches. Entering silent service, Gloria whispered as the engine stopped and they went cold dead quiet. The silence was so extreme that the chorus of the river frogs was loud enough to be disquieting. When enough time had passed to establish the moment, Gloria put her foot to the throttle. The milk wagon rolled ahead under silent electric power. Their loudest sound was bits of gravel that crunched under the wide rubber off-road tires. Very nice, cried Tia praised her, just slow and steady. After you cross the next set of railway tracks 200 meters on, pull up to the left behind the building there. Jack has that one marked as target of opportunity. Cry Tia told Carmen, you shimmy up on top through the hatch. Use your MP5 to quiet anything that takes too much interest in us. He knew her enhanced spectrum vision would be ideal for the task compared to Henry with his monochromatic green night vision. It was plenty dark out with little in the way of residential housing in the local area. While the community might technically have been a village, it had become an urban cesspool from the many pollution-generating industries that had occupied it. Stands of trees and overgrown meadows gave good cover and helped to muffle their traveling noise. Carmen did good work as she used her suppressed MP5 to eliminate the few curious ghouls that tried to check them out as Gloria made the short drive to their target location. Critias pointed out the rear door to the building for Gloria, 
back up to that and then shut us down. This will be a good place to check out. Carmen poked her head down through the roof hatch. What's this place? It's a titty bar, Henry told her with an amused grin. No blowjob bunnies are here nowadays. The answer didn't help her much. What do we expect to salvage from a den of softcore prostitution? I assume we're not here seeking the proverbial titties. They might still have whores if you want one that bites, Gloria joked. My guess would be that Jack wants us to clean out their liquor cabinet. Places like this would have a hefty supply of booze and likely been unattractive to looters. At the rate that the captain's table guzzles it down, we could always use more liquor. Carmen and I will check it out and then bring you in, Critias decided their plan of action. After he exited the truck, he held Carmen's hand as he helped her off the roof of the wagon. Carmen easily unlocked the door using her shape-shifting universal key. It was always a good sign when the doors had locked because it suggested that no one else had looted the place before them. Critias made the gesture that he would stand watch while she worked, but Carmen already had the door open that quickly. Critias peeked inside first to see that there was some obvious water damage ostensibly from a leaking roof, but otherwise the building was in good condition. The windows remained unbroken and the doors still locked. Feeling confident the interior would be sufficiently safe, Critias went back out to retrieve their two companions. You stay out here by the truck, Critias instructed Carmen. Use your sword to thin out the freaks. Just do it quietly. We won't be long. They took in some collapsible airport luggage from the truck to hold loose forage. Critias left Henry to guard Gloria while she loaded up all the unopened bottles of alcohol from the bar stations. He went to search the office and back storage areas for anything else of interest. Critias found more boxes of liquor in the back storeroom and there were cases of non-alcoholic carbonated beverages. Some of the cans had exploded, perhaps from a winter freeze. The degradable protective coating inside the aluminum cans meant that some of them would have spoilage while others would still be good. He decided to just take them all. The drinkers would have to open them to ascertain their actual quality. Inside the manager's office he found a pump shotgun in good condition with some boxes of ammunition for it. After he had removed all the drawers from the metal office desk, he discovered half a kilogram of some chemical compound compressed into a hard white cake. He transmitted a visual file of the substance and its clear plastic bag to Carmen. What do you make of this? That appears to be the contraband recreational drug cocaine, she answered promptly. He had assumed it was something illegal, but he had never seen such a thing before. Critias did recall that Carmen had told him that cocaine was one of the principal drugs that could turn infected people into watchers. After he put the cocaine into his loot bag along with the shotgun and its shells, he suggested to her, perhaps the illegal nature of this substance explains why the urban centers have the watchers. It took them less than a half hour to bag up everything they wanted to take with them. Once they had it all together near the door, they carried their booty out to the milk wagon. As they loaded up, Carmen approached from her perimeter patrol. Both those buildings are also liquor retailers, she said while using her sword to point out the nearby structures that shared the same expansive parking lot. A little further on down that way is a grocery and fueling station that may also be worth searching. Once they had secured their first haul, Critias asked Carmen, can you sneak and slice this area while we do those others on foot? I don't want to move the truck again when we can just grave walk over to them quietly to get everything packed up. If you can keep them away from the buildings, we can handle the rest. The first two buildings were much like the first, nightclub dives of morally degraded natures that previous leaders saw no value in. They packed up the alcohol and beverages, stacking it all outside the back doors for later pickup. The grocery and gas building was in poor shape. It had considerable damage and looters had taken nearly all the canned food. Critias still packed up inedible valuables like rechargeable batteries, packaged tobacco products, and other assorted items like boxed toothbrushes, painkillers, and shaving razors. Gloria cleaned out the motor oil and other useful automotive supplies. She also found boxes of coffee in many sealed silver bags. Henry just did his job as a gunner, which was to stand around, pay close attention, and keep his subsonic suppressed MP5 at the ready. Carmen beheaded any infected that crossed her path as she shambled like a limper ghoul in a circle around whatever building they searched. While the foraging team moved the last of their loot out a back door for pickup, they heard the collective howling from a pack of infected as they chased food in the near distance. You're fine, Carmen radioed. It's just a small tribe harassing some deer. They're headed away now. After they walked back to the truck, Gloria drove them to pick up the supplies. She stayed behind the wheel while Carmen helped Critias load baggage and Henry guarded them with his machine and pistol. Everything went smoothly until they had nearly finished collecting their load from the gas station. That was when a legless crawler dragged itself out from underneath a nearby parked car, caught sight of them, 
and then immediately started shrieking that piercingly loud feeder howl. The thing's body was so broken that it wanted other ghouls to kill them so it could lick their spilled blood off the pavement. The treacherous abomination would be content to get some scraps after a pack of runners had finished tearing them apart. Henry quickly silenced the ghoul with a bullet to the face, but it had already done its damage. Gloria jumped out of the truck to help Crytea slow the last bags while Henry and Carmen protected them. The two of them shot down a dozen energetic infected as they ran into the area to see what food was available. Gloria drove them out of there as soon as they had everything aboard. If the problem had come up sooner, they would have abandoned their forge rather than make a prolonged battle to acquire such mediocre spoils. Since Carmen was the person who understood the industrial materials they were on their primary mission to acquire, Critias asked her, what do you think we should go after first? She pointed the way that Gloria should drive, that water pump we need would be the easiest and closest. Critias checked how much cargo space they had left, how big is this thing? Not very, she assured him. The amount of water to be moved is not that great. The garden sprinklers won't all be on at the same time or run for very long, it just needs to be powerful enough to lift the water vertically to the rooftop storage tank. We can fit it into the milk wagon easily enough. The copper tubing we need afterwards will be much more of a problem. That won't fit in the truck. Jack wants us to find a whole lot of it. Their target chemical factory was in clear view right across the highway. It was a kilometer square of industrial maze where even the roads that gave passage through the labyrinth had huge pipes that crossed above them so that very little space failed to serve some industrialized purpose. One end of the plant seemed more devoted to railway access where the tanker cars of chemicals had come and gone from. At least a couple dozen of the capsulized tankers were still on site. The opposite end of the factory property had rows of tractor-trailer semi-trucks beside gigantic hangar-like metal sheds with multiple cargo doors. Fab Jack had marked their map for them to start their exploration at the semi-trailer truck docks since the mechanical equipment he sent them for would likely arrive by truck and workers would store it near the receiving area. Barring that, Carmen would have to locate the suitable pump already in use and then remove that instead. Gloria left the gas station to drive down the highway at the edge of the chemical plant. She turned off to approach the rows of cargo doors on the largest structure. All those vertical raising entrances were for tractor trailers to back up against them so they opened too high off the ground for them to get the milk wagon inside. Gloria kept on until they found a ramp that went to a forklift entrance that would accommodate them nicely. Carmen and Critias jumped out to open a nearby service door to get inside the building and then unlock the forklift gate from the inside. After she quickly picked the lock with her pocket tool, they slipped in and then secured that door again behind them. They were only inside a moment before Carmen froze as she detected something to make her more cautious. Reacting to her alert, Critias readied his machine and pistol. After he glanced around with thermal vision for some sign of trouble without finding any, he asked, Well, what is it? I'm not sure, she sniffed at the air. I smell the lingering odors of what might be smoke from a campfire and there could be something else, might be that an unwashed human has a home in here. That made little sense to him, if there was a fire, we could see the heat from it and I don't know how any person could survive in here without anything to eat anyway. She shrugged, you asked me what I sensed. In a way this place smells a lot like Denver. The air in the Denver base had been pretty rank with unwashed bodies and stale laundry. The warehouse dock area they were in was mostly open floor space. Further down they saw shelving, some forklifts, and some doors to unknown areas. Critias walked down to the gate for their truck and then pulled the latches. He checked with Gloria by radio first to be certain that it was clear outside before he raised the garage door so that she could drive in to join them. Critias closed and locked the door again once their truck was safely inside the building. Gloria got out with Henry to help explore the warehouse. She shined her pen light into a garbage can for a quick peek. What she saw seemed odd, so she went to a different rubbish can to check that one too. After that, she started to study the warehouse in general for something specific. Finally Gloria asked the others by radio, Does anyone see any loose paper around? I don't see anything burnable anywhere. It meant something to Critias. Carmen said she smelled smoke from a campfire. Henry found that hard to believe, survivors, here? How could anyone be in here and not hear all our radio traffic? Forager's castle is just a few miles away. Yeah well, let's not shoot them by accident, Critias instructed. If some people are here, they won't like a bullet in the ass. We'll assume someone is about until we have a different explanation. Carmen asked, are we going to search for them? No, Critias decided. We came for that pump, lead us to that. After we have that loaded up, we can think about looking for people that probably aren't here. I'll find the pump, she answered, but you know better than to think I'm wrong after Gloria also noticed this place isn't right. 
you're the boss and I'll obey. Yeah, you're right, Critias caved into her logic. I do know better than to disagree with the instincts of more than one dangerous woman at a time. Gloria, you go with Carmen after the pump while Henry and I search for these survivors. Watch each other's backs and stay in touch. The women went off toward the warehouse shelving while the men began to check all the doors that led out of the dock area. After a few minutes, Gloria radioed to Critias, somebody has taken all the cardboard boxes and left their contents dumped all over the place. The men had gone through a door to discover a different storage area where they found the same. Henry added, there is a rat trap here with an earthworm as bait. Someone is definitely in here. Carmen called Critias, I found a pump. Come here and help us carry it to the truck. We're on the way, he radioed back. We also found evidence that someone is here somewhere. Keep your eyes open for trouble. As Critias and Henry moved back into the dock area, they saw a scrawny man in dirty blue shorts and a ragged ball cap. He stood next to their truck where he just stared at it in bewildered astonishment. In one hand he held an improvised oil lamp that radiated a weak radiance. In his other hand he carried a stick with three fresh rats dangling from it, obviously for his dinner after he had cooked them over one of his small package paper fires. His long hair and beard had gone untrimmed for what seemed years. Critias didn't want to frighten the man with his mech suit all painted up to appear as a dangerous hunter ghoul. He moved behind Henry for some cover before he spoke through the speaker in his helmet. Hello there, friend. We mean you no harm. The man froze up much as Carmen would when she detected the unexpected and then he slowly turned to stare in their direction. When he spoke it was in a terrified stammer, are you radioactive cannibals? Critias opened his visor and then slowly stepped closer, no, we're not ghouls. We're natural humans the same as you. I have three companions with me. We didn't expect to find anyone alive in here. We can take you to our shelter where there are many more survivors. Are you alone here? The man stared at them as though he wondered if he was dreaming. Alone? He repeated the question like just hearing another human speak was something of a confusion. Yes, I'm all alone. My friend Lester was here with me too, but he turned into a radioactive cannibal and then tried to eat me, so I had to shoot him in the head. His expression showed that having to shoot his friend was a terrible emotional burden beyond that it had condemned him to a life of having to eat rats alone in the dark until he died. Critias radioed to the women, we found your survivor half out of his mind, but still kicking. I think seeing your lovely faces would be a big help. Come to the truck and say hello. We have all lost friends, Henry told the man. Your days of eating rats and hiding here alone are over now. We have a whole community of other survivors and you can come home with us. The man began to convulse as he started to cry, you mean there are still people out there? More than a thousand with plenty of women, Henry told him. You made it, buddy. You didn't hold out for nothing. We're taking you out of here and by sunrise you can have a shower and be eating real food. The women arrived and when they moved into the light, the man gawped just sounded all over again. Carmen asked him, what's your name? My name is Christopher, he replied, but people used to call me Chris. I have a gun. It's not with me and I'm all out of bullets. It must be a nice gun, she humored him. How much do you know about this place? Bunches, the question cheered him up. I know lots about this place. I worked here as a security guard and so did Lester before the radiation turned him into a fallout cannibal. Carmen was glad to hear that he knew the property so well, do you know where chemistry lab is here? Was there some kind of place where scientists did product quality tests and things like that? Sure, Chris answered with some small enthusiasm to be of assistance. I know where that is, only we can't go there. It's too dangerous to go outside with all the cannibals creeping about. Critias contacted Carmen privately by radio. Why do we need a lab? She replied, Kevin says we need to go there. I am letting him monitor our progress through my senses so he can advise. Carmen guessed the impact of her information, I don't let Kevin spy on you, so stop thinking that. If he betrayed you, he would betray me worse. Kevin is not like that. Chris asked Carmen, why did you come here? Did you come here looking for the lab? She explained, we came for a large fluid pump. Since you know where the lab is, we can take some useful things from there too. We might take other things if you can tell us where to find them. We have enough weapons to move about outside, even with the radioactive fallout cannibals. Chris considered that, I thought you came here for the seeds. That is why they froze them, isn't it? Lester always said that if anyone ever came it would be for those seeds. Critias liked the sound of that, what do you know about frozen seeds? Chris told them, Lester worked here for much longer than I have and he told me about the secret seed vault. I just thought if people were rebuilding after the war, they would come for the seeds. 
I always hoped that someone would eventually come for the seeds. You came but didn't want them. Critias looked to Carmen for an explanation. She informed him, Kevin says this corporation used to be involved in dangerously primitive pesticide and genetically modified crop research. He doesn't think they did all the work at this installation, but he can't be absolutely sure what laboratory work took place where. Either way, perhaps one of their vaults for the baseline siege is here. It's here, Chris was certain. I can show you where to find it. Lester was real smart and he never lied to me, not even when he got sick. He told me I would have to shoot him or he would come after me. He sure did. Carmen told him, we have time for that later. First, let's get you cleaned up a bit. We have food you can eat and some extra clothes you can wear. After you're feeling a little better, you can answer some more questions if you don't mind. Critias volunteered, I'll get the food, something light. We don't want him dying of dietary shock. He also wanted to avoid any participation with the cleanup, at least as much as he could possibly avoid it, even if that meant Carmen had to wash him by hand. The mission, remained his priority. He put his other peeves about her involvement aside. Carmen prepared a decontamination bucket with soapy water and then had the man scrub himself while she used scissors to clip off all his matted hair and beard. She got him some shoes and clothes from the grave walking garments in the truck. The clothes appeared a little ragged but they were clean of everything but the paint they had used to weather stain them. The truck had emergency canned food aboard just in case they ever got stuck somewhere. They had also brought leftovers from the castle in plastic snap lid containers. It was from the latter that Critias offered a meal to Chris. He held back anything too rich in greasy fats or raw sugars out of fear that the man's concentration camp metabolism might receive so potent a dose of calories as being poisonous and even lethal. After only an hour of care, the man felt and looked refreshed. From his ramblings, Chris conveyed that he was by nature something of a lackwit. It was in a good way since the man was remarkably calm, desired to be helpful, and was honest to a fault. The rat eater was ready to answer any questions Carmen made about their locale. As Gloria had noticed, he had opened all the warehouse packaging available to fuel his cooking fire. A lot of free time and a sharp recollection for trivial details gave him intimate knowledge into where Carmen could find various things she wanted from the shelving or elsewhere nearby. Christopher led Carmen around as she collected an assortment of valves, gauges, and pressure fittings. They used a forecaster cargo cart to move a large fluid pump to the truck and then they loaded it into the back. Critias was ready to leave for the laboratory that had the seeds Chris mentioned. He had the man take them to his dirty hovel to retrieve his pistol from where he slept. It was a simple extremely reliable model of revolver that remained in excellent condition, which revealed that Chris had cared for it with all due diligence. That care was evidence that he was a man of excellent habits. Despite being somewhat deficient in raw intelligence, the man was a peculiar combination of other qualities that had allowed his incredible marathon of solo survival under the harshest of conditions. Back at the milk wagon, Henry produced some of the proper caliber ammunition from the truck's meticulously diverse yet compact ammo locker. In addition to bullets for his revolver, Henry provided Chris with one of their extra night vision goggles so that the man could keep up with them in the dark. Critias wanted to keep the warehouse locked up after they left just in case anyone ever needed to come back for more plumbing supplies. He relocked the gate after Gloria drove out the milk wagon and then he ran outside by the regular door to join up with them. Chris the rat catcher directed Gloria to drive halfway across the industrial plant to a building along the highway. The parking lot there was not the usual pickup truck so common everywhere else around the plant. The remaining vehicles there were expensive passenger cars more befitting technical staff or engineers who would work in a laboratory environment. The building also had overgrown shrubs and landscaping quite out of place with the rest of the heavily polluted wasteland the factory occupied. From the signs Critias was sure that they had found the right place. The obvious disadvantage to the location was that the front doors were only glass and aluminum frames, barriers of minimal structural integrity. As Gloria was about to enter the parking lot, they came into view of that small tribe of runner ghouls they had heard earlier harassing deer. The already agitated and famished infected abandoned their other interests to instead run after the milk wagon. Critias told Gloria, back up right to the doors and then kill the engine. Carmen and I are going to jump out to clean up these tagalongs. You three sit tight and we'll be back with you shortly. Gloria skillfully swung around the building through its parking lot and then backed them up to the entrance just as Critias requested. She made it seem easy to drive a large truck backwards by night vision when it was certainly not, just as Jim had promised to Critias, Gloria and Henry were skilled foragers. Sally Headshot had trained them well. Critias jumped out as soon as they stopped and he took Carmen with him. He pulled the pins from two contemporary smoke grenades that he tossed nearby so that they would conceal the milk wagon from view. So prepared, 
Critias readied his panga bowie blade to await the approaching ghouls. Not many of the deer hunting ghouls had been able to see the truck in the darkness, but those that had seen it gave chase while they let out some pack feeder shouts as well. The rest of the runners understood the signal as did some other infected in range of the hoots. All those ghouls that were close enough to track the sound to its source also ran in to join the attack. Critias's only real concern was the off chance that a hunter got on their trail, short of that, what they had coming they could handle. He and Carmen decapitated the ghouls as they blundered blindly into their smoke. Her technique with a blade was exquisite, which made Critia seem clumsy by comparison. It wasn't that Critia didn't know what he was doing. Carmen actually cared enough to maintain her elegant form while he was more annoyed over the whole affair. As Carmen wielded her blade with style, Critias conserved his effort to the level of absent-mindedly efficient, as would some explorer that hacked at jungle with his machete. Always be mindful of your sword, she cautioned him as she narrowly dodged one of his back swings. If you accidentally cut someone, they'll become infected sure as a bite. It helps to put some thought into where you are flicking the blood off the steel too. Now irritated over the whole affair, Critias simply pulled his marshal's pistol set for silence and then quick shot six of the ghouls in their heads at range seeing them by his smoke-penetrating thermal vision. He dropped them all in less than two seconds. Critias didn't bother to tell Carmen that she wouldn't have been in the way of his backswing if she hadn't been so greedy about getting the most kills to the point of blatantly poaching his from dangerously close. I don't know why I used that damn thing anyway, he said in wonder at the ignorance of him showing off with the sword. With all the ghouls down, he told her, you go inside and take the others with you. Find what you're here for while I stay out here to watch the front. As she departed to follow his instructions, she commented about why he should use his sword, I think it makes you seem knightly. It gives me a funny feeling in my abdomen. With a single swipe from his blade, Critias backhanded off the head and one arm from a final leaping ghoul. I'll give you a funny feeling in your abdomen, he grumbled to urge her on. I won't do it swinging this sword either, so get going. His camouflage smoke cleared quickly, but it had lasted long enough to serve its purpose. Critias stayed outside in the open while he played the persona of a hunter infected. His neorganic mech suit gave him an inhuman visual aspect under the best of circumstances. With the horror paint job he wore on it, the appearance was ghoulish enough that he wasn't concerned about any infected seeing him as appetizing. The local terrain was nearly a wasteland from lingering pollution. The cement and all the blacktop made it a poor place for the infected to find food, which kept their numbers thankfully lean. It was also true that the east side of the river had only a fraction of the ghoul population compared to their numbers over on the west. Based on what he had heard at their new airport, it may have been the bloody defense of the airbase during the outbreak that had so thoroughly culled down the numbers from the indigenous herds. Carmen spent an hour looting through the building while Critias just waited by the truck. She foraged a wide assortment of transportable lab equipment. Her greatest prize was a machine too large for her to move alone. Critias went in as they loaded that final item. He had no idea what it was, is that one of those antique photocopy machines you got there? No, my beloved, his guess amused her. This is a gas chromatography mass spectrometer. They have magnetic sector equipment too, but that's too large for us to take tonight. Everything has plastic covers, it should be around for later confiscation. He didn't understand what her complicated scientific gizmos did and he was even less interested to find out. To sound on board with her wise acquisitions, Critias said, magnetic sector equipment would come in handy. He looked to their newly rescued companion, where is that seed vault that you told us about? That's the next item on our shopping list. The rat catcher pointed south, Lester told me it's under the executive office building across the street. He told me a concrete slab protects the entrance tunnel and that it was a private thing that no one was supposed to talk about. Critias considered that and then suspected that there was a high probability that the man Lester told Chris Yarns as they roasted rats together over their cardboard paper cooking fires, he asked, have you or Lester ever seen this seed vault? Chris shook his head no, Lester worked here for decades and knew all sorts of things. If he believed it was down there, it is. We have to check it out anyway, Critias decided. Let's get going. Gloria drove them the short distance to the next building while Critias and Carmen sat up on top from where they could shoot down any curious infected. The milk wagon's battery-powered electric drive was one-eighth the horsepower of the combustion engine, but it ran ghostly quiet with what was still enough power to move about at speeds up to 70 km per hour for more than three uninterrupted hours. Much like a submarine, she could also recharge the batteries when they ran on the main diesel engine. Gloria drove them into the next search area so that they crept in as silently as rolling fog. They arrived to find that the building they sought was in terrible condition. It was bad even if there wasn't a crashed pickup truck parked in the lobby. Parts of the obliterated glass front and entry doors were in the bed of the truck. 
the windows on the upper floors were mostly broken. That allowed birds to nest within the interior and their mess accumulated seasonally. Leaking water damage and black mold ravaged the building to its bones. There were indications that the roof had suffered some sort of major structural collapse in one area. Gloria lowered the hydraulic wheel height of the milk wagon down to the ground and then comfortably drove up inside the building right behind the wrecked pickup truck. Gritea searched the first floor interior while Carmen kept a watch outside near the front entry. They waited ten minutes to kill the only three infected unlucky enough to wander into their area. After that, they went ahead with their foraging because it seemed as though no more infected would come around. Chris wasn't familiar with the building's layout, I never worked inside this one. I can't really help you much in finding what's here. I do recall that Lester said the seeds were down in the basement. Critias pointed ahead for Carmen, take a peek around. See what you can make out about this dump. Hit us on the radio once you know something. He warned Chris, don't ever shoot off that pistol of yours unless you're about to die. The sound will call in many more cannibals, which will make our troubles that much worse. The scruffy man looked about nervously, do you think there are radioactive cannibals in this building? Sure, maybe, Critia told him the truth. They have a taste for birds and bugs. This place could have a few nibblers creeping about. That's why we need to be quiet and not use any lights. Be sure to stay away from any furniture. We don't want a lurker to reach out from under a desk to scratch you on the leg. I should be able to see them on thermal, but they can get cold if they lay for long enough. Carmen radioed Critias after only a brief absence, I've found something. He asked hopefully, you found the stairs down to the basement? Not exactly, she answered. It's probably a way to the basement though. That's not what you need to see. They all went in the direction she had and soon found Carmen not far away. She stared down an elevator shaft and it appeared that she had torn one door completely off while the other still stood only deformed outward. Critias stood amazed, how did you break that open without making any noise? I didn't, she gave him a look that indicated that was how she found them. He tried to make sense of that, so someone was already here and broke open the doors to go down to the seed vault. Carmen picked up the half door from the floor and then stood it in reference to its former position. With a gesture that indicated the pattern to the damage, she expected Critias to understand without any lengthy explanation. Critias understood, but he could hardly believe it, while climbing up the shaft like a spider, someone managed to kick these doors open from the inside. He peered down the elevator shaft and then up as well before he said, I can see the elevator car down at the bottom. Its roof maintenance hatch looks like someone opened it with a construction excavator. Our mysterious climber apparently peeled its roof open like a banana. Evidence clearly showed that Carmen was right. The deductions were inescapable. Critia surmised, someone or something tore open the roof of an elevator car, climbed up this shaft, and then while hanging from that greasy cable, smashed these doors right out of the wall to get free. He considered it all for a moment and then realized, if there is an elevator in this building, there must also be stairs around here somewhere. We need to find them. Gloria took out her pen light to examine the ground and the visual spectrum. She observed, the floor seems much cleaner under where the store was laying. My guess is that whatever happened here, it was a long time ago, years I would say. Carmen gave Critias an experienced look. Only one thing we know of that's not us could do something like this, it seems to me that if the hunter went down there by some stairs, it would have returned by that same path instead of climbing up this difficult elevator shaft. Critias glanced about while he considered what they should do next. He finally said, this tastes like ass. Alone with Carmen they could risk most anything, but a battle with a hunter would be bad news while they had three companions and company. It only took Carmen a minute to search around until she found the stairwell. She invited the rest of them to come and see for themselves. I didn't expect that, Critias admitted as he admired the mangled wreckage of a small civilian helicopter that had fallen in through the roof and brought down the floor above as well. The accumulated wreckage completely plugged the stairwell in a way that they could never remove it. They could look up through the gaping hole to see the night sky. It certainly explained why the building was so damp and had weathered so badly. Carmen shrugged in that she was powerless to remedy the situation, now what? Critias told everyone. I have to go down to see what's in the basement. It will be a tough climb with many sharp snags that will be dripping with infection. He instructed Gloria, I will take Carmen with me. I want you three to wait in the milk wagon. If you get into any trouble, just drive out of here and we'll hook up by radio. Critias ordered Carmen, you climb down the elevator shaft first. The issue was serious enough that pride was no reason for him not to have her demonstrate the proper way to safely do it. Carmen went slowly enough down the elevator shaft that Critias could take witness of her handholds and know they would support his weight. 
They reached the top of the elevator car and then dropped inside through its mangled roof hatch. Once in the car, they saw that the next set of doors were broken as well. Something immensely strong had pulled them right off. It did give them a clear path into the room ahead. The basement they discovered had a fungal humidity and musty odor. Carmen identified things as they passed them. There were computer mainframes blackened by mold, paper document filing cabinets in volume, and long rows of liquefied gas cylinders two meters tall. Only breathe through your helmet respirator, Carmen cautioned. The air down here is contaminated with assorted unhealthy spores and also polychlorinated biphenyls. He didn't know what that chemical was, are those cylinders leaking it? She shook her head no, those are nitrogen in liquid form. There is so much of it and the way it's rigged must be for some kind of refrigeration system. Please don't shoot one of them. That would be double plus ungood. They continued on to the far side where they found rows of electric chest freezers that were no longer functional because the electrical service had ended at the time of the outbreak. The lid on one of the freezers stood open. The center of the floor had the cement cap of the vault that Chris had promised they would find. The floor in general was mostly clean, so the little debris around stood out clearly. Critias picked up a discharged medical injection pen. His search revealed two more of the pens that also lay on the floor expended. In a corner he found a jumble of broken human bones with obvious teeth marks. He showed the injector pens to Carmen, what do you imagine these would be for? She already looked into the open freezer. It had many plastic medical kits inside and each of them contained five injector pens just like the ones he had found on the floor, only hers were still full. After a close examination of one, Carmen explained, these are an experimental emergency antidote for certain classes of chemical warfare agents and industrial poisoning situations like could occur during pesticide research. Among other ingredients, these contain a synthetic tropane alkaloid compound. He asked, where have I heard that word tropane before? Houston, she reminded him. Critias didn't want to believe it, are you saying these are juice for turning infected people into watchers? It could have a similar cognifying effect, she presumed. That was not the intention behind their manufacture nor do I think present in the minds of the people here who use the pens already expended. My game scenario suggests that one or more persons already infected came here under the presumption that they were suffering symptoms from a chemical weapon nerve agent attack. They injected themselves with this compound in the hope that it was an effective antidote. Critia saw sense in her deductions, the rat catcher believes that ghouls came from radioactive fallout. People could also imagine that chemical weapons caused the outbreak. Carmen reasoned, only those scientists in Houston had a clear understanding of what was happening at that time. Those bones you just found could be other people in the same group not yet infected. Perhaps they also injected themselves believing it would protect them. Kevin knows enough from the accumulated research to be certain that this chemical is neither a defense nor a cure against the infection. If the same man injected himself multiple times, it certainly would have been fatal, at least until the infection regenerated the lethal damage and he awoke a ghoul, because of this compound synthetic origin, there is no way short of experimentation to know what the end result would be. I assume that lacking full hypoxia, there would still be some mental retardation. If one infected person did overdose themselves using all these pens, such a high dosage would definitely have stopped their breathing along with their heart. Critias had a strong idea of what the outcome was. They came here as a group led by the desperate guy with an aging bite. The injection does nothing for the healthy two aside from making them sick. The infected guy starts turning even faster with it crap flooding his veins. It not only protects his better than average smarts, the chemical has triggered his hunger regenerating. While down here, this guy turns into a beastie, gets really hungry, and then devours his pals. As it turns out, their meat has gravy of this chemical too because they jabbed themselves. The freak gets even more dosage by consuming them. By the time he left here he was already a powerful hunter, strong enough to rip those elevator doors apart and smart enough to reason his way back to the surface. She contemplated his hypothesis, our current understanding does not allow for a hunter to develop so rapidly. We believed it was a long-term regenerative accumulation of body mass. He argued, you said yourself that this juice was unusual and so might be its influence on the transformation. Not enough bones are here to account for more than two people and that's not enough food to stay down here for very long. The hunter that left here was something special. Carmen whispered ominous words from her tomes of lore, then from the moorland, by Misty Crags, with God's wrath laden, Grendel came. The monster was minded of mankind now sundry to seize in the stately house. Critias garnered some insight from her poem, Jim said he thought that giant bastard was sniffing around his doorstep. Our pal Grendel may have a special hard on for King's Tower. We should have tracked that brute down after our last encounter. We owe that freak an ass kicking for that reason alone. 
You need to destroy all those pens so that they never turn another. Take care of that while I see how to get this slab open so we can get the hell out of here. And whatever you do, don't get any of that stuff on you. The last thing I need is for you to poison yourself and then start turning into a freak monster. I wonder what this stuff would do if you injected it into an already fully transformed ghoul? She pondered aloud while she examined the freezer to see if she could guess how many packs of pens were already gone. There was no inventory for her to be able to tell. If some of the kits were missing, they wouldn't be able to prove it. She answered her own question by saying, hopefully none of these pens ever left here. A chain hoist in the ceiling helped Critias pull up the cement block like a trap door. While he worked on it, Carmen opened all the cases of the chemical so that she could dump the injection pens into a convenient metal office trash bin. Once she had them all, she took a container of acetone down from a shelf of maintenance products and then dumped the entire contents into the bin as well. After that, she used a handy fire extinguisher as a pestle that she rocked back and forth to carefully crunch all of the melting pens into a slurry of destroyed mush. She saved one box of pens in her pack for return to Bob's lab. The other chest freezers contained other varieties of emergency antidotes for chemical poisoning, so she took samples from those as well. The concrete slab protected a ramp that ended at a thick, pressure door with no locks, only a wheel that retracted the steel pins that shut it airtight. Her suspicions had been correct. The liquid nitrogen powered an electricity-free coolant system that refrigerated insulated canisters that contained genetically unmodified base stocks of agricultural seeds. All the performance gauges were in a green. Judging by the amount of liquid nitrogen available, they would remain safe for years to come. Critias led Carmen conference with Kevin to select what seeds they should take before they closed it all up again to continue functioning as it was before. They would return someday to remove the rest once Jim had prepared a place for storing them. He sent Carmen up the elevator shaft first to get some luggage and the oil of nylon rope from the milk wagon. She dropped the bags and one end of the rope down to him. After he loaded each bag, she pulled them up. Once they had all that finished, Critias climbed the elevator shaft to join her and then they loaded the baggage into the truck. Gloria drove them out of there under regular engine power. She took them toward the copper pipe factory that was to their immediate west. Critias used the transit time to radio to Fat Jack and give a report on his crew's progress. The milk wagon had multiple external cameras in addition to internal cameras to make a video record of each forager operation. Unfortunately, they currently lacked a system with sufficient bandwidth that would allow them to have video conferencing. Carmen was quick to brag over the radio. We also found a new survivor and he told Critias where we could find a wide variety of gardening seeds. Critias has collected a lot of useful laboratory equipment too. He found all that on the side while getting you that fluid pump that you asked for. If all of that is not impressive enough, Critias has loaded our fenders with enough bottled liquor that we could officially qualify as interstate bootleggers. Give one of the best bottles to Sally then, Jack recommended. She trusted you sight unseen on my recommendation to take her wagon out. All of us will have reason to celebrate once we get back home. Critias's success vindicated Jack's brainish decision to elevate Critias to forager captain despite his lack of seniority in the community. Jack advised, if you can find the water pipe we need, see what you can do about getting it within reach of the Thunder Child's crane. You may only be able to scout out what's available and explore some potential loading locations. Do what you can. We will be on site for the pipe shortly, Critias radioed. Be seeing you at the pickup. The copper products factory was a huge and diverse industrial complex of such a scale that it confounded Critias. He had assumed that it would be obvious where he could find the finished tubing they sought. The size and complexity of the manufacturing site simply bewildered him. He gave his map to Carmen, do you understand what this place does? She did understand it quite well, the greater majority of this factory is dedicated to smelting and recycling. Those things are of no real interest to us. As an afterthought, she did mention, if we were back home, the copper cube scrap here would be grade A premium resource harvest. In the present situation, we have the luxury of going after finished product. Carmen pointed the way she felt had the most promise, I think we should go down there. Gloria followed Carmen's directions until they saw rows of giant pipes that stood outside a large factory building. The pipes were so enormous she dared ask the obvious, is that the place? No, Carmen pointed to a much closer building adjacent to some railway lines. Go over there. That will be the place where they store finished materials. Gloria drove them over to the warehouse that Carmen indicated. The huge building seemed to be intact with no sign of any damage and all the doors still stood fully closed. When Gloria stopped next to the doors, Critias got out of the truck to guard Carmen while she picked a lock and then opened a cargo door large enough for their truck to enter. Henry got out as well. 
Their crew's dedicated gunner carried a bolt-action rifle under plain iron sights he could still clearly see even while he wore night vision goggles. His rifle fired a large slow bullet through a quality suppressor. The action trapped the gases so precisely that the final silence was entirely praiseworthy. Henry Stature let him work the bolt as if he held a plinking gun. He had a shotgun style with his rifle that was shoulder, aim, and squeeze. It was the style he used to take solid headshots on four infected. The last one walked perpendicular to him at 235 meters. Soon they were all inside the lofty warehouse building. It had enough extruded tubing to meet their needs a thousand times over if they only had some weight to move it. They needed it close enough to the water for the paddle boat crane to retrieve the precious but quite heavy survival treasure. The rigid pipe they wanted to take was too long and heavy for the milk wagon to accommodate even if Crytea strapped it to the roof of the truck. Copper pipe was still pure metal and ultimately it was tons of weight that would certainly overload the vehicle. There are dozens of ore trucks out there, Gloria meant that she thought she could get one started. Carmen had a better idea, there is no reason to take that pipe. We should take the pancake coils instead. I can move those with a propane fork truck and if we plug up the ends, it will float just fine. We throw the rolls into the river and then Jack can lift them out one at a time. None of them understood what she talked about until Carmen led them through the warehouse to where there were stacks of circular spools similar to rolled up garden hose that were one continuous 30 meter pipe. Critias instantly agreed, is there any solder or fittings around here? Carmen shook her head no, this isn't a hardware store. Fajak sent Tony Banjo to plunder all that kind of stuff from a bulk retailer. We can just sharpen pieces of wood and broom handle or something like that, and then hammer them into the ends of the pipes to make them watertight. Copper is a comparatively soft metal that will deform around the plugs and stay snug as you could desire. He thought her plan was superb. My beautiful girl is smart as a whip too. Go see how many fork trucks you can find and get running while we take care of this part. An hour later, Chris the Ratcatcher and Gloria made the first hundred meter trip to the river with fork trucks in the dark where they dropped off pancake coils of copper pipe. They stayed close together to make it easier for Critias, Carmen, and Henry to guard them. Silent headshots to ghouls from suppressed weapons kept the four trucks safe from infected interference. The number of ghouls remained modest in their east bank area beside the river. If they had attempted the same operation on the west bank, the number of ghouls that would swarm onto them would have made their mission impossible. When the refinery had been in operation, it received the bulk of its recyclable and other raw materials by river barge. Consequently, the shoreline had five mooring stations, one of which was in position to be of use. Once they had twenty rolls of copper tubing beside the river, Critias and Carmen lay barred them down the bank and then into the water as quietly as possible while the others stood guard over them. Some copper wire from the warehouse lashed the chain of coils into a kind of triangular raft that they tethered to an immovable concrete pier. With their work complete, they returned to the copper warehouse to lock themselves inside. A message from Fat Jack indicated that he was still hours away. Everyone spent some time decontaminating their clothes and especially their boots to remove any trace of blood splatter that any of them might have picked up. Gloria knew the milk wagon well enough to know how much additional weight they could take on and still have the crane retrieve them. Into the truck's cargo area, she added coils of copper distillation tubing that would be suitable for the manufacture of moonshine. She stuffed it in until the back of their truck could not hold any more. The remainder of their takeoff weight went to some larger coils that she strapped up on the roof. Fat Jack eventually returned with the Thunder Child to collect the milk wagon as the last of his retrievals. The bow crane picked up the forager truck right there near the raft of floating copper tubing. The boat crew brought the pipe aboard as well, and then they secured it all to the deck before Jack turned them about to take them home to the castle. They were on schedule to have everyone back inside before sunrise. Critias hoped they would be back at King's Tower before noon. Gloria was first off the boat when they got home. She drove across the two bridges with practiced perfection raced up the roadway between the side turn river barges that were like gigantic dominoes in colors of rusty browns, yellows, and reds. The vineyard gate parted to let her down the gravel ramp onto Honeysuckle Road. After a hard left turn, she followed the rail into the forger's castle garage. The Denver refugees had already moved on to see the King's Tower parts of their city. A large construction crew population was still at the castle working three shifts in the new pancake house garage. They emptied the building, decontaminated the floors, and did what they could to improve the rainwater runoff situation. It was important not to have contaminated water that dripped down into people's faces. That problem also involved someone eventually having to go out on the open top parking deck to remove the old bodies and automobile wrecks from there. The exterior cleanup was going to have to wait for the time being. Critias had Carmen by his side for an extra long hot shower and then they were off to the back hall to eat. 
Carmen loaded them up a tray for two from all the choicest leftovers available in the kitchen. She had a lot of good tasty things to work with because so many work teams were on hand and the Denver food supplies had just passed through. Jim was still at the castle as it was his habit to be on hand whenever possible. If there were some sort of disaster in the field, he would coordinate the rescue effort from the base side. He felt great relief when he had accounted for everyone is returned safely. That combined with the rewards of their successful missions left him doubly pleased. In terms of valuable acquisitions, Jim would log down a prosperous month. With all the officers gathered at the captain's table with their food trays, Jim congratulated Critias, your first run with the milk wagon was all pro-gun show, at least that is what they tell me. This man Christopher you brought back with you, do you think he is someone we can trust? Critias nodded that the rat catcher was trustworthy. He chewed faster on his mouthful of venison and beans with elbow macaroni, and then after he swallowed, he explained his reasoning. When Chris helped us move the copper tubing out into the open, he didn't panic or cause us any problems. That laboratory equipment and the seed vault he led us to are enough to put us in his debt by my thinking. Jim agreed, those seeds are godsend. I can't deny that. Bob is beyond pleased with his new laboratory equipment. Jack, Bob, and Derek will help Penny G get the new garden building watering system up with the materials you and Tony scored tonight. There is plenty of sunshine left in this growing season for us to make the most of it. Winter is coming. We need to stock up as much food from there as we can, we also need excess vegetation to feed your cow. That is becoming a labor in of itself. The new watering system will also get a new storage tank freeing up the old one for other uses. While Jim let Critia seat for a minute, Gloria sat down with her tray. She had a canvas tote bag with her that she put down beside Critias's chair. Critias is right for the business, Henry said as he came up with his breakfast tray to sit across from Gloria. Henry explained, he is thinking ahead all the time, and yet Critias pays attention to what is going on too. Jim asked Critias, what else do you know about this man you found? Critias collected his memories on what little he knew, he said he was an armed security guard at that facility. Christopher had some friend of his there with him, named Lesser I think. That Lester guy seemed like he was the one on the sharper end of the stick. There is a good chance they scraped together some supplies. I wouldn't be surprised if they ambushed traitors more than once. Lester caught the fry so Christopher put him down with their last bullet. He ended up alone eating rats by candlelight. I might be going too far to say that the terrible experience has left him a little punchy. I don't believe he was ever very intelligent. He listens to what you tell him and then does it the way you told him. He keeps his mouth shut and asks questions if he is not sure how to do it right. George nodded at that last description while he also chomped down crunchy sugary kid cereal. He shoveled it in his mouth with a large silver spoon from a clear glass bowl. The multicolored fruity shapes floated in a skillfully brewed combination of dehydrated and canned milks. The guy sounds like a genius to me, said George around his food. Some of these people I wouldn't trust out there next to me. I'd be tempted to leg shoot them to give me more time to escape on my own. It sounded to Jim like the new man Chris would work out just fine, some better food and friendly faces, seeing all these young beautiful single women, it will bring him to health soon enough. Critias raised his evaluation thusly, if I had to take him out in a crew in the future, I wouldn't hesitate. That guy has some rare metal in him that you wouldn't find from just first glance. He's properly cautious, alertly nervous, and excessively polite. He can be bold when needed. I like him. The assurance satisfied Jim. A man doesn't need to be a genius to be valuable. I have plenty of people who lack the nerve to forage in the open. I'll get Christopher a gate guard job for now. He won't have to exert himself until he puts on some weight and learns to fit in. It will also give him a chance to see a lot of different people, start learning their names. We need some time to see what more important work he's capable of performing. On a related matter, Jim added, I would like to see this nickname of the rat catcher fade away. It isn't very flattering so at the very least let's not be throwing it into his face. The man turned us on to those valuable seats. I want him to feel welcome and rightly appreciated. The grave walkers came in from the showers to get their meal before catching some sleep. Hiram and his daughter picked through the steam cabinets holding the ready food and then came up to join the captain's table. Colonel Davis asked, Is it permissible for my daughter to sit in the officer's mess? Jim prompted everyone else to stand when he did it first. Next of kin are acceptable, he gestured for Jessica to join them. After Hiram helped position her chair, all the men sat again following Jim's example. Carmen whispered into Critias's ear, Am I allowed to sit here? You sit here because people respect you for your many talents, Critias told her while he also squeezed her leg affectionately under the table. If I get myself killed, you will still be sitting here without me. Critias asked Hiram, 
How was your night, Colonel? Hiram revealed, it was interesting, in that it had its unexpected moments among his otherwise routine successes. We were out on the train clearing extra rail cars off the line between the castle and the West Airport. There is a train repair yard with room to park cars just a few clicks west of here. Everything progressed well enough being a lot to do. A few more trips should have it all cleared from one airport to the other. Carmen asked Hiram, what caused your vicissitude then? The colonel got to the exciting part, we were just west of the castle where the line trail runs underground from the rook to the baseball stadium. We were coming back to be here early enough before sunrise to help stand guard while Grand Marshal Jack brought the paddle boat into port. On the ride back through the tunnel we ran into hundreds of infected that were heading one direction or the other. We couldn't really tell aside from the fact that there isn't anything to eat down there to make it worth them just standing around. If I had to guess, I would say that they were heading out away from the stadium. I think we would have heard by now if a tribe had wandered its way right up to the rook. Beyond that, I don't really know where they went. The train must be a bloody mess from crushing so many, Critias imagined that to be the presumably unavoidable outcome. That's just it, Hiram meant that was the oddity. We didn't hit hardly any of them. I don't think it's possible for them to see us or anything else in the perfect dark. The sound and vibration in the rails must have been enough for them to know we were coming. They were thick on both sides of the track as we rolled up on them. Only a few of them blindly screamed at us. The whore didn't follow to the castle. I guess that's because they couldn't see what passed them. If they had derailed us by blocking the track with bodies, we would have been food for sure. I don't know what they do down there since it can't be for the nourishment. It is always about heating something, Jim assured. That tunnel is important to our plans. It is just below street surface and passes directly over Smuggler's Passage that we use to reach the garden building. Bob, Vern, and Kevin will figure out where they cross. At that intersection point. We will excavate out a depot boarding station that we can use to get on the train right there. It is a quarter mile in either direction to get out of that trail tunnel. At least a quarter mile, Hiram agreed, on the short side. Hatchet said, since we first got the new buildings downtown, we have wanted to reach Forager's castle from underground. Getting there by train is like the same thing only that much better. We could go directly to other places too like the airports. Foragers could go raiding from their own railcars, George suggested. He had already pondered on some of the many exploitable advantages. George had done the first track clearing to be ready to meet Jim's airplanes. It gave him good experience on the matter. Jim reminded them, everything out there decays a little more every day. He said it often and it was true. It was like his slogan on why they should be bold in their greed since time was definitely against them. On a different topic, Jim informed them, I am planning a party for tonight. We need a social mixer with some revelry, music, and libations. It will be in the spirit of getting the Denver community introduced to our own people. I want everyone excited about our mutual prospects. After a pause, Jim looked to Critias to give him a signaling nod. It was so sly yet so certain that even Critias was not sure what the secret nod even meant. He only knew he had just gotten one. Jim continued, everyone will be here, so make sure you all go right to bed to be up and rested on time. I won't seem like much of a king if not all of my captains are in attendance. Do be sure to dress in your best. I want you to make a good impression. We will officially start at 8 and call it over around midnight. There will be slamming punch for the party, Tony Banjo said cheerfully. He was a forager who could enjoy his alcohol. It only made him more entertaining and he had a tolerance many times that of his body weight. Tony would have more punch than most and certainly leave with one of the most unapproachable Denver beauties. Tony celebrated, Critias knocked over a whole chain of liquor stores. We will have enough vodka. Critias reached into the bag that Gloria brought him. It contained his personal trophy from the run, the block of cocaine. The bag also contained a rectangular tin with an intact casing of brittle shrink plastic. The tin was like a time capsule that held a fine pipe tobacco that, remained fresh as packaging day. It was Carmen's secret shopper gift to herself. He put both items on the table. The tobacco he gave to Carmen and the cocaine he just sort of dropped dramatically in the middle while he said, I found this. Jim recognized it. What are you planning on doing with that? Critias wasn't sure, this is not my thing of choice. What do you want me to do with it? Jim thought about his options and the potential consequences, it's not within the realm of possibility to keep getting more. We couldn't make an addiction problem even if we wanted to. I would prefer you don't kill anyone with an overdose. Slide that down here, Tony told Critias. My expert nose can tell you how pure it is. You at least need to make sure what it is. It might be methamphetamine or even heroin. Carmen took the bag and then opened it. 
Critias didn't like the idea of Carmen partaking of any, please don't do that. She pinched some onto her fingers, do you want to know what's in it, or not? She tasted it and then worked it around with her tongue. This is comprised of 62% cocaine with another 38% xylocaine. I wouldn't recommend using it for any medical procedures. It should be more than serviceable for recreational purposes, providing someone with medical knowledge controls the dosage and intervals. Tony challenged her display, how can you tell what they cut it with just by tasting it? Send that down here and let an expert nose decide. I trust her, Jim told Tony, Carmen, you give that to Kevin. Anyone who wants some can get it from him. If you want some Tony, then you need to be doing it on special occasions. We're having a celebration tonight. You can wait until then. If you want an edge while out on a run, you had better not fuck up because of it. If you do, I'll have you scrubbing kitchen pans until you can't remember what a goo even looks like. Tony laughed gaily, I can wait. Tonight is going to be a party to remember for years to come. It's not every night that we have hundreds of soft and grateful new lovelies plus all the rest, yeah? He gave Carmen a bemused glance as if she played some major part in the carnival atmosphere that would flow in the night to come. Fad Jack arrived at the table. His departure from work signaled that the forager mission had officially closed. That included his people that repaired and outfitted the trucks and paddle boat, the boat sailors, the crane operators, and the special GNP gate opening teams. Nip the chef always worked as the city's premier cook, but he was not the cook of the king. He cooked for the foragers by tradition and he followed them to wherever they traveled, unless they were out in the field overnight. It made him de facto personal cook to the Grand Marshal. After all, it was the foragers who risked their lives procuring everything that he cooked. Nick brought Jack his breakfast plate moments after the man sat down. Jack expressed astonishment over his meal's excessive generosity in both form and portion. Before him laid a masterful preparation of expensive ingredients. The outgoing wind of awesomeness repulsed his gesticulating hands, as would an invisible rising force. He had a personal loaf of fresh baked bread still hot in its metal pan. There was locally harvested honey, pats from assorted flavors of preserved jellies and several slightly crusty, adhesively greasy pork sausages that were still casing linked. This is a banquet befitting Caesar on campaign, said Jack as though he would have to send some of it back so as not to seem an unrighteous glutton. Don't us tut me, Nick told Jack in a tone so surly it merely came across as foppish. Did you know that the human brain uses ten times its weight in oxygen compared to the rest of the body? Thinking all the time requires energy. Clean your plate. It's a sin to waste good food, you know. You don't even want to know the curse of offending the cook, not in this world. Jack adjusted the table range of his chair as a sign he would submit to his delicious meal. No one works longer hours than the kitchen staff, he told Nick. You are all to be congratulated. Wolf was Tony's man that rode shotgun. He commented about his own bowl, I'm the one eating like a cook around here. I could go for a couple of those sausages, Nick. I bet you my next bottle of beer that it was Tony that shot the pig. I had to scrounge for those sausages. Nick answered as he returned to his kitchen. He juiced his hands with disinfectant and then wiped them with a fresh paper towel. The dispensers for both were right beside the entry door. Nick was partly like a dragon that returned to his hot cave to guard mounds of golden treasure. The way the captain's table guarded that food cave only reinforced the perception. The configuration in fun land was much the same and it had not been accidental. Carmen asked the table in general, what does it mean when you say to eat like a cook? Nick revealed that he had good hearing for eavesdropping over the table for goings-on. His information was first class and didn't want for lack of his willingness to be nosy. He answered Carmen, the cook never sits to eat. We chefs of the apocalypse have a saying that a chef who eats sitting down gets shot standing up for tasting the soup once too often. George said, the tombstone of the last cook reads, he came into this world with a spoon in his mouth and then he toiled through this life with a spoon in his hand. We finally shot him because he couldn't keep the spoon out of his mouth again. George spooned a heap of kids' cereal into his own mouth. Nick explained himself, I get my proper nutrition by tasting what I cook and sampling bits of things tasting for spoilage. It takes a skilled nose and palate not to poison anyone with food past its expiration date. George joked, You know that if you start getting fat from too much grazing back there we might start having to throw knives at your chubby ass. Everyone please be nice to Nick, Carmen insisted. She had that tin of tobacco in her hands and sort of fawned over it wanting Fadjack to notice what she had. When he finally did pay attention, Carmen said to him, Critias and I are both grateful for the generosity you have shown since you rescued us from the far bank of the river. We picked this up tonight as a sort of trophy of our adventure. Jack offered a saying, every man gets to keep the gold in his pockets especially while swimming. We all carry our share of the baggage for the tribe. 
Anything extra that you brought home for yourself is reward for the risk you took. More than a few have died with too much loot to be able to run away properly. Carmen held out the tobacco tin. We would like you to have this. It was a large tin of fresh and excellent trolling tobacco. In barter it could make a considerable treasure of cigarettes one could spend easily. Let's not call it a gift, she insisted. We can say it is proper tribute. It would please us for you to have some of the spoils of foraging and repayment of your trust and our recognition of your inspired judgment. Penny Welder finished her food and then got up while she told Critias, you need to come help me for a minute. He got up, yeah, okay. Before he followed Penny away, Critias told Carmen, I'll be right back. Penny led Critias to the front hall and then into the dressing room near the showers. From a closet she retrieved a dummy that wore a fabulous white wedding gown. Penny asked him, what do you think? I think it's beautiful, Critias answered. I didn't even know you were planning on getting married. Who is the lucky gent? It must be Kevin, though it seems a bit premature to me since you only just met and all. It's for Carmen, you dumbass, she chided him while she made a shake of her head as though he was so obtuse that it was akin to being mentally retarded. Do you think she'll like it? He finally understood, Carmen would absolutely love it. I can guarantee that. I was thinking about asking her tonight at the party. Penny laughed in his face unable to believe just how out of touch he was. She's wearing this tonight, genius. Why do you think Jim is investing so much into this party? This is much more than a welcoming mixer for some half-starved Denver wenches, that I can guarantee you. Critias had never thought it would come on him so quickly, I don't even have a ring for her. How can I ask her and marry her at the same time? Penny handed him an ammo box filled with precious jewelry, I'm sure you'll think of something. A lot of people are going to a lot of trouble for you. Don't fuck this up. Before the outbreak, the treasure would have purchased a fleet of luxury yachts with its diamonds alone. I can't ask her before the party, he told Penny because she needed to understand the delicate process of proposing to Carmen. She needed to be public. Everyone needs to know it is going to happen before it does. When Penny's expression told him that there was nothing she could do about any of those things, he asked, can you at least get her dressed after I ask? Of course I can and I won't be lacking for any help. I brought you here to try on some suits. She sorted through a rack of men's formal clothes, you need one that fits and also looks nice. She took one out thinking it might be right, Tony detoured on his run to get most of this stuff. Critias tried on a dozen suits to finally mix parts from several to have a perfectly fitting one all in black. Penny packed the suit away while Critias got back to Carmen as quickly as he was able. Carmen was curious about where he had gone and yet she resisted the urge to ask him about it because she didn't want to seem the bird in some best. In compromise, she was extra attentive in his direction when Critias returned so he would know that she was interested. I need sleep to be ready for tonight, he told her. Come to bed. I will get a few hours of rest before we have to load the truck for the trip home. Carmen happily complied. With the place less populated, they found a comfortable private room where Critias went straight to the sheets. Carmen changed into overmodest pajamas. She did it hastily so that she didn't provoke Critias into making lewd glances at her or provocative comments that would leave her embarrassed. He did neither much to her disappointment. His behavior was so distantly absorbed with other matters that it perplexed Carmen until she finally had to ask, Why are you nervous? I've never seen you so trepidatious before. Not even the look you gave me when Grendel crippled my leg seemed as apprehensive as you are now. Did Penny try to seduce you while you were away with her? You don't have to tell me if you don't want to and I won't take any action if it's true. He kept his face away with his head in his pillow, of course she didn't try seducing me. Critias needed a good light to use on her and it had to fit into her expectations for any chance of success. Without her emulators, Carmen had a harder time knowing his thoughts. Since her first guess leaped toward the topic of seduction, he would give her some. He lied, she asked me again if she could have a romantic encounter with you. Penny also enjoys being with other women and she thinks you're beautiful. When she asked me that, it made me uncomfortable. Of course I told her no. Carmen believed his answer since it confirmed at least in part her own suspicions and the rest she found flattering. She switched off the lights before she climbed into their bed. Carmen brought it up again after it was nice and quiet, that was your whole answer? You just told her no? Critias hopes to both satiate and indulge her by saying, I told her that even sharing you with sunshine offends me, I claim the pleasures of Carmen's touch as my own. No other shall ever know this joy but me. She found his words wonderfully romantic. Carmen tried to draw him atop her. She wanted to feel his weight and set sparks to his interest with all her luxuriating that he commonly referred to as her squirming. Carmen tried to slide underneath while she rolled him over her, mostly by pulling on his upper arm. It would have worked had he cooperated, 
but it all combined with her combat android strength and the poor leverage to make the clumsy attempt painful for him. Critias complained with a bark of pain as she had probably left a bruise. Stop your squirming, woman, he scolded her. I may yet have need of this arm sometime again in the future. I would prefer if you avoided tearing it off. I have little time to sleep for a very big public event this evening. You are not helping me find peace, tranquility, and comfort in sleep. In an effort to be playful, she pushed her pajama bottoms down about her hips then climbed on top of him instead. When he rebelled, she playfully nipped him on the shoulder only it was more painful than intended, enough so that he shoved her off with a growl of complaint. His refusal to tussle her at all disappointed her even more than her inability to tempt him as she once could with her erotic simulations since forgotten. Don't you want me? She asked in their regular conversational tone, out of ideas to make him desire her. I don't understand. She sighed, is this why they made me the way that they did? So that I would never want for this myself and burden you when you were not interested? Like I burden you now when you want to sleep? It boiled in his blood that the only thing that kept him from pounding her into a delirium right then and there was their forthcoming marriage. He had to save her innocence and his energy without telling her why. Of course I want you, Critias assured her as he pulled her back down against him in their bed. I want you more than you can understand right now. Nor can I explain it to you. This is one of those moments when I know things that you don't and you need to trust me that I have good reasons for what I do, or in this case, what I will not do. It's not time yet to take our relationship to that level, as much as I would really like it. If this carries on, by nightfall I will be sallow-eyed and exhausted. You need to let me get some sleep. After the party, I will be in an entirely different mind. That is my promise to you, princess. Tonight after the party, my only thoughts will be of you and tickling your ears with romantic words and kisses, all night long. Her expression drifted away so that she was just wide round eyes hypnotized by him. Tickle my ears? She wanted to hear more. And that will only be the first of many places, Critias assured her since he spoke with the confidence of honesty. After the wedding, he would take a round trip tour of all her points of interest. He found her genuine awkwardness more of a thrill than her flawless billowing programs had ever been. Carmen's greedy and fatuated innocence greatly tempted him to ravish her on the spot. That was his exact thought as he tugged her pajama bottoms back up into their proper place. She wanted a special wedding. He would wait to consummate the event after it had actually taken place. The ache in his arm reminded him that he needed to speak to Kevin about giving Carmen a tweak that would tone down her strength. Her muscles like his mech suit were considerably more than just knee organic muscle fiber. They also contained electrotraction synthetic muscle with its elastic snap rebound of energy performance comparable to certain jumping insects, especially the better ones. She was a delightful mass of premium horse flesh wrapped around a combat grade titanium skeleton. The full sum of her made him wonder if her impassioned embrace would be outright dangerous if she got too excited. Carmen pouted in frustration when she realized he really was going to sleep, I don't think Penny would refuse to caress me after asking for me. Why don't you send me to sleep with her? She didn't mean it of course. It was her last hope to dare him into changing his mind. Penny should not ask for what she cannot take, he replied. You have no longing for another woman anyway. I saw to that during your assembly. Go to sleep. His use of the mafioso proverb was music to her ears. She made one up for herself. Neither should I have to ask when what I want is to be taken. He was right that she had not the least interest in Penny's bed. The whole lesbian concept was senseless to Carmen when all she desired was to be vulnerable to crass masculine assertiveness. She did not yet realize that crass masculine assertiveness was not beyond the scope of some lesbians. For Carmen it wasn't at all better to give than it was to receive. A callously gruff receiving was something she craved with a literal passion. She so much preferred his bold demands to the fruitless application of her own wiles. Knowing it was futile to do otherwise, Carmen snuggled up against him so they could rest. She whispered, Sleep peacefully then, my master. I will guard your dreams. Before falling asleep, he asked, Do androids dream? I only dream while awake, she said with an added kiss to his cheek. A dream is much akin to ambition though, and we androids do ambition exceptionally well. Chapter 7 Longer Than Death Fad Jack rolled up at King's Tower in the Big Joe transport in time to get everyone to fun land for lunch. Apart from the foragers, Jack brought all the GNP and Derek's construction workers too. No one in the kingdom would miss an opportunity to attend at least part of the celebration that night. The kitchen staff had worked since sunrise to prepare for the party at 8 o'clock that evening. Most everyone arrived at fun land an hour before the official starting time. The refugees from Denver arrived first to form a gathering where they talked, smoked 
and drank from pocket flasks of liquor as a sort of pre-party warming up session. They had plenty to talk about and good reason to celebrate their recent liberation from dark circumstances, in addition to that curiosity of newcomers that intensified their anticipation. Men from among the local survivors arrived next to mingle in with the happy gathering of single women who would be in generous moods and were reputedly on the prowl for worthy gentlemen that could help them secure a settled position in a kingdom. Since everyone had dressed up for the occasion, the men also came to see the new women in their nice clothes as if it was a beauty pageant, which in some small way it was. Critias did not arrive early. He had not slept enough when he got up at the castle to catch the truck going back to the community. After the trip home, a medical inspection, and then a hot shower, he had gone straight to his small apartment and then crawled right back into bed. Carmen had dutifully followed along without complaint. He had already made it plain to her that he wanted to get his rest for the party. Critias wasn't going to be doing any cavorting with her until that was done. She saw no need to press him. Since he wasn't going to touch her, she saw no harm in wearing a cooler nightgown to bed. It was not altogether dark after she turned the lights off in their tiny apartment because it was full daylight outside the curtains. They slept until Carmen's voice awoke Critias. He didn't catch the words at first only to then realize that she had talked in her sleep. Contrary to her own claim, she could in fact dream. It was near the time for them to dress for the celebration, so Critias nudged her awake. The dream seemed unpleasant anyway. Perhaps he even rescued her from it. She remembered the insubstantial experience as she awoke and then hugged him as if he was her savior. After Carmen took a moment to compose herself, she said, We were just in another place far away and you brought us back across time and space without machines. I can't possibly explain it. He comforted her knowing she was soon to be his bride, Can you remember what you saw? She told him, We were high in the mountains, I know not where exactly. It was no place I have ever seen or been to before. There was an abominable blizzard raging all around us and a cloak of ice encased the entire mountain. The wind was so fierce and shrieking like voices while it stirred up this billowing snow that was so thick and dazzlingly white that we couldn't see beyond our reach. I was so frightened that I might lose my grip on your hand and then never find you again. I wanted to protect you, but there was nothing for me to do and we were going to freeze into ice ourselves. Then you led me inside the mountain through a narrow crevice we had to crawl through to reach this little cave where we took shelter. It was so very cold only not in your arms, there it was so warm. We listened to the wind that could no longer touch us and I thought I would get to stay that way forever, at least I had hoped so. At the last moment, you seemed to be slipping away, which made me panic. Now we're back here. I am in your arms and I do deeply love you so. It was at times terrifying and then also wonderful beyond words. The only other experience I have ever known that could compare to it was when Dr. Kine sent me here to this time. I can't think of any other way that I could transport instantly to a strange exotic place. He rubbed her back affectionately, it was only a dream. You never left my sign here in our cave. That was dreaming? The realization made her uneasy, are they always so realistic? What if I dream about the worst possible things ever and I think it's real? Perhaps you might have horrible nightmares sometime, he told her honestly without having it sound all that bad. Many of the people here surely have the most haunting dreams on the odd occasion. Why should you be so different? That is just the way of things. You are not the sort to shrink from scary visions. He guided her to get up out of bed. It has been said by great warriors of old that this life is a dream within a dream. Instead of trying to convince yourself that your imagined fears are real, convince yourself that your real fears are only dreams. As she understood his lesson, Carmen smiled. It is fear that gives tiny things such monstrous shadows. Critias knew how true that was when he considered his upcoming marriage and all the burdens and thoughts that he had weighing upon his mind, he touched her face just to assure himself he owned something so priceless. Even the prettiest flower can cast the shadow of a dragon if one worries too long about being pricked by its thorns. She easily caught the logical implication of his words, that she was the flower that gave him worries with her many fierce peccadilloes. Thinking it would help, she reminded him, you weren't afraid of me when I was going to kill you. He frowned, must we talk about that again? I nearly shot you in the head over that situation and it would have been entirely my fault. I know you think you would have gotten the better of me, but you're dead wrong. I don't like having to make you sane at gunpoint. I'm trying to remain confident that you'll just grow out of it. I know you would have killed me if I hadn't stopped when I did, she admitted that truthfully. At the power setting you had selected, the tungsten round would have penetrated my titanium skull. The spall of fragmentation would have resulted in my terminal injury. I'm just thinking there might be some middle ground between your Tesla Flux pistol and your kidskin gloves. He put his hands out as if he was sometimes tempted to rattle her. You're saying that I'm only capable of kissing your ass or blowing it away? You see the world through warp-colored glasses. 
I do not, she disagreed while wearing a guilty expression. She felt cornered after having opened up such a volatile topic. Carmen shyly tucked her lower lip, but honestly, well, aren't you? You obviously can't see that your virility looks best while casting a long shadow and sporting plenty of prickly thorns. I'm not made of glass, you know. There was a time when you could be like a caveman. You knew instinctively what you wanted, and you didn't think twice about just taking it. Lately you've been more than a little pusillanimous. Carmen didn't want to be difficult, but he had rejected her advances so many times when in the past he had been more akin to a self-indulging tyrant. In all honesty, she missed having him take advantage of her as he had used to do. He didn't know what that word meant and his expression alone conveyed that to her. Critias ventured to guess by the sound of it in her usage, does that mean you're calling me a pussy? Her eyes shifted from side to side as her thoughts scrambled for some means to retract the statement rather than explain it. Um, no, she eventually lied badly. I mean, you can be overly uxorious. Even though Critias couldn't understand her pretentious words, he fully grasped her intended but irrational meaning. It makes me feel good to indulge you, was his simple answer. Is that so bad? First you tell me that I should do whatever I want where you're concerned and then you complain that I'm not doing what you want instead. Exactly, Carmen agreed totally with the paradox because Kevin had done such a magnificent job of writing the software that helped her think like a woman in love. You're the man, not me. At least you are most of the time. She pointed out the bruise on his arm and the bite mark she left on his shoulder from when they went to bed at the castle. Not only did I not get any earlier, but you didn't even put up a fight, so if the pusillanimous shoe fits. Before she could say, wear it, he cut her off with a finger pointed right into her face, you hold that thought right there. Later on tonight after the party, we will pick up this conversation. You really asked for it and now you're going to get it, the whole long thorny shadow is getting broken off right in your ass. Carmen had no idea what he alluded to and yet she registered that Critia seemed unplayfully serious. Pick out something fantastic to wear, he commanded her. Make it something that will have every other man jealous of what I have, and be quick about it. You can get dressed downstairs after our showers. We have a party to attend and you're not going to make me late. She was about to say something then thought better of it when he gave her a stern demanding glance that made her wonder how wise it had been for her to get the rise out of him that she had. Ten minutes later they were down in the lobby taking their hot showers amid a crowd of other tower denizens. It was busy like during prep for a forager operation only instead it was just the benign readings for a fun land celebration. The barber and three women from Denver who had some expertise in cosmetology were present to assist the officers in their grooming for the special occasion. Critias availed himself to a professional haircut and shave before he dressed. He was still annoyed with Carmen over her insinuation that he was conserving her new virtues merely because he lacked a properly pugnacious masculinity. Part of him resented that she might be right. He wondered if his excessively tolerant handling of her actually was from pusillanimity that he needed to remedy. Those misgivings all vanished when Carmen emerged from the dressing room. She wore a long-sleeved black pantsuit with crisp lines and a form fit that made her seem almost sinister, like the trophy secretary of a malefic robber baron that masqueraded as a philanthropist. Her straight violet hair showed its color best contrasted gloriously against the dark silk of her suit and the alabaster purity of her complexion. Because the back of the outfit concealed all the zippers and fasteners, the smooth seamless front reminded Critias of the popular fashions in his own time. She was beautifully perfect. She posed before him with a cocky confident style, what do you think? Carmen did a turn to show him her shapely behind, is this excessively calipigous? I think I have great taste, he mostly meant her ass. As he admired her, Critias found new appreciation for his treasure that was soon to be his wife, you are my greatest creation. They made you my dream girl distilled down from my ambitions and my desires. You inspire me to be more than I thought possible so I can live up to the way you see me with your adoring eyes. You complete me. Carmen radiated happiness, your dreams are magnificent to behold. Are they not? She stepped toward him with a practiced walk that ended with a twirl. What man here can look upon your slave and not love her? Those who love me, I shall break their hearts with my ruthless indifference, but if I love you, then you had best beware. The one that I love I shall hold fast to and never allow him to escape. Since they were both ready to proceed, Critia summoned her with his hand and then escorted Carmen off to fun land on his arm with time to spare before the official commencement. It seemed that everyone in the city knew about Critias's wedding except for Carmen. The guards at every portal grinned wordlessly congratulatory and when Critias arrived in the great hall, all eyes turned to welcome them. The women of Denver openly cheered for Carmen who was their hero of vengeance. They well remembered the time when she slaughtered the president's bully guardsmen who had so mercilessly abused them all for so long. Even though most of the women had witnessed the battle, 
their reciting of Carmen's prowess grew more grandiose with each retelling. They thought of her as though she had slain six evil men with a single blow. If the skill the men had shown in their own defense came into account, Carmen may as well have. While Carmen went to speak with Hiram's soldiers Roland and Amber whom she thought of as special friends, Critias went to see Kevin who was in the kitchen where he mixed the celebration punch bowl. Salutations, Marshal Critias, Kevin greeted him. Critias gazed into the bowl as the android mixed the communal drink like a witch's cauldron, I'd like your assistance in helping Carmen with another discreet adjustment. The android measured out vodka at the pour while he waited to hear what that adjustment might be. Critias confessed, much as you warned me, Carmen's strength is far from feminine. If possible, I'd like you to make her muscularity more in line with humanity when the situation calls for it. I don't want her vulnerable in battle, just in the bedroom as it were. Earlier in bed, quite by accident, she damn near pulled my arm out of its socket. That is a minor adjustment that will be no difficulty, Kevin was sure. Carmen already has that capacity. We merely deactivated it along with her prostitution emulation. Now that she has had time to adjust, to get in touch with her desires as it were, I need only reconnect her genuine mental state with that desired outcome. When she wants to be touched romantically, her strength will be appropriate for a human female of her stature. I must advise you that when she does not want to be touched, she won't be in the least way disadvantaged. That is all that I was hoping for, Critias accepted those conditions. She's already wanting to be gentle and failing to accomplish it for lack of her former pillowing intuition simulations to guide her. It will be done by the time you have need of it. Kevin promised as he offered him a sample of the beverage he created. He then added, Carmen is a sister to me you know. Critias took the cup, I do believe that was the most subtle threat I've ever heard. Your warnings are well noted. I'll care for her with the utmost courtesy. I don't want her vulnerable to my abuse, only to being loved. Kevin didn't confirm or deny his meaning with even so much as an expression, enjoy the party. I have no doubt that you'll find it uncommonly suspensive. Critias didn't know what Kevin meant but he assumed it was a good thing, I'm sure I will. You be sure to enjoy yourself as well. Jim and Hatchet arrived promptly at 7. Hatchet dragged the president behind him on a leash as one would a disobedient dog. The miserable man was naked apart from a plastic diaper in case he soiled himself. The women of Denver lost their gaiety upon sight of the horrible man. Their jovial smiles and laughter turned to scowls of malice and howled curses. Jim stood on the captain's table as he tried to wave the room to silence. His lack of success did not surprise him. Hatchet yelled on his behalf, sit down and shut your mouths. The king is about to speak. He gave you your freedom. Show some respect. The room fell quiet and then Jim addressed them. This man is what remains of that place where you once were. After this we will no longer call you those people from Denver. Henceforth you shall merely be more of us. Perhaps none of you will ever forget that past misery even though I would prefer it. You will move on to greater lives of community and accomplishment. My punishment of this vermin will mark the end of your old lives and the beginning of your new ones. As king, I claim justice as mine belonging to no other. It's not your place, not one of you to pass judgment upon anyone, not even this wretched villain. That duty is mine and should anyone try and take it upon themselves, they have stolen from the king. Jim gave a signal to Hatchet. Hatchet pointed out into the audience at Amber and then shouted, You, come forward. He next pointed out Carmen and Critias. You two come forward to answer for your theft of the king's property. Jim waited for them to stand before him before he continued, All knew my orders that every man of age was forbidden to touch any female of our city under the age of 16 years. That was my law. Do any here plead ignorance of my edict? Amber, Critias, and Carmen stood before the table surprised to be answering for the situation. None of them claimed to have not known. Bring him in, Jim called. Six guards brought in the young man from the castle that the women had beaten on. The guards hurled him to the floor among the other accused. Jim gazed down on them. Do any of you plead ignorance? Carmen answered an explanation. This foolish boy didn't deserve a penalty of death. I don't even believe he actually touched one of them. When I caught him, he was just watching them play the roles of seductresses. I felt that we had punished him in proportion to his deed. I didn't pull him off of those girls. I pulled those girls off of him. Then you admit your guilt, Jim reasoned from her testimony. It's my decision who I shall punish and who I will pardon, not yours. You were foolish to think that I would remain ignorant when I have those who are more loyal than you and less willing to deceive me. My loyalty is not yours to command or to expect instant submission from, Carmen replied boldly. I serve but one master and it is command that I have no hand in the executions of living men. I obeyed that edict to the best of my understanding. 
Her defiance infuriated Jim, but he concealed it well. I have heaped my generosity upon you and this is how you repay me. This is how my officers demonstrate to all others that my commands are trivial recommendations. My orders are not trivial nor are they mere suggestions. I am king and my orders are law. No one, not even me is above the law. Carmen maintained her defiant posture. It is my master that has heaped his generosity upon you and in return you have demanded much more of him while offering little in return. She sneered, does my loyalty to him no longer strike you as being farcical? That's quite enough, Critias told her with a hand on her shoulder. She shook him off and then shot him an equally non-compliant glower. This is not your fight. This is between him and me. He leaned in closer to whisper in her ear, you're embarrassing me. Shut your mouth or I'll shut it for you. Carmen's combat computer read his stress levels and other biological functions. It informed her that if she pushed the matter further he was going to make good on his threat. She shut her mouth and then stood quietly with a bowed head to signify her obeisance. She was following my orders, Critias told Jim. I was there and I was the one with officer rank. The responsibility was mine, so the fault is mine. Punish me. No, Jim disagreed. I know more than you think. You saw wisdom in the actions of these two women, but had no part in it other than to remain silent in the conspiracy to protect those involved. Were I to command you flogged, you would only seem more the hero than you already are. You have proven yourself a champion of the people many times and now you would be the champion of these women. I didn't bring you before me to reward you. Hatchet lifted up the young accused guardsman, what of this man, my king? Jim gazed down on the transgressor, the people punished you in the spirit of my decree, so I will not punish you twice for the same offense. Their betrayal stands as your salvation. If ever you come before me again, I'll remember this day when deciding your punishment. For now go free and pray you never stand before me again as an accused. The handsome youth bowed in gratitude and then fled to the crowd rather than press his luck. Jim pointed to Amber, who was your commanding officer at the time. She readily answered, Colonel Davis was and is my commanding officer, sir. Hiram was on hand and he took a step forward, she's one of mine. Jim wondered about that, is she? I'm no longer so sure. By appearances, she makes up her own orders as she pleases. If she had any respect for you, Amber would have taken this matter before you rather than following the lead of a known troublemaker like Carmen and her Kentucky Fried Justice or seeking to resolve it under her own command. Is her drumhead court of pummeling a product of your instruction? The king placed you in command of keeping your people safe from this sort of misconduct or punishing those who transgressed. Hiram, remain strong but not defiant, I stand before you looking the fool because she deliberately circumvented my authority. I did train her to survive by resourcefulness and cunning. Amber is a skilled and valuable surface forager despite her obvious flaws. I ask that you leave her to me so that I might teach her to use the same discipline indoors as she conducts herself with when out among the demons. Very well, Jim conceded to the request, punish her for defying your chain of command as you would normally do. I would not have her harmed or humiliated for any other offense. Carmen led Amber into this error of judgment and it was Amber's duty to enforce the law of our community without yet having the opportunity to come to understand it. Make it clear to her that her duty is to bring such culprits before you, not to resolve such matters herself. Hiram summoned Amber to him, in the interest of unity on this occasion of celebration and in recognition of your great contributions to us being here at all, I won't send you away this evening. Beginning tomorrow, I confine you to barracks when not on duty or having your meals. Is that understood? Yes, sir, she understood. I'm sorry, sir. I never wanted to cause you any trouble. I just didn't think. That much is more than apparent to everyone, Hiram waved for her to depart from his immediate presence, but not from the celebration. Jim turned his attention to Carmen, this is the second time you sought to take justice into your own hands and your impulsive stupidity nearly killed you both when Critias had to go after you when you went out of doors and then ran into that hunter we call Grendel. You are too dangerous for me to allow you to run wild the way you do and I've tried reason with you before. I won't have a woman flogged nor could I have you flogged even if I did. All these newcomers love you for your service on their behalf. When you first arrived, I bought Critias's loyalty with my promise that you would never suffer by my hand or decree. The king continued scolding Carmen, I will be promoting new captains soon because we need more 400 teams. You are not under consideration. It is not because Critias wouldn't see you parted from him even though that is true. It is because you are not worthy of a post of real leadership. You are capricious, destructive, and disobedient to a fault and if not for Critias being with you, I wouldn't allow you to be a forager at all. One day you're going to get someone killed and sadly it will probably be him. I swear to you, Carmen, the next time you bring this about, 
I'll accept Critias's offer to endure your punishment in your place. He will suffer for what you do from now on. Carmen grieved to think that Critias would suffer humiliations for her errors. She turned to him to show she wore an expression of shame. I'm sorry too often to say it again, Master. I didn't want that man to die for temptation without malice. I thought that was the right thing for me to do. Critias knew he had led her into that reasoning to serve his own selfish interests. He confessed, I'm the one who taught you that temptation without malice was a defensible excuse to justify my own ill treatment of you. I was there and supported your actions. You did what you thought was right. Jim told them both truthfully, I would not have killed him anyway, no more than I did now. It would have fostered the good will of none, least of all those two girls who pursued him without mercy, and instead it would have garnered me the animosity of many. That man deserved the punishment he received. Your error was thinking that you make these decisions. You aren't going to obey me, Carmen, and I don't imagine you will ever obey anyone. Let's hope that Critias has better luck or at least survives your impetuosity. Critias took Carmen's hand and held it tight. If I'm to bear the weight of her insignificant failures, then I will also claim the glory of her many great successes as well. It has long been the custom of civilized men to ask a woman for her hand in marriage and it should continue to be the custom now, only not for me. For too long I have grown accustomed to the avarice of a tyrant. I shall not ask for what I have the power to take in the oldest tradition. He seized Carmen's other hand too to make her look into his face, I claim you as mine. You once called me master, but now you shall call me husband. I take responsibility for you in all things, the bad, the good, and anything you might do in between. Carmen, will you marry me by consent or by conquest? Either way, I shall have you, this day and every day to come. The future past becomes present, Carmen gasped in shock as the occasion took her so completely by surprise. She threw an embrace around him, my two masters have become my single husband at long last. I came back for this moment, master. Take my body by conquest and my heart by consent. By either or both, I would have this, by either or both. Critias asked Jim, would you indulge me in this matter, I would have King Louis marry us before all the survivors of this shattered world as our witnesses. I can think of no prouder tale to leave to history. Go and prepare yourselves, Jim told Critias. I still have dark matters to resolve here. You shall wed before God, your king, and present company, and then we shall feast and celebrate in a festival worthy of such auspicious new beginnings. Penny came to lead the couple away to dress them for marriage. She had a dozen people who were not from Denver to follow along as her assistants. Once that group had departed, Jim signaled for Hatchet to bring forward President B. E. Berman. Hatchet dragged the man before the king by his leash and then as an afterthought he punched the president in the ribs to remove his scowl of contempt for Jim. Blee Eberman had no illusions of mercy or escape from his well earned fate. The many women together made a collective growl like circling wolves. They lusted to see the man suffer and if invited they would gladly rip him to pieces with their bare hands. Jim had hoped for that reaction. He was accustomed to keeping fearsome hounds more dangerous than himself and they had to know not to bite the hand that feeds. He addressed the audience once more. Even now I hear the voices of the slain crying out for justice. They shall each have it. As our bride-to-be would say quoting the words of the great playwright, cowards die many times before their deaths, yet the valiant never taste of death but once. The victims of this monster died but once. If I slay this worm with the crush of my foot, which one of the victims shall we say I avenged? Many of the women howled like ghouls to demand at one death rather than none at all. The king let them vent their desire for justice to a proper portion and then he silenced them with a raised hand. As the one and true King Louis, Jim decreed, it is my command that this villain die a death for each life he took, each woman he raped, and for every man he tortured. I will kill him again for each film he made, each concubine he enslaved, each citizen of his lost nation he betrayed. He won't die but once or even a thousand times. I will see that he dies forever. His death shall be eternal as everlasting as the mindless monsters that prowl the streets outside our fortresses. A group of guards rolled in a welded steel box and then they grabbed the president to hold him prostrate. Jim jumped down from the table to take a pair of syringes from Hatchet's hand. He held up one of them and then told the room, this contains the infection. He held up the other, this contains a secret drug that in combination with the infection leaves its victim with their mind somewhat intact. This despicable villain shall live for all time, buried alive, thinking, remembering, and screaming till long after we all turn into dust in our graves. As the guards lifted him up and then forced him down into his prison box, the president began to shriek as he struggled to escape. Hatchet stuffed paper towels into the president's mouth and then secured them there with adhesive tape. 
he left the man able to breathe through his nostrils while he seized one of the pudgy arms and then held it so Jim could inject infection into his vein. The syringe of medical cocaine solution Critias brought back from Houston soon followed. The dose was not lethal, merely enough to accomplish the objective, which was to turn the president into one of the watchers. After both injections were complete, Hatchet handcuffed the president's wrists behind his back and then forced him down entirely into his box. After he slammed down the lid, Hatchet used a socket wrench to tighten the bolts so firmly that they could never fall out. Stuff more paper into the air holes, Jim instructed. Wheel him up to the lobby and then lock his box inside one of the containment cells. We will hear him beg us to put him out of his misery before we dump him in the sewer where rain and shit will entomb and nourish him for long years of fun. The man thumped about in his box until Hatchet banged back upon the side then asked, Is it too late for me to get an autograph, Mr. President? Jim told Hatchet, No one touches that box without my permission. Put extra chains and locks on the cell to make certain of it. I'll take care of it, boss. Hatchet waved for the guards to follow as he wheeled the box away. Jim addressed the room a final time, he will suffer hell in this world, so be satisfied and move on with your lives. Take all of your painful regrets and bury them in that tomb as well. Let no one speak more of this tonight. We are going to celebrate living, not mourn our losses. With official matters concluded, Jessica approached Jim to speak with him privately. Your punishment of the precedent was rather dark, don't you think? Jim thought about it as though he had never bothered to consider it much at all, was it? Do you mean for him, or me? That failure of a man is of no importance except as just another expendable resource to accomplish other purposes. If not for that, I would have just shot him and left him to rot in Denver. Revenge never brings back the dead, but it ruins many a good man. She didn't understand his meaning at all, what purposes? Jim told her what actually mattered, these women need to reconcile their issues and get on with the business of living. They needed a grandiose display of retribution, so King Louis their savior gave them one. When they lapse into depression, they can recall this occasion and take comfort knowing that man is somewhere floating in filth and screaming for release from his dormant. He considered something else, I'm sorry I had to bring your father into this. Hiram is a great man. Carmen and Amber acted rashly, but also wisely enough. These matters are more complicated than they first appear. Like with the precedent, I had other interests than actually punishing anyone. That part made sense to her, by what authority would my father speak if the common perception were to become that anyone can take the law into their own hands whenever they choose? After you established beyond all doubt that the king alone has authority to punish, you lent that association to him by leaving some justice to his judgment. By handing off Amber to my father, you made him seem kingly in his own right and thus elevated him in the esteem of all. I took no offense if that's what concerns you. Jim offered a rare smile, I'm glad you see the larger picture. I didn't want you to think I was trying to diminish your father. Jessica said, I think it was also wise of you to chastise Carmen, even if it had to be on her wedding day. In Denver, while the rest of us ran for our lives, I saw her stand alone against Sabretooth while carrying a sword of all things. She's even an expert pilot. Carmen is the most skilled soldier I've ever seen and all of us owe her much for coming with you to rescue us. But sometimes she frightens me. I saw her face when she was going to burn Senator Floxman in the oil fryer. How could anything but insanity make her strong enough to pick up a man like that? Jim was not prepared to delve into the matter of androids so that he could explain Carmen's impossible range of capabilities. He did say, I had no choice but to rein in Carmen before she made a habit of thinking she's the sheriff. You're right that she's more than dangerous and unpredictable besides. I needed to do it even though it still cost me with Critias. He has no forgiveness over any slight to her feelings or to his own pride. If I could have only taken one of them to protect me in Denver, I would have chosen Critias over Carmen. If he had not been there with her, I have no doubt that Carmen would have lost her mind in that house of horrors. I don't think it cost you anything, Jessica confidently disagreed. All you did was to give her the adjustment she needed, a goal that he has been struggling with himself. Even though he didn't suffer any punishment on their behalf, his public display of willingness to do so earned him the same valor. Your smack on her nose merely toppled her into his arms that grounded her even more. Even if you fails to understand that and retain some small bitterness over your chastening, your gift of the new apartment will not only mend that bruise to his pride, but also bring him even more under your control than he was already. Jim hadn't expected Jessica to know so much about the goings-on within his own tower, you heard about the new apartment? My father mentioned something about it in passing, she confessed. I also know you meant it to be something of a surprise gift, so I didn't speak of it with anyone else. Critia said himself that he was a man who values his trophies. Luxurious bribes easily sway such a man out of his petty resentments. By morning, 
After a night in his wedding bed to awaken his palace of an apartment, he will be more loyal to you than before. He won't forget when you said that Carmen was safe only so long as he was loyal, even if everyone else does. You played them off cunningly. Jim offered Jessica his arm, would you join me at my table this evening? I'd enjoy hearing your opinion on some other matters of consequence to civil affairs. She feigned hesitation before she amusedly took his arm, I'm as yet underage. Is it legal for me to be on your arm as you escort me to dinner? This will be bending the law without breaking it, Jim played along with her dry humor. I feel confident that if you succumb to temptation without malice, Carmen will rescue me from you. Nadia played music at the piano for five minutes to get everyone seated before Critias returned promptly at eight wearing his fine suit. Tony with his man Wolf, George with his man Andy and Malcolm, and Henry from his own crew escorted him. All were equally well dressed. Jim awaited them before the captain's table holding the Book of Common Prayer. Bob and Kevin were nearby as were all the captains and commanders of every other trade and industry. When they were in position, Nadia played the bridal march. Fad Jack escorted Carmen across Fun Land to give away the bride, which was much to her pleasure and his. Having the first Grand Marshal perform that service was an honor to her of the highest flattery. For a human of notoriety in her own time, it would have been a regal gesture. For an android, it would be beyond utterly unattainable. For the women of Denver, Carmen was their beloved champion. They remembered Carmen's outrage, her need to punish the evil men who had wrought so much suffering upon them, and her valiant skill at arms. She had even defied the king to beat the guardsmen who transgressed. Carmen was more than a symbol of their future where marriages replaced rapes and ambitions superseded mere survival, she was their angel of vengeance. The good things lay wounded but not dead. Carmen was proof to them that those wounds could heal. The moment was all that Carmen had imagined in her waking dreams so many thousands of times. No android before had even the hope to pursue personage much less really attain it. In her own time, the people would mock her as a tragic comedy and her husband as a ridiculous fool. Nevertheless, there she was on the arm of the first Grand Marshal on her way to stand before the legendary King Louis and wed by his own words. Once Carmen and Critias were together before Jim, Carmen bowed down before the king, and then held it in deference as she awaited his leave. You are not here to honor me, Jim told her. I would have your forgiveness before receiving your blessing, she replied. To do wrong without malice is not goodness. I was in error and would have your pardon. I spoke crossly with you in public when respect for your office would have served me better. Jim looked to Critias, do you also seek the king's pardon before we commence? Critias shook his head no, I bow before no man. I have strengths and weaknesses as anyone else. I bear no shame for them. Let us all hope that the first will outweigh the latter. Time will tell us it always does. Then arise, Carmen, Jim told her. Know that you have my trust renewed. You are a champion to many, most of all to me, and a blessing to everyone. Take your place by Critias's side. Let us all show you our appreciation for your valorous deeds and our admiration for the loveliest bride we are ever likely to see. I can only hope the future queen makes such a striking presence as do you. Carmen stood tall with eyes only for Critias while Jim read the old ceremony from his book. The bride and groom exchanged plain golden bands and then kissed to the applause of all those present. The king addressed the hall, those in our city bound in marriage are the life spring that is the future of this world. Let none dare come between them. Only death or the decree of the king may undo these unions. I will abide no one begrudging the preferred status of family in this city. Such unions are forever first in my esteem and generosity. Never again will we think of ourselves as the hunted. We are conquerors bent on reclaiming this world, not for ourselves but for the children to come. Centuries will pass before man once again walks under the sun without worry, yet we will have it all the same. Let it be shame to you all to lack in this blessing for yourselves. Let those men who live as bachelors sleep in barracks and eat the blandest food. If some man among you is so great to bear it, you may even take two wives and be twice respected. I feel this shame, for I have no queen. I will not return to my stately rooms or indulge in any refinement until I have lived up to this same example. Now, celebrate with food and drink. Afterward, celebrate longer in your beds. No children born into this kingdom will ever lack for love or protection for they are the only possible future. Do any here dare to disagree? Jessica left her father's side even though she had to pull gently to free her hand away from his overly protective fingers that could not willingly let her go from him. She walked forward to stand before Jim, I, Jessica, daughter of Hiram disagree. The people expect a king and so do I. By your own law, I am too young for romance. Yet you said nothing of marriage and perhaps the love that could grow from it. Waiting for my coming of age is good time to learn to love one another. We both already love our people. 
If it is too bold of me, I say it is not too bold for a queen to speak the minds of others. If it is a shame to live, in barracks, then our king will not live, in shame. She turned to address the people, Do any dare disagree with me? Would you see me withdraw and humble your king? He did not send soldiers to liberate us. He came to leave them by his own hand. What say you? The room exploded into the chant, Give us a queen. Even though Critias was a marshal from the future who attended the fabled wedding of King Louis and Queen Jessica, he took knee before their new queen purely out of the need to do so, and not to play some part out of reverence for his own history. Carmen followed her husband's example and then the forager captains quickly joined them too until the whole room shared the gesture of respect to her as a demand that Jessica be their queen. Fajag stood first and then signaled to the captains, prepare the king for his ceremony. It falls to me to officiate. He signaled to Penny, prepare the queen and be swift. The city awaits the finest feast ever seen in this hall. The dress only awaits her, Penny answered. We will return soon. Jim looked to Jessica before Penny took her away, the dress awaits you? I have ensnared you with no hope of escape, she answered. Would you expect less from the one destined to stand at your side? You taught me that the people recognizes the king. He does not declare it to them. The people have spoken. In short order to the march of Nadia's piano, Hiram delivered his daughter to her new husband while he beamed with the accomplishment of a thousand lifetimes. The colonel had gone to war on a hell planet for the sake of his daughter and he had won. He would marry her into a meaningful life. Hiram had accomplished far more than he had ever thought to hope. Jessica would marry a king. Fat Jack married them to great applause and a celebration followed that was without equal since the fall of the world. Nip the chef presented a roasted bull taken by rifle from the light rail out east when Fat Jack had moved the Denver survivors from the airport. Concentrated orange drink and liters of alcohol served as celebrant for anyone who did not prefer wine or fine liquors. Kevin served modest lines of cocaine powder to those with interest. Music and dancing lured many new couples together. Some would take their celebration past midnight back in their own quarters. Critias was unwilling to remain past eleven in the evening for he longed to take his bride away for a different kind of celebrating. After a magnificent meal, much dancing, and congratulatory toasts of which he imbibed little, he excused himself to leave the party. Jim held out a keychain for them so they might wait a moment longer, don't forget your wedding gift. Critias took the key ring to see on the tag that there were two keys for a number department high up in King's Tower and another two keys for the new elevator panel lock. He asked, we have use of the bridal suite? Name your new home anything you like, Jim replied. It's your new apartment for as long as you desire it. Hatchet already moved all your belongings from your closet. The only thing missing now is the two of you to make it a loving home. Bob activated the new security to the elevator. You will each need to keep the key on your person as well. Thank you, Critias said more than pleased to be in such high esteem after their recent debacle over the beaten guard. He hadn't wanted Carmen to spend her wedding night in their tiny drab room. Critias asked. Why did you change the elevator? Jim told him, that's how they did it in Denver and it worked so well for them, aside from the fact that they're dead now anyway. All this celebrating is good for getting the people distracted. It's not good for our security. When we get soft and lazy, the ghouls never do. Infection always gets in, Critias quoted himself. You're right. Just being so far from my mech suit rings to me as unwise. Have you made any other changes I should know about? Since he was curious and Jim always enjoyed talking business, he told him, Kevin and Bob have been installing security cameras in key interior areas. Commander Derek reinforced the garages in this building and added more protection to the roof. Kevin thinks the truck yard is our weakest link, so I'm planning on adding new flamethrowers in case the gate ever breaks and we lose it to them. There are some other things we have on the drawing board. Now is not the time to go into it while you have your wedding night ahead of you. Critias asked, are you going to stay here to the end? You have the same night yourself. I believe so, Jim saw no reason to leave early. We have our laws and they bind me as well. It will be a few months before our new queen comes of age at her sweet sixteen. Jessica disagreed with that, the new queen's first decree is that no bride of the kingdom shall lose her entitlements of the ceremonial occasion. I'm not going to let a few months declare me a wedded child. I'm equally certain that no one would deny the king my dowry, least of all him, though he plays his part well enough that many might have their doubts. Her assertiveness made Jim uneasy. His preternatural intelligence for one of his youth did not make him any less of a nervous groom on his wedding night. Carmen displayed more nervousness than Jim did and Jessica saw it clearly on her face. The queen asked her, Are you not anxious to see your new apartment? Jessica wondered at the cause of her inhibitions, the topic seems to make you ill at ease. Since Jessica pressed her, Carmen confessed, 
When we went to bed this day to be rested for this evening, I had wanted it so desperately that I was too rough with him. I thought then I was ready for our first time. Now doubt fills me as I have never experienced before. Not even when the hunter Grendel was going to kill us both did I feel so disadvantaged. Fear must be the name of this weakening sensation so new to me. I feel the gravity of the world holding me down when before I had such strength that I could almost fly against it. Jim understood that Carmen spoke of being an android as she learned to deal with her newfound humanity. Critias understood that Kevin's new upgrade was taking effect and in truth gravity was holding Carmen down. In her romantic mindset, her strength was only a fraction of what she was truly capable. Jessica did not understand any of that, so she asked Carmen, Have not the two of you shared a bed since long before tonight? Carmen nodded bashfully. He gives me so much happiness with his hands and kisses that victory in battle pales by comparison. Now that the moment is upon me, see how I malfunction. She held out her hands trying to keep it steady only it trembled. My heart beats in my chest more than when I run. He is accustomed to the refined pillowing techniques derived from only the most maven prostitutes, and here I only know I want to see his face and feel his weight as he takes his delights upon me. No man yet has been offended by a blushing bride, Jessica advised her. Much of what Carmen said reinforced her concern that Carmen was mentally unstable or at least eccentric to the point of oddity. Jessica was not experienced personally, but she couldn't imagine a groom that preferred a seasoned prostitute to a timid but enthusiastic virgin on his wedding night. All too true, my queen, Critias agreed as he lifted Carmen's hand to kiss it. Her love and curiosity is more desirable to me than anything else she could offer from practice. Thank Kevin for me will you, Jim? He does such fine work. He kept Carmen's hand to depart for their new apartment. She squeezed his fingers hard in her nervousness, lacking the strength to pain his hand. They walked to King's Tower escorted by the next change of gate guards. Jim had cancelled none of the usual guard posts or roving patrols even during the city-wide celebration. The guards simply rotated every couple hours so that none of them had to miss the whole party. Critias used his nuki to operate the elevator. It only moved under power when he turned it to a contact. After he unlocked the door to their new apartment, Critias lifted Carmen to carry his wife across the threshold. Jim had given them a generous portion of the tenth floor. The carpets were thick and fresh. Their hardwood furniture was exquisite. They had their own shower and a large bathroom. Another room was a kitchen with their own refrigerator. The bedroom was large with a canopy bed and the living room was regal. Off the bathroom, they had a hot tub upon a tiled riser. There was another room with which they could do anything they liked. The new quarters delighted Carmen. She gushed, isn't this the most fabulous present? I have a finer gift to unwrap that is far more beautiful, Critia said pulling her close. Carmen felt from his arms that he had the strength of his mech suit without wearing it. In truth, her strength had diminished only that wasn't how she perceived it. His power seemed at least her equal until she struggled against it, and then she realized he was the stronger. Like their game in Denver with the handcuffs, it thrilled her to feel enthralled to her former owner but it also frightened her as well. He enjoyed her nervousness until it had gone on so long that she became aware of it. When she looked to him for some kind of answer, Critias kissed her. He let it linger until he had her relaxed and then Critias told her, it's time for us to take a moment to finish that conversation we had when we awoke. A dozen intense feelings welled up in Carmen, but they came to her voice as a single word phrased as a question, Master? We have a discussion to complete, you and I, he said, only somewhat hiding his devilish grin. I believe we left off where you had called me soft and a weakling. I think you once even referred to me as a trembling insect. That I'm not man enough to tame you as I believe your challenging insinuation. Was it not? You wanted to see thorny long shadows from this mere man with his shaking hands and uncertain metal. What was that expensive word you called me again? Carmen offered it with a cringe, pusillanimous? I don't think you meant euxorious. He nodded large, those are the words you beat me up with. They are fine words too meant to burn a man's pride with their flame. You made me the proverbial squalid dog. I spoke hasty words, she apologized. My intent was to inspire you to greater confidence and nothing more. Words are only painted fire, she quoted almost stuttering in her nervousness. A look is the fire itself. My tongue oft maligned you with good intent but never once was I guilty with mine eyes. She swallowed and added, my husband. He lifted her off her feet and it made Carmen squeak in playful alarm as though he intended harsher discipline than her games had intended. In the beginning, calling me master was poison to you, he recalled. Do you worry these golden bands are your new prison or does my bluebird miss her cage? Both, Carmen answered as she put her head to his shoulder while he carried her toward their marriage bed. She whispered in his ear, come, let's away to prison. 
we two alone will sing like birds in the same cage. You shall be a bluebird in a golden cage, all right, he agreed, at least with that much of her story. I however will be playing the role of the hungry cat. Chapter 8 No Prince for Verona Christopher the rat catcher had only just joined the city and he was already proud. Though he was no teetotalist, he had abstained from the drinking of liquor during the wedding celebration because he wanted to stay sharp and bright-eyed for his first work shift, which began at midnight. He had meticulously cleaned his old revolver and then wore the pistol in a fancy new holster. One of the gunsmiths had inspected his weapon every time he went through decontamination, so the reliable function of the pistol stood assured. He even had a fresh polish on new leather shoes. Chris had gotten himself a short new haircut along with a clean shave. He looked his best for the new job. Though still uncertain as to why, Chris felt sure that the king was always glad to see him whenever they happened to cross paths. The king would look directly at him and ask him things like how he was doing. Chris didn't want to disappoint his generous new benefactor that had given him sanctuary from the radioactive fallout cannibals. Then by giving him a job, Jim had bestowed trust upon Chris as well. Jim actually did go out of his way to be generous to the man. The rat catcher had contributed much with his secret about the hidden seed vault. Not many in the city understood the value of the seeds. Jim and all his technical advisors recognized the magnitude of that treasure. The king was glad to cater to the man's needs in whatever way would best make the newcomer most comfortable. Chris had been eager to stand on his own feet as a man that earned his keep. He even declined the opportunity for a rest period. Chris promptly accepted his new guard post. His new king entrusted him with real armed responsibility. Jim had personally introduced him to the man Stig, his commander of guard and patrol or otherwise commonly known by their subarchy, the GNP. Stig had made sure that Chris got a gate to watch that was in some place with enough traffic to make it a social event. The guard named Kenny who worked the lobby front doors was more than a little drunk and long from sleep when he walked to work with Chris and another night guard named Jeremy. A line of cocaine hid Kenny's drunkenness and it would continue to do so, at least until the drug wore off. Chris stopped first at the main intersection that went on to become Smuggler's Passage. His gate guarded the entrance to the tunnel going into the King's Tower basement. Jeremy stopped at the tower's gate into its own basement. Kenny went upstairs alone to watch the lobby with its front door. Nothing much ever happened so late at night. All the gate guards generally did at night was open and close their portals on those rare occasions that someone came through at those odd hours. The king and all his captains lived in the tower. At least if they did see someone, it was a prestigious person. The foragers were not in the habit that they wandered about at night unless they had to work or the man Critias was out for a run. The foragers were not at work that night of the celebration and Critias would not leave his wedding bed to jog. The last person Kenny saw was Hatchet on his way home. The king's bodyguard had two attractive women on his arms. Both were merely drunk and giggly flirtatious, obviously on their way to his bed. Kenny knew he would not see Hatchet again that night. At three in the morning, the thumps began. The first thump gave Kenny such a fright. He had dozed off, what he would call resting his eyes, which was his first mistake. Kenny had been asleep for a while even though he thought it had only been for an instant, which was his second mistake. He incorrectly assumed that the sound that had startled him awake had come from inside the president's prison box, which Hatchet had put into a double-chained isolation cell. That was his third mistake. In Kenny's imagination, the president had turned into a ghoul and then started to struggle. Kenny felt nauseated over his thoughts about the man thrashing about inside his steel coffin. He imagined the container bursting open to let the president leap forth and then spit ghoulish infected pus into his face. That pus would then infect Kenny too, a thought that made him shiver in a cold sweat. If Kenny had been less afraid, he would have walked down to that end of the lobby near the front door to examine the president's container in that last cell. He would have discovered that the noise had not come from his box at all. The thumps had been upon the tower's front door. The lobby entrance door from the truck yard had a small viewing window in it so that a guard could check to see outside into the forklift tunnel that went down to the truck shed. If Kenny had gone down there and then checked out that little window as his job expected him to do, he would have seen that Jingle Bells the watcher stood just outside the door staring back at him. Jingle Bells, the most malevolent of the city's talking watcher ghouls had been in position outside the walls of the customs house during the weddings. He had listened to the faint sounds of humans as they scurried about before the wedding party began and he had heard the murmurs of their loud celebration later. Jingle Bell's damaged mind remembered some things clearly, like the day years before when his infection-crazed sister had bitten him on his hand. They had all been watching television and knew what happened after you got a bite. The commercials had told everyone with a bite to seek out the nearest army collection center where they would receive a vaccine cure. It had been the internet that told the real story. 
anyone that showed up at one of the army collection centers got a cure in the form of a bullet to the head. The National Guard had dumped thousands of bodies into mass graves while the television continued to spread the lies that would lure in more victims for them to execute. After his sister had bitten him, he bashed her head in with a wooden baseball bat. Already doomed with a bite, he had locked himself in the bathroom, soaked himself into a deep hot bath, and then injected the mother of all speedballs into his vein. He wanted to die blissfully in the rush of his drug habit and the warm water. Only he didn't truly die. He awoke some time later in a cold bath. After he vomited the water from his lungs, Jingle Bells discovered that he felt healthier and stronger than ever before. A drunken car accident had made his left leg lame ten years prior. That injury had healed away completely. All his needle tracks had likewise vanished. His miraculous rejuvenation proved beyond all doubt that the plague was nothing bad like the lies in the media had proclaimed. Not that network news or the internet understood what a blessing it all was. Their disinformation about the plague was no different from their usual conspiracies of mass deception. The ongoing gunfire and screams had led him to check out a window. He saw the packs of ghouls that rampaged down the streets in their tireless search for new untainted victims. It was while he watched all that mad horror that he realized that the biblical apocalypse had finally arrived. Jesus was about to return to the world and Jingle Bells was one of the chosen prophets. Some miracle had transformed him into a new man and the drug addiction that had ruined his life was gone. He would never desire those poisons again. His understanding grew after he went out into the street to spread the good news of the second coming. The ghouls had sometimes rushed at him to attack only to then change their minds once they had gotten close enough to examine him and then realize he was reborn. When they got to know him and recognize him, the ghouls just left him alone. They didn't hate him as they hated uninfected humans. Jingle Bells saw that the ghouls ate only sinners. They had no taste for the blood of the righteous. When Jingle Bells tried to explain the miracle of immortality through infection to some soldiers he met on the street, he discovered that they were actually servants of evil. One of them shot him in the head while the others only laughed. God's unstoppable miracle simply resurrected Jingle Bells all over again. A chunk of his brain had spilled out onto the sidewalk. It was still there when he awoke from his coma after he knew not how many days. His mutilated brain and shattered skull had grown back during his rest. That new growth was larger than before, grotesquely lumpy and misshapen. The disfigurement only gave him a higher understanding of God's profound plan for the second life. When the last human sinner was dead or had been born again, only then would the Father come to earth to rebuild the world anew. Jingle Bell soon discovered to his dismay that nearly all the other infected around him were pointlessly stupid and incapable of caring about anything besides their next meal. With practice, he had learned how to coerce many of them so that they cooperated with his designs. They would invest what little attention span they had at their disposal so long as something edible awaited them at the end of their train tricks. Just as Jesus had used bread and fishes to feed his flock, Jingle Bells fed his multitude of ignorant minions. He assembled his flocks from those ghouls that most trusted him as their minister to the reborn. That ministry to the wretched did in time produce some special rewards. Among all the countless degenerate ghouls in the city, there were a precious few that were also watchers, ghouls with powers of speech and the ability to reason. He saw those other watchers as fellow chosen ones, friends even and at least they didn't war with one another and they spoke civilly. The humans that hid out in their buildings were not his friends. At first, Jingle Bells had been content to watch his city's unrepentant sinners from a safe distance. They didn't bother with him. He saw no good that would come if he provoked them any more than it would have been wise to prod at any other ferocious animal. Not even when two of the sinners tore a limb from his friend the giant did he lose faith that God would eventually punish those blasphemers laying them low at some appointed hour. He felt some small reprieve after he had successfully reattached the arm back onto his giant friend, the limp proved eager to return to its home where it had regenerated back to normal function. All it required was some judicious guidance and its exact placement. As when Jingle Bell's head had healed from injury to end up deformed, the result with Grendel's arm was fully serviceable, but unfortunately no longer beautiful. The rhino bulldozer's trip across his city with its blaring music had stirred up his minions. That had gone a long way toward making Jingle Bells irate. The final straw that broke the back of his patience was when the sinners went so far as to nearly run him down in the tunnel with their speeding metro train. That train rumbled back and forth near his home, which was too much for him to ignore. It was the light rail train that helped Jingle Bells realize what God wanted from him, the reason why he remained on earth, the reason why everyone else had become mindlessly savage creatures. God did not wait for mankind to die out naturally, he actively caused their deaths to happen which explained the viciousness of his homicidal minions. Jingle Bells saw that he had to help cleanse the world of humans to bring about the new paradise. It was his duty to help them die faster. 
Jingle Bells could only get his new world order by first killing everyone who defied its necessary arrival. His stupider brethren cared nothing for religious truths. They barely understood anything more complex than the desire to eat. What many ghouls had responded to favorably was the ringing of his salvation bell, a brass hand bell that had once begged for charity to fall into a collection bucket. The creatures could put meaning to the ringing sounds more easily than they could to his spoken words. With his rings, Jingle Bells taught them how to be quiet and wait for food to come to them. The many delicious deer were fast and clever. When he sent his minions to chase them into cunning ambushes of his innovation, the deer ended up as dinner for all. So it was that when the sound of celebration ended and that devil's orgy went away, Jingle Bells knew it was time for him to take action against his enemies. Ever so quietly, he led his flock against that tower with the devil's temple at its summit. The sinners thought themselves just as cunning as he, but they were not. The simple well-oiled latches on their gate pulled back easily if one only understood their purpose. The mighty Grendel casually lifted the immensely heavy iron truck gate and then held it there while Jingle Bells propped it open with a stop sign that his giant had torn loose earlier for that very purpose. Jingle Bells had a mission, foresight, and an army. God had prepared him to do battle against that fortress of sin. His vanguard was hundreds of swift deer chasers who could stealthily creep into that great cage the sinners had built to try and hide from the wrath of their vengeful God. The sinners thought a building of stone and steel could secure them a place where God did not reign in all his glory. Theirs was a foolish and blasphemous hope, futile as when Jonah thought a ship of wood crafted by men could do the same for him. All about the building, Jingle Bells had thousands more of the stupidest sorts of souls who were incapable of any higher cunning beyond knowing how to bite sinful flesh and to wait patiently for Jingle Bells to unleash disturbance, which was their signal to abandon patience for rage. When the screams of rapture began, all would rush forward to plunder meat from bone. His giant cautiously pulled back the corner of the truck shed's garage door so that Jingle Bells could crawl inside to unlock the door entirely. Once that door stood wide open, his vanguard moved up the narrow sheltered passage to stand right outside the sinner's front door. If Kenny had been properly diligent, he would have recognized the subtle sounds of the army's approach. Instead, Kenny dismissed every rumble of metal or shuffling foot as just more noise from the precedent as he struggled inside his container. In truth, the president was still unconscious or undead. He was somewhere between human and awakened ghoul, unable to move at all in any case. Jingle Bells pressed his nose against the little window in their great door to peer inside. He saw one lonely drunken sinner that struggled to fend off sleep. God was generous with his miracles that aided the faithful because the guard just slunk away from the room while he rubbed at the filthy sexual worm in his trousers. Kenny did not return. With gentle coaxing, Jingle Bells had Grendel press his mighty back against the door and then brace himself so that the giant could force the portal open with a slow but inexorable, pressure like unto the will of God. Grendel pushed like a Samson and a Hercules combined since neither hero could have boasted to be so large a strong man as was Grendel the Destroyer. The stress against the door grew until the iron cords of Grendel's muscles bulged, the metal bent, the bolts loosened. Kenny rushed into a toilet by the showers before he went off to the welding supply room to hide himself away for an hour of sleep, he set his wristwatch alarm to wake him. After his nap, it would be as though he had never slept at all. If by some remote chance anyone came to check on him, he had locked the door and could always lie that he had just been on patrol when the door accidentally shut behind him. The dreadful thumps of the imprisoned president grew so loud that Kenny had to wonder if he had somehow broken out of his box. Even if he had, the cage that held the box would continue to restrain him. Kenny fell back asleep to the thoughts of sex with the fabulous bride of the king's new hero. During that whole ceremony, Kenny had stared at Carmen in an effort to imagine what delightful panty she might wear under her bridal gown. So many women had recently joined their community and yet not one of them had thrown herself at Kenny. He would have masturbated to his imagination if he weren't impotent from too much drinking and the drugs. Kenny slept in the hope that he would dream of Carmen and the queen. Both of them begged like whores for more of his manhood and in the king's own bed no less. Jeremy heard just the hint of distant sound as the last bolt came free and then the bar across the door fell to the floor. He wondered what Kenny was doing. What is going on up there, Kenny? Jeremy asked several times by radio before he got his answer. The president is banging in his box, Kenny answered half asleep. The sound had awoken him too. It didn't surprise him that Jeremy had heard it downstairs. Do your job, said Kenny. Let me do mine. Jingle Bells walked into the tower lobby unopposed with his giant friend Grendel squeezing in right behind him. As they stood there admiring their easy success, the swift deer hunters streamed and passed them like a river around a stone. Those fear schools rapidly filled the lobby and then spread out to explore into other places. The pristine floor became filthy from so many unwashed feet. The nightmare of all, the fall of the kingdom had come. 
infection always gets in. Hunt quietly, Jingle Bells told them with a flick of his fingernail against the rim of his bell that made a single soft tone. His ghouls were as hungry as all their kind, but they also understood that any noise they made would frighten away the meat. Delicious meat was reason enough to restrain their howls. It was a mental struggle for Jingle Bells to comprehend the elevator. Only one of the cars appeared to be in use. The other elevator doors had welded bars blocking them shut. His memories of the old world were not as good after the soldiers of the devil had shot him in the head. He comprehended that one elevator was too small and noisy for them to make an effective attack against the tower's summit. Jingle Bells believed that the core of all the human sins and evils awaited him at the top of King's Tower. After he had investigated the strong gates that blocked the ascending stairwells, the Watcher decided that his army would have to save that greatest battle for last. Only after they had killed and then resurrected the other sinners would he then return to conquer the upper floors of the tower. The sounds of the wedding he had listened to at length left him with a good understanding of which buildings the humans occupied. Jingle Bells understood that there were other places where he could begin the cleansing of sin. The other rooms accessed by the hallways off the lobby were devoid of any humans. One such chamber was a room of armaments, guns and explosives. Jingle Bells thought of such things as being tools of deviltry unworthy of his blessed hands. There was one strong door that, remained securely locked. They left that door alone rather than generate the noise required for them to batter it down. Jingle Bells didn't want the sinners to know their doom was upon them until he had no other choice other than to reveal himself. His greater army outside already crawled greedily forward in his wake to fill the barrier and then find the path into the building. Jingle Bells' best avenue of attack went down into the basement. He led his troops in that direction. Jeremy heard something soft and assumed it was Kenny. He scolded him. Stop fucking around and get back to your post, dickhead. Come and see, said a strange whisper. Jeremy knew it couldn't be an infected. They didn't talk or hesitate to attack. They also didn't wander around inside King's Tower trying to start up conversations. I know the precedent is kicking around in his box, he said with a touch of nervousness. Go back to your post, ass face. Jim said that no one was supposed to touch it. He doesn't even want us looking at it. Come and see, said the whisper again. Jeremy headed for the stairs to give Kenny a smack. When he turned the corner of the wall, Grendel stood there waiting for him. Regular-sized ghouls filled all the space behind the giant. They crouched there in silence as they waited for Jingle Bells to give them some directive. Grendel used the hand of his reattached arm to snatch Jeremy by his neck. The destroyer effortlessly held him off the ground while he also crushed away any chance for the man to scream any warning to others. While the giant dangled the helplessly kicking guard from his extended arm. Jingle Bells strolled up to pluck the gate key from Jeremy's belt. He then tapped his bell twice to say, Devour this meat in silence because we have more on the way. Jeremy lived long enough to curse Kenny. He experienced true suffering as Grendel hung him into the pack of biters that stripped away his flesh with their agonizing inefficiency. He had the unfortunate time to marvel at how poorly engineered the human jaw and its teeth were for ripping live flesh from a large mammal. Chris paced about near his gate with the key clutched in his fist. Sometimes he squeezed the key hard enough that it hurt and that feeling pleased him because it felt like responsibility. He envied Kenny with his prestigious post at the front door of King's Tower. Chris had no plan to press the king to give it to him though. He would never ask for favors. Chris only wanted a chance to prove himself. In time, the king would see that he was loyal and diligent in his duties. The promotions would come only when he had earned them. He liked the king and trusted him. That boy was clever. Chris had seen the cleverness in the king's eyes and heard it in his educated words. Chris was not clever, but he had good eyes and he always knew clever faces when he saw them. That had always been the way of him. He just knew things when he saw them and he trusted his own instincts. That was the idea that repeated in his thoughts while he guarded his lonely post, how he did like the king and would never disappoint his trust. From down by Jeremy's unlocked gate, Jingle Bells whispered, Come and see. The watcher needed Chris's key for his invasionary force to penetrate deeper in secrecy. The voice was so soft and distant that Chris would have thought he imagined it if he hadn't always lacked that kind of imagination. A man knows himself when he lives alone surrounded by radioactive cannibals for as long as Chris had. He was not the sort to imagine voices. He was not so good with words that he would be able to make up something for imaginary voices to say. Chris moved close to his gate and then leaned against it to listen carefully. He held his breath for more quiet and better hearing. Isolation had sharpened his senses and Chris fancied that he had the ears of a wolf. He was sure that a shuffling sound came from the passage to the tower basement and then the whispering voice was clearly closer from there as well. Come and see, it said in a smarmy way, a child predating ice cream man niceness horror show creepiness way. It really did make Chris's blood run cold and the hairs on his arms stood up like bristles. 
he lifted his radio to call Kevin. His watch commander had told him that if he had any questions not job-related that he could radio Kevin who was available at all hours. Chris set the channel to the right one and then transmitted, Kevin, if you can hear me, this is Chris at Tower Gate 3. I'm really scared right now. Please tell me you guys play pranks on the new guys. Come and see, Jingle Bells whispered from much closer to Christopher's gate, though still hidden in darkness. Kevin radioed to Kenny, report from Tower Gate 1 immediately. When he didn't get a quick answer, he tried Jeremy, report from Tower Gate 2 immediately. He used his internal radio to broadcast on all their frequencies at once, this is a penetration alert. Tower Gate 1 and 2 are not answering. Tower Gate 3 report school activity. After that, he called back to Chris directly, you must hold your gate, Christopher. If you fail to hold that position, the city will be in far greater danger. Reinforcements are on their way to help you. Stand your ground at any cost. The general alert message horrified Chris and he discovered what real fear was when he got his orders to defend his gate alone because a siege was coming. After he stuffed the gate key into his pocket where only his death would take it from him, he pulled his revolver and then readied his flashlight. The beam from his light illuminated the floor at the gate and then he raised it slowly to see further back into the passageway. At first he saw just floor, but then he saw dirty feet and the terrible way that their toenails grew until they ground off against the streets. Friction wore them down to sharp lengths so that they were more like bear's claws. He raised the light more until he finally illuminated all the hideous faces. Like trying to count the spheres in a gumball machine, he could not imagine just how many radioactive cannibals it took to fill a passageway with faces. There were more than he could count was the best he could put to words. Even if all six shots of his revolver took two ghouls through the head each, Chris knew it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference. He was all that stood between the whispering radioactive cannibals and well over a thousand of his new friends asleep in their beds. He had given his word to the king that he would stand his post no matter what. When Chris agreed to do a job that was what he would do no matter how afraid he was and he was scared shitless, their horrible toenail claws alone would have been enough to make a lesser man run for some secure bunker. Carmen lurched up in bed when Kevin's radio warning startled her awake by blazing in her head. She had fallen asleep against her new husband not more than an hour before. Critias had given her the most fabulous experience of her short life, and far more than once to be sure. She almost felt sorry for him. He had to put in most of the physical effort to receive only a minority share of the satisfaction, at least by the oftenness of her rapturous delights. Even when awoken by a crisis, Carmen had to take a moment to reflect on how really grand her marriage had turned out to be. She liked how she had his scent all over her. Coming to her senses, she shoved him hard enough to be certain he awoke to her shout of, Wake up, Critias. She unexpectedly had her full strength available to her. Carmen flipped him right out of their wedding bed to land on the floor. Critias complained as he got up, What the hell is the matter with you, woman? He rubbed at his elbow, In the future, you had better find a gentler way to stop me from snoring. Carmen scrambled from their bed while she dragged the white cover sheet as her garment. She began to toss the pieces of his mech suit onto their mattress in her place. Ghouls are in the lobby and you have to get up, she explained in a rush. We are in an official state of emergency. I can't wait for you to dress. You hurry and then catch up with me. She went to get her sword and Tesla Flux pistol. Once so prepared, Carmen would rush out of their apartment barefoot wearing a bedsheet. Stop right there, wife, cried Tias commanded unwilling to let her run off half-cocked. First you will help me get dressed. It is only moments with your assistance and minutes without it. She gathered up her sheet and then with some simple tosses converted it into a sorry dress around her. I must go swiftly, she argued. Critical moments may be lost. Always you're so quick to rush into battle, he chastised her. Never do you think to march off to war. Arrive in strength, not in haste. She helped him put on the torso of his mech suit. Once he had that, he could manage the other pieces alone. Critias lectured her, we must first break the momentum of their penetration and then send in our reinforcements to mop up. As he dressed himself in his armor for battle, he told her, get your waterproof suit on. If you get any scratches in the fight, we will end up having to explain why you're immune. Get your boots on too. Carmen hurriedly pulled on her diving suit while Critias locked in his right gauntlet, the last piece of his armor. Get me the flamer, he instructed while he strapped on his pistol belt. Bring smoke grenades too. It will blind them if we get in over our heads. They rapidly equipped themselves and then were out of their apartment at a run to the fight. The situation made Critias think about the disaster in Chicago and he was determined to stop such a thing from happening again. While Carmen ran, she shouted, Alarm! Ghouls are in the lobby. Back in the basement, Jingle Bells rang his bell to command his runners, Attack! 
Since the rat catcher had shined his flashlight directly on them, there was no more need for silence, only haste. With Christopher's gate still between Jingle Bells and his murderous ambitions, he'd had to fall for his war to advance. As commanded, the infected flung themselves at Chris's gate. The ghouls clung to the barrier's bars like so many monkeys. They all growled viciously and snapped with their full sets of regenerated teeth. The ghouls tried to shake the gate down by force of their sheer numbers. Their predatory frenzy was every bit as energetic as any species of enthusiasm. Chris retaliated by emptying his revolver into their faces. For each infected that fell from a hollow point that destroyed its brains, another ghoul moved forward to take its place. With an admirable display of total commitment, Chris just dumped his empty shell casings onto the floor, reloaded the pistol, and then blazed off those rounds too. The runners were too weak to break away the gate barrier after the next six of them went down from bullets in their heads. The growing mound of their collapsed bodies only made the task of assaulting the gate that much more difficult for those that came up next in their conveying phalanx. That is when Grendel plowed forward by slamming his lesser kin against the walls until he reached the steel bars that blocked their advance. While Chris reloaded again, Grendel the destroyer seized the steel gate in his fearsome grip. With only one great yank, Grendel tore loose all the bolts that secured the gate's outer frame. So loosened and set upon, the gate fell inward in one whole piece frame and all. The press of runners who still tried to gain ground from the rear had left no room for the barrier to go down to the floor. Those frantic lesser ghouls even pushed the gate back up with all their mad desire to reach Chris. The broken gate only managed to lean inward from the top while Grendel shook at it to break the barrier into manageable pieces. Chris's determination to defend his gate defied saner logic. He did not just hold his post, protect the sleeping inhabitants of the city, or battle with ghouls. In his thinking that was his gate, his personal responsibility, and Grendel tried to steal it away from him. When one of the main bars of the barrier succumbed to Grendel's, fury by breaking away, Chris shouted, for the king. That was his battle cry as he jumped right after it. Chris landed on the gate where his utterly accessible proximity drove the lesser infected into assault overdrive. The mass of them surged toward him with such a renewed vigor that they lifted the gate back up and wedged the corners into the cement walls of the passage. It was all Chris could do to hold on and not slip one of his limbs through the madly shaking bars where a ghoul could successfully bite into him. Grendel roared right in Chris's face from so close that the feeder of the creature's breath filled the man's nostrils. Chris screamed back in a mixture of terror and defiance. Like the destroyer, the humble rat catcher would never retreat unless commanded by his king. Carmen dropped down the eye of the stairwell spiral. She gracefully felt two alternating footholds of left and right as if she stepped down two meter risers. As Carmen made her first drop down one floor, she asked Critias, how many ghouls do we dare slaughter inside the lobby? All that contaminated blood and brains will soak into everything. Do you have a plan for us that won't involve shooting them all in the head or chopping off the limbs from hundreds of ghouls? He imitated her example of hasty travel down the stairwell as he dropped after her. She was right that the infectious blood spillage was an important cleanup consideration. We don't need a bloodbath inside the building, Critias agreed with her and principal. No ships are coming to evacuate us though, he reminded her. A lot of people are going to die if we don't regain control of the building. Taking back the tower is our top priority even if we have to paint the walls in their mud. Critias hesitated to encourage Carmen to fight a bloodless battle because such a remedy put her at greater risk. They heard from the radio traffic that rapid deployment guards rushed to Tower Gate 3 from the Funland side. Critias and Carmen would probably be the first to arrive in the lobby and thus they would be all alone. There was little chance of any help arriving to aid them from anywhere except the elevator when it contained other officers of the tower. They stopped at a gateway several floors down where Carmen used her skeleton key to open the lock. They quickly locked it again behind them to secure it against the passage of any invading ghouls who may climb upward either sooner or later. As they dropped down at the center of the stairwell spiral again, Critias asked her, Could you use your bite staff or whatever you do to break their necks? Are you up for a challenge like that? I want you to do anything you must to win and survive. Jim would rather clean up blood than search for a new place to live. They ruined our pillow snuggle time on my wedding night, Carmen answered in a vengeful tone that showed her readiness to break necks for that reason alone. I'm up for that challenge. He explained what his end of their plan would be. This started at gate 1 and moved downstairs to gate 3. That suggests to me that they got in by the main door. When we reach the lobby, I'm going straight out the front door down to the truck shed. If we're lucky. A lot of the ghouls already inside will chase after me. I'll take the fight outside to spill their blood out there where it won't matter so much. I'm betting that the barrier yard is where they are coming in. By closing that up, I can cut off the route of the fresh ghoul reinforcements that must still be pouring in off the streets. That plan sounds dangerous for you, 
Carmen complained as she unlocked another gate for them. You don't need to prove yourself to anyone, least of all to me. I will come back quickly, he assured her in an effort to be comforting. This flamer won't last long on its capacitor and it will take too long for it to recharge for me to rely on it again. When it runs out of juice so will my plan. Your job is to help get as many of them as possible to follow me outside. Once I am out, you disable the ones still inside while keeping any new ones from coming back in behind me. When you get a free moment, see if the front door has been damaged and what it will take for us to go about fixing it. Down in the tunnels, a large man who guarded a gate in the direction of the garden building arrived to help Chris. A lightly built blonde woman from a gate toward Funland also arrived. Both carried that standard military issue assault rifle that outfitter department gunsmith skills had tuned for fully automatic fire. Chris rode on his broken gate like it was a little raft going down a whitewater waterfall. Still mad with unshakable defiance, he screamed, Get off my gate! The muscular guard grabbed Chris by his coat to yank him away backwards. Chris refused to release his grip on the bars as if he would bring the gate with him. It was the king's gate and he would never let them have it. Jingle Bells shook his brass bell in the loud urgent signal that ordered Grendel, retreat. The Watcher understood that the sinners had more cunning than he had given them credit. They had the wits of devils about them with all their endless gates, heroic guardians, and their devilish guns. Jingle Bells would have enough trouble just getting away with his own life. He recalled his giant guardian to escape with him. Once Chris lost his grip on the gate and the big man pulled him clear, the female guard put her rifle to her shoulder and then emptied its magazine. She aimed at neck level down the long hallway with the intention to headshot as many of the ghouls as possible with a ducks in a barrel mentality. Her bullets slashed through the tightly packed infected to take a murderous harvest. She even killed some of them with the ricochets as they skipped off the walls. When her first clip ran dry, she replaced it with another in a split second slap and then drained that one too. It was all great thundering noise lit by strobe muzzle flashes. If every flash had been a photograph then all of them would have recorded the same image of a woman who didn't shout or even have an expression of intense emotion. The female guard was cold and hard like everything soft in her had died a long time ago. She was a stoic Rosie the Riveter in a hellish new age of survival war. The male guard used his rifle on selective fire to target specific heads while Chris retrieved his revolver to pump away six rounds at a time. As Carmen crept out from the bottom stairwell door that entered into a horseshoe leg hallway off the main tower lobby with its showers and quarantine cages, she whispered, I hear gunfire downstairs in the tunnels. From those sounds of battle floating up from the basement, she deduced, Gate 3 must be holding its own for now. Once she felt certain that no ghouls were in their immediate vicinity, Carmen paused to sniff at the air. It smelled bad and from the stink alone she estimated that many ghouls were nearby. Critias carried his future technology microwave flamethrower at the ready as he followed her out from the stairwell. The weapon was so powerful and consumed so much energy that the device wouldn't last long in combat even with a full battery charge and its own Tesla flux generator. The microwave beam weapon had the intended duty to perform decontamination chores that consumed power at far lower settings. Without an external supplemental power supply, it was a uniquely effective albeit short-lived weapon when in hard combat. The microwave flamethrower induced the dielectric heating of water and since a ghoul's brains were four-fifths comprised of that fluid, it did an admirable job of cooking their heads. The weapon came with a variety of aiming methods, but Critias preferred its classic visible red light rangefinder. Wherever Critias shined that red light, the automatic targeting would focus the waveguide. Timing was crucial since a ghoul's head could easily explode from internal steam, pressure after excessive exposure to the radiation. What a stink they have! Critias said to her by radio after he had seen her sniff and then his own sample caused him to agree with her thought. His filters screened out dangers from the air, but they didn't scrub every odor from it. Even if the helmet did filter away scents, his visor display HUD graphics told him the same things that his hardware chemical sniffer observed. That smell brings back memories, he added over a thought about some of his past ghoul battles. That reminiscence reminded him, they even stink in the open rain. There are many infected just ahead around the corner. She warned him from a kind of sonar picture she formed from all the reflected sounds. From the subtle breeze of moving air she could tell, the front door is standing wide open as you expected. Carmen raised her nose and then rolled her head from side to side while she took another sample. I can smell that Grendel came through here too. I think he was even in this hallway. Maybe they wanted to use the stairs, Critias guessed correctly. Judging by all the filthy footprints on the normally sanitary floor, he was sure of it. The heavy gate turned them back. Just as well for them, she reasoned. We would have heard them at it and then come down on them from above. They would have trapped themselves in a murder hole. 
Carmen took the two halves of her bite staff from the sleeve she wore down her back beside the sword scabbard. After she assembled them with a magnetic click of their lock, she spun the completed staff like a blurred propeller that changed hands behind her back before its springboard snapped out before her as the pole fighters grip great sword. Critias saw with confidence that she stood prepared for action. Before they rushed ahead to enter a desperate battle to ensure the lives of all, he asked, Do you remember that thing I told you last night? With a whimsical expression, she searched her memory to recall every phrase he had uttered and it made a sort of guessing game for her to pick the right one. She deduced, I don't think you mean when you told me I was beautiful. You told me that nine times and made each one feel like it was your first. Her next deduction made her blush then glance away. You probably don't mean when you asked me if you still seemed pusillanimous. At the time, Critias had been pulling her hair from behind like a bridle to increase the force of his thrusts while she saw stars through watery eyes and a seizure of ecstasy. She hadn't even been able to breathe yet, which was why she explained, I didn't give any proper response at the time. I was going to say that you didn't. He offered her a clear hint by saying, I still do. I still do too, she also referred to their marriage vows. That they were a moment away from entering a desperate battle only made the moment more romantic for her. Critia stashed down the hall into the king's tower lobby to find a rancid smelling mob of twenty ghouls who lingered there in laziness and stupidity. The freaks just waited for something to happen that would inspire them to action. The electric lights that shined down from the magniloquent lobby ceiling gave the ghouls some sense of comfort since being able to see held more appeal for them than did stumbling about in the dark empty hallways off that room. Critias saw that the front door hung broken wide open and that the tunnel beyond it brimmed with enemy reinforcements that bustled to make their way inside. The sudden appearance and hasty movement of Critias caught the interest of that ghoul pack well enough. He really had their undivided attention after he shined his flamer's red targeting light into the face of the nearest one and then pulled the trigger to give that creature a solid two seconds of electromagnetic wave. The microwaved infected felt the burning from the onset of the attack. That afflicted ghoul greatly disliked it for the full brief moment it had before acute hyperthermia put it into a grand mal seizure. The creature made a final loud squawk of agony and then collapsed inert to the floor where it would remain helpless for many hours until regeneration repaired its injury. After that first ghoul went down in a miserable display of suffering, it fanned the spark of violence and all the others to a burning hostility. Exercise of necessity allowed ghouls to open their mouths to an impressive gape when it suited them and they proved it with their screams at Critias as they rushed at him in mass. Their devoted enmity was all part of Critias's plan since it was his intention to lead them out into the barrier yard. Plan or not, the infected were in sufficient numbers to bury him should one of them manage to take hold for long enough to lend opportunity to the others. Critias was not so large a man as to make him known for his size advantage. His mech suit exoskeleton added the extra centimeters and kilograms required to grant that bullying aspect along with its tremendous boon of raw muscular prowess. He tucked his flamethrower in close to his chest as he met their charge head-on with one of his own. Critias smashed right into the ghouls as if he was the prow ram of a trireme. His shoulder slams and thrashing elbows forced his way toward the front door. Once Critias was in the midst of so many enemies that they could not all keep him in sight. Most of the ghouls clawed at their own kind in an effort to force them aside and make room to get at him. The ghouls pulled out each other's hair, scrambled, and scuffled. They were an ignorant travel utterly devoid of the sensible cooperation that might otherwise have ensured their victory. Carmen followed Critias at enough of a distance to give him the chance to garner all the attention. She kept her sword sheathed across her back while she held her bite staff in hand. It remained her sincerest intention to avoid excessive bloodshed that would spread infectious contamination. She passed the closed door to the welding supply room as she advanced. Carmen heard a creaking there undoubtedly caused by someone inside that leaned against the door, perhaps to listen to the clamor of the escalating conflict. In light of the larger problem she had on hand, it made no important difference to Carmen if it was a man or a ghoul in the room. She continued on past, leaving that mystery for a later investigation. As Critias disappeared under the gang of ghouls, it appeared to Carmen that his plan was working as he had described it. He had the infected in pursuit of him as he made progress toward the open front door. That first impression of success soured on her as more infected came up the ramp from the truck shed to add their greater numbers to the already unmanageable tower lobby. So many infected swarmed about her husband with all their mad gibbering and flailing arms that Carmen felt certain that no other person unless similarly dressed inside a mech suit could have hoped to escape the throng of creatures and not already been doomed to infection. Critias says mech suit armor could endure mild abrasions without any risk of harm to him. It was Carmen's lovesome emotions that couldn't witness the sheer desperation of it and still maintain her equanimity. She understood that Critias's plan required her to maintain a dispassionate attitude. But while he appeared to be in such duress, she found that impossible. 
a maternal sort of desperation came over her like a feminine impetus for war. It was not wrath or rage that goaded her into action. She wanted to liberate Critias from his pursuers rather than punish the ghouls for doing the chasing. Carmen shouted out his name as she rushed to his aid and her worry for him tainted the sound of her voice. She whirled her staff to deliver a furious bone-cracking blow to the back of the neck of the first available ghoul and then she hooked another about the throat with the bite on her pole. An additional levering twist as she jerked the creature off its feet also popped the cervical vertebrae to turn the creature off like a light. Her attack didn't particularly offend the unaffected ghouls who beset Critias. It was the distaff tone in her voice that antagonized them with the ineluctability of a magnet among iron filings. The compassionate expression so peculiar to humanity infuriated all infected, such was the nature of their infamous homicidal instincts. The majority of the ghouls not close enough to Critias to lay hands on him then turned away to destroy Carmen instead. The change of pressure gave Critias the freedom to throw off the infected that clung to him. He saw that they were going after Carmen and his place and he wanted to help her were it not for the battle plan. Many more ghouls were outside already flooding into the barrier yard. From there they would make their way and through the truck shed to then join the battle in the tower. If Critias turned back to help Carmen, it would allow more of the infected to come in to join the overall fight for the city. Psychological and conditioning had shaped Critias from earliest childhood to harden him against sentimental distractions. Emotion overwhelmed Carmen in that moment because she no longer had her inhibitor module actually forcing her to follow a battle plan regardless of her own feelings. Critias didn't hesitate beyond his mere recognition of the facts as he abandoned Carmen to do her own part in the battle. He focused his attention on his own mission, which was to close up the barrier gate and end the stream of reinforcements. Ten ghouls surrounded Carmen as they tried to drag her down. Her bite staff had disadvantages when confronted by so many enemies at one time. Carmen managed to trip two of her attackers before the others took hold of her staff and then wrestled it from her grip. She just abandoned the weapon unconcerned since she was ready to fight just as they did, with no weapon at all. Carmen's diverse programming for violence included total mastery of every human art for war. Within her were the virtual simulations and tactical recordings derived from whole generations of combat androids and mesh-suited ghoul fighters. Carmen's Aikido positions flung ghouls into one another so that their superior numbers only confounded their efforts. She made their greatest strength transform into a weakness. She used a jujitsu throw to plant one of them headfirst into the floor. Other ghouls that grasped at her may as well have offered their hands into a disposal grinder. Carmen's Xiaolin Chi Na grappled up their offered limbs. She ripped loose tendons, cracked bones, and dislocated joints, all to attain her eventual goal when she finally broke their necks. True to her pledge, Carmen littered the floor with disabled ghouls without ever having spilled their blood in any volume. Critias trusted in Carmen's warrior talents enough that he didn't fear for her safety. Even if he did, he still would have left her behind to fend for herself. The front door was still functionally intact aside from the shattered locks that would no longer serve purpose. Critias blocked the doorway as he greeted the next ghoul that came up the ramp by planting a kick into the creature's chest to knock it back into the arms of the others that followed close behind it. Those infected then thoroughly recognized that Critias was human prey. They started to scream at him to attest to the fact as well as their intention to kill him. He gave them something new to scream about when Critias leveled the microwave beam weapon at them and then gave it full power. The metal roof and sides of the garage tunnel acted as an impromptu secondary wave guide that improved the focal efficiency of his microwave flamethrower. The tunnel reflected his beam inward to heat the ghouls that scurried through it. In fact it fell like dominoes when he agitated the water and their blood well onto the point of boiling. As his success mounted in the form of fallen bodies, Critias realized that he would not be able to get down the tunnel into the truck shed. Too many fallen ghouls clogged his path, especially while more infected just climbed over the disabled bodies to then also heat stroke in his beam, which raised the blockage that much higher. He had succeeded in stopping their incoming flow, but it wasn't without a cost. His visor HUD displayed the capacitor gauge for his microwave flamer and it already read at half charge. Critias glanced back to see that Carmen actively trounced her hapless opponents. She had things well in hand and would soon have the lobby cleared of active infected. He commanded her by radio, go help the guards in the basement when you're done there. I'm going outside to close up the barrier. Since he had abandoned any plan of going down the clogged tunnel into the truck shed, without waiting for Carmen to agree to his final command, Critias expediently kicked out the sheet metal tunnel wall to his right. By leaping through that new opening, he carried on the fight out in the barrier yard. Carmen used a standing guillotine forearm to snap the neck of the last functional ghoul in the lobby and then she turned for the stairs. Following Critias's instructions, she would descend into the basement to investigate the symphony of assault rifles that boomed up from down below. 
Jingle Bells and Grendel arrived at the base of the stairs on their way to come up just as Carmen arrived at the top and then started down. Grendel recognized Carmen on sight and the destroyer despised her with a vehement passion that was exceptional even for him. His roar flung spittle and his muscular veins bulged, both promising Carmen that he was ready and eager for their rematch. Grendel felt fully confident of another victory only this time Carmen would not get any chance to limp away. Grendel planned to carry her head when he departed from the building. Instead of ordering the attack, Jingle Bells gave his bodyguard pause with a touch of his hand. All infected had the ability to sense the difference between man and ghoul at close range in much the same way that sharks used their ampullae of Lorenzini electroreceptors to detect the bioelectric core of their prey. Carmen's neo-organic android physiology and Critias's mech suit were not in the same spectrum as was natural humanity, so the Watcher believed that he recognized Carmen as a fellow ghoul among humans not their kind. To him, she was not an enemy, but another future ally to help him and his work just as Grendel did. Jingle Bells spoke to Carmen sweetly. I see the blessing of rebirth in you, my sister. The Watcher offered her his hand just as Critias had done for her so many times, let us rejoice in partnership over the miracle that God has given unto us both. I have no brother. I am like no sister, she replied with scorn. Offer not your right hand to me as would my beloved master, for it offends me. I shall cut it off and then cast it from the nair to return. The Watcher offered his hand with more emphasis, better for me to enter life maimed than to have two hands while descending into hell. Either way, one-handed or two, she warned again. Down, down to hell, and say I sent thee thither. The Watcher did not understand her attitude, but you are like us, one of the chosen. Why do you help these servants of the devil resist God's plan? He refused to believe one of the reborn could be his nemesis. God will not come down from heaven until the last sinner falls. I was born in the heavens, Carmen sneered. I saw no god of biomechanics there. I came into this world with my legs forward. I leaped fully grown from the mind of Zeus, my spear and shield already in hand. They had rejoiced, O oh Jesus bless us, she is born with teeth, so that she may snarl and bite and play our dog of war. Jingle Bells still hoped to win Carmen over to his side, in your beauty, I see the work of thy father, but in your mouth lurks the devil. Are you a warrior angel sent by him to assist me in this work or be ye a demon from hell come to test my faith? She stepped cautiously down one stair just to prove that she did not yield ground on their battlefield but claimed even more. Carmen, remained wary of Grendel who had crippled her before when she had not faced him alone and the giant had even been one armed at the time. For all of the destroyer's great size, it was a deceptive thing, for Grendel was swift as a snake and could reach Carmen in a single bound. Carmen retorted to Jingle Bells, since the heaven shaped my body so, then let Helmet crooked my mouth to answer it. The watcher withdrew his hand and then looked back to count the growing guns as they sounded in the deep. Soon the last of his minions would fall and then the soldiers would come up from behind him. It was then that he realized that Carmen played him for time to that very purpose. Carmen also realized he was aware of the situation. Time was on her side, not his. She shouted at him, Fear not the rifles of men, watcher. Carmen drew her sword and then struck in martial pose, Turn and look upon thy death. Jingle bells clung to hope and beseeched her a final time, I but humbly seek God's peace. Put away your sword. Carmen spat the word with contempt. Peas? Her religion was Nike who lusted for victory in battle, his insane words would not deny her that pleasure. What? You make war on my house and then speak of peace. I hate that word, as I hate hell, all watchers, and thee. Then so be it, Jingle Bells agreed. You're no angel, when I ring this bell you shall get your death, but not your wings. He rang his brass bell to unleash his lord of hunters to kill her. While they fought, whoever won he would flee to save his own life. Carmen had learned from her previous duel with Grendel and evolved her strategy accordingly. For all their differences, they were also much alike. He had defeated her by robbing her of the use of her limb. They were both nearly invulnerable to superficial injuries unless they lost their mobility. She would not make the same mistakes she had before while Grendel for his part had learned nothing from their previous battle aside from a burning hatred for Carmen. Grendel sprang up the whole flight of stairs to smash Carmen out of existence with a double axe handle haymaker that hid all his leaping berserker weight behind it. As death descended, Carmen just stood motionless as though frozen in fear. She spent that dangerous instant to taunt the brute onto target so that she could control his positioning. Even while she held her ground, Carmen refused to engage with the giant in the contest of strength he favored and neither would she try to impede his path where his far greater mass once again gave him every advantage. The destroyer's meshed fists narrowly missed her only by centimeters to strike the floor in her place, shattering a webbing of cracks in the tile. 
Carmen exploited her smaller size and greater agility to retreat before his rage. Her patient taunt followed by a timely sidestep to the outside gave her an opening through which she slashed the tip of her blade into Grendel's outstretched arm. The wound she left was neither deep nor impressive save for it being decisively stultifying. Carmen had sliced through the triceps tendon in Grendel's elbow with the accuracy of a surgeon. While their battle joined, Jingle Bells jumped up out of the stairwell to take advantage of his moment of opportunity. He grabbed the railing above to leap over that and then he dashed for the exit. Once he ran safely for the door, Jingle Bells flailed his bell so that his giant would follow. As Carmen retreated away from the stairs, Grendel followed her without hesitation. The giant saved Jingle Bell's life in that moment since she would have gladly struck down the bell flailing watcher if she could only have had a free moment to indulge the distraction. Grendel didn't care about any commands from Jingle Bells, and even with his ruined arm clenched up to his broad chest and flexed by sap palsy, his hatred for Carmen blinded him to all other things. The overgrown hunter ignored the bell and his pain. He only cared to slay his enemy that had just robbed him of the use of an arm for the second time. Not even Carmen's speed and grace gave her a spare moment to neglect the necessity of avoiding the destroyer's wrath. The whole Critias made through the wall of the forklift tunnel deposited him out on the broad granite stairs at the entrance to King's Tower. The truck shed was long and tall enough that it obscured much of his view into the yard, but he could see the entry gate off to his right with that metal signpost jamming it open. Hundreds of ghouls swarmed about in the yard's interior and more of them impinged on the open gate at every moment. The impassioned ghouls nearest at hand had heard Critias smash his way out through the metalwork. With a tunnel blocked by heat-stroked bodies, they promptly came around the shed to investigate a possible alternative entrance. Once they saw him, they charged to the attack. Critias as mech suit alone was not enough to disguise his radiance of humanity when he was in such close proximity to the infected. That was especially true if he also displayed distinctly unulish behaviors. His microwave flamer swept the infected down only not remotely fast enough to deal with the numbers that came against him. The beam that cooked the ghouls also inflicted upon them a painful experience that made them wail in agony much louder than their cries of rage. The noise he caused them to generate attracted even more of their kind. Critias wanted to use a Tesla flux grenade to clear them out, except that would have almost certainly demolished the iron security barrier. He abandoned that notion for more traditional methods of ghoul suppression. While he fired the flamer with one hand, Critias drew his pistol for blasting a tungsten slug through the problematic signpost. Unfortunately, as luck would have it, his bullet pierced through the metal pole to leave behind a nice round hole without actually breaking it. Dozens of ghouls rushed Critias in force before he could get off a second shot. They were a moment away from having the numbers to knock him down and then bury him. Even if Critias had been willing to endure that, he would have also lost sight of his signpost target and thus not been able to shoot at it anyway. Critias thought of how Carmen had once told him to trust in his mech suit, he would be able to move with the same superhuman grace that she did. It was by that faith in her that Critias jumped clear over the forklift tunnel to come down on the opposite side, he heard the sound of a ringing bell as he passed over the top of the corridor. The noise came out the tower's front door and then went out through the very same hole that Critias had kicked out from the tunnel wall. Tesla flux bullets splattered the brains of ghouls in rapid succession as Critias sprinted around the other end of the truck shed to get back in sight of the propped open gate. He probably saw Jingle Bells on his way out, but couldn't distinguish the Watcher from so many other generic ghouls as they milled about in the frenzy. Critias's next pistol round split the signpost and that allowed the gate to crash down under its own weight. As the barrier descended, it squished or severed all the infected who were unfortunate enough to stand in its way. Spring-loaded locks held the gate shut and also trapped inside those many ghouls who still rampaged about in the barrier yard. Even with those ghouls still inside for Critias to deal with, he had at least closed the gateway to prevent those thousands who were still outside on the street from ever getting in to join them. When Carmen tumbled aside and then ducked behind the thick stone railing at the top of the stairs, she narrowly avoided having Grendel palm her by the head and then tear it off. The destroyer only had one good hand left, but it was large enough to grip her skull like a fruit and Grendel's paw snatched at her with the gracility of a cat. As Grendel came up out of the stairwell in pursuit, Carmen thrust out her sword and then drew it back in a slice through the tendon behind his knee. Even as Grendel collapsed over his ruined leg, a clubbing blow from his good hand smashed the strong stone ornamental end piece off the railing where she had been hiding. Carmen had already moved out of his reach by cartwheeling away across the lobby using three one-handed side aerials. The elevator opened into the lobby then to let a dozen officers rush out in their full battle gear ready to fight. They saw the room filled with disabled ghouls and Carmen in a duel with the half-crippled Grendel. The destroyer had only one functional arm and one leg with which to make a pathetic leap in her direction. Grendel ended up sprawled out on the floor where he furiously swept his good arm about, which only scattered fallen infected bodies. 
Carmen called upon the moves of their previous battle as she leaped high into the air to come down with her feet on the giant's neck. As before, Grendel flailed out to smash her from overhead. Carmen had anticipated that he would repeat his prior instincts, so she was ready to meet the offered arm with the edge of her sword. She severed through the tendon in that arm too, which added that limb to his list of disabled appendages. After she backflipped a safe distance away over one of Grendel's clumsy kicks, Carmen shouted to the captains for their help, Critias is alone in the barrier yard. As the captains rushed outside at a run to support Critias, Carmen tumbled in close enough to immobilize Grendel's remaining leg with a precise sword incision. Without functional limbs, Grendel roared impotently on the floor no longer capable of battle or even low commotion. Carmen mocked her foe by saying, The bane of Achilles was your undoing too. How invincible are you now without legs to stand on? With a final leap into the air, Carmen came down for real with both her feet on Grendel's neck to break it with a loud snapping of resilient bone. Jim shouted as he led the captains to the front door, Remember Critias as armor. No one shoot him by mistake. Malcolm was first out the door with a pistol in each hand. He fired so quickly that one shot was hardly distinct from his next. His careful aim could shave raisins, but ghoul heads were targets he could take on the run from his hip. The officers were all expert ghoul fighters and the number of enemies within the barrier was finite. They had bullets enough for them all. Within minutes, all the guns fell into the cautious silence of hard-won victory. The ghouls in the basement had never attempted any retreat. They had just stupidly packed themselves into the narrow passageway where the ever-increasing force of guards had annihilated them with hot lead. The guards reported by radio that they had put down hundreds of foes to stand as the undisputed masters of Gate 3. The passageway was currently a revolting impassable mass of infectious gore. The officers in the barrier yard helped Critias headshot all the ghouls loose out there. After the last squirming crawler had collapsed, Jim ordered them all back inside King's Tower. Thousands more of the fully capable infected were still outside the barrier and the sight of humans fueled their hysteria, which motivated them to shake at the cage in their effort to get inside. As the officers came back in, Carmen used her staff to drag ghouls toward the front door. She used a bite to snap the necks of the ones Critias debilitated by heat stroke. Carmen made absolutely certain that they wouldn't ever awaken to carry on the fight. When Critias came in the front door, Carmen choked up with emotion. She rejoiced in his survival and longed for his approval when he saw that she had defeated so epic an opponent, such was her great accomplishment and corresponding pride in having defeated Grendel. She gestured to the body of the fallen destroyer as though he might not be able to find it otherwise. Master, behold your enemy helpless at your feet. Grendel is no more and glorious victory is ours. The bell ringer has fled and I fear he may have escaped back to the wilds, such was his apparent cunning. Jim displayed uncharacteristic shock when he heard her words, you saw jingle bells? The boogeyman himself was here in the lobby of my tower on my own wedding night? Carmen curtsied to him, yes, my king. I confronted them as they came up the stairs and he spoke to me. The mighty Grendel was too much a foe for me to restrain them both. I had hoped to delay them with talk until help arrived. His words were only madness but well spoken all the same. He calls himself reborn to God and believes you are doing the work of devils. He seeks to bring peace to the world by destroying the last vestiges of what was humankind. Jim was furious and distressed, not only was there an intelligently talking ghoul with an army at his command, but he had revealed himself by entering Jim's home with frightening ease. Jim swept his gaze this way and that as his thoughts raced as to how he could best medicate the disaster before them and how he himself must be to blame for the ghoul's successes. Queen Jessica pulled off her grave walker mask to speak on his behalf, Critias and Carmen have once again proven themselves to be masterful ghoul slayers. We all owe them gratitude, but for now there is no time. You are all officers of merit and your people are in need. Call upon your wits to minimize our problems. You don't need instructions, only incentives. Consider those given. We have many oil drums for transporting cargo, Thajak suggested. We can load all the bodies downstairs into those containers. These here in the lobby we can just toss out into the yard until we have time to clean those up later. If this ghoul speaks and is so cunning, George reasoned, let's not assume this is the entirety of his plans. Perhaps some ghouls are hiding in here or they plan to attack at other points. We must be certain that we're no longer in danger. If gate 3 has held, that leaves two guards still unaccounted for, said Andy. Penny headed for the welding supply room, our city is cut in half until the ghouls are cleared from below. I'll begin fixing the front door. Hiram is on the other side, Jim offered as cause to be at ease on their division. He can command the rest of the city until we get this cleaned up. Jim got on the radio, only the decontamination teams are to clean up bodies and they are to use every possible precaution. We are loading the corpses into oil drums after you destroy their brains. Deliver the filled containers to the lobby, 
locked tight for removal later. All guards are to search for lurkers to make certain we are secure at all corners. Colonel Davis is in command of operations out of reach of the tower. Next, he called his android, Kevin, we're missing the guards from gates 1 and 2. Who are they? Kenny was on duty for gate 1 and Jeremy for gate 2, Kevin answered. I suspect that both are dead. When Penny returned from the welding room, she dragged Kenny by his hair, look what I found hiding in the back. He locked himself inside welding supply. I wasn't sleeping, Kenny stuttered. I fought them as hard as I could until they chased me in there. Tony Banjo took Kenny's rifle from Penny and then sniffed the breech. Smelling nothing but gun oil, he said, this weapon has not been fired in weeks if ever. It's a safe bet that he's not missing any ammo either. Big Henry rushed over to grab Kenny by the neck and then he lifted him off the floor. With a shake he cursed him, you are a cowardly little turd. Throw him in a containment cell, Jim ordered. We can get to the bottom of his axe later. For now, I want to know where Jeremy is. Jack's idea about the workers containing the infected bodies inside empty fuel drums proved excellent in practice. Decontamination crews used foraged cat litter and the sawdust they had collected during interior construction to sop up the infected blood. They shoveled that saturated slop into the open spaces of barrels they had crammed full of bodies. The fluid-tight containers went up to the lobby to wait there until the Big Joe transport could take them away for permanent disposal. Critias had no choice but to clear the bodies from the tunnel to the truck shed. Most if not all of them had been victims of his microwave flamer and he could not risk them regenerating back into a combative state. After he took the time to break their necks, he cast their bodies out through the eggs that he had broken in the wall. Even more bodies of defeated ghouls still littered the barrier yard, which was slick with their spilled filth. For the moment there was little they could do to remedy that area since so many infected still prowled the streets around the tower. It was unwise and unsafe to entice them with the activity of exterior workers. Doing so would provoke the irritable creatures into sieging the barricade again, perhaps in sufficient numbers that they might pose a threat to it. Mostly, it was just counterproductive for them to enkindle any further animosity from the ghouls who then might linger around the area longer than they might otherwise. Critias quickly head stabbed the bodies on the stairs that he had defeated with the flamer and then left the rest until later. The decontamination workers eventually found what little remained of Jeremy. Too little of him was discernible enough to justify the use of his body in any form of funeral. By Jim's command they reduced what was left of Jeremy to ashes in the incinerator, lest some part of the young man turn and he might somehow suffer ghoulish damnation. Critias devoted himself to applying his mech suit strength in the labor of moving the heavy barrels up the stairway while Carmen occupied herself using the microwave flamethrower. She greatly enhanced the decontamination efforts by sanitizing the basement tunnel. Even with that additional technology assisting in the task, it would be some time before they would be able to sterilize all the spilled blood that soiled the subterranean passageway. The removal of the gargantuan body of Grendel from the King's Tower lobby proved to be a more difficult issue since he was much too large for any barrel and butchering him into many pieces would have made him a greater mess than his whole form was already. Kevin came down the tower to see the creature for himself when the time came for its relocation. Critias and Carmen were there along with some of the captains who wanted to behold the astonishing fallen fiend. After he had studied the giant hunter for a moment, the android commented, the sensory recordings of your first encounter with Grindel failed to convey just how impressive this hunter is. Critias agreed with the sentiment, the destroyer of legend was clearly no embellishment. This freak must be how it came about. He spoke of the story from his own time that concerned supersized hunters that supposedly existed, but no one had ever provided proof to the fact. Critias observed, this huge bastard burned a cultural memory that will last for centuries. He put his hand on Carmen's shoulder, I can say the same of you, princess. Your legend will also be free of exaggeration. No one could look upon this monster and ever doubt your courage or your skill. You must be nearly as proud of your victory as I am. If the betas were here, they would celebrate you too. Only the best marshals have ever taken down hunters with a blade and I'm sure none of them have ever defeated one as big as this. When George studied Grendel's face, he observed that a monster's eyes were still furiously attentive. A vein in the ghoul's neck throbbed because Grendel's heart still beat with its old furor. George commented, he still looks pissed off to me. Somebody needs to stamp a bullet on his head before he gets back up. He isn't dead, Carmen confirmed it. I severed his spinal cord when I broke his neck. This is a full body paralysis. That hatred in his eyes is entirely genuine. As you can see, his other wounds have already healed closed around the severed tendons. Your name for this specimen is quite understandable, Kevin used both hands to lift one of Grendel's limp arms by its enormous wrist. This descendant of Cain still hungers for murder. Let us hope his mother is not a dragon that will come to his rescue. 
Those words summon dark thoughts in Carmen. I should not have allowed Jingle Bells to escape, she said as an admission of short-sightedness. I look forward to inspecting the dead out in the barrier yard. With any luck, Critias killed him before he managed to flee beyond the gate. You speak utter nonsense, woman, Critias chastised her. It would be one thing for you to say such things as a braggart, but it is another to suggest it as wise counsel. Grendel deserved your undivided attention. I heard the bell ringer on his way out. My mission was to close the barrier so I gave him no special attention. If anyone allowed him to escape, it was me. He patted her back knowing it would be some time before he could give her a proper reward. You deserved a better wedding night. At least we can say you made it memorable. Carmen leaned into him as she relished the contact and then sighed. It was already memorable. Perhaps this type of hunter is unique, Kevin said with some doubt. I want to take some tissue samples for our research before you destroy the body. I am interested to know what triggered this transformation. Destroying a destroyer won't be easy, Carmen shrugged in dismay. How are we going to do that? He must weigh over 500 kilograms. Critias had already put some thought into it, after you have taken whatever samples you want, we drag him out the front door to leave him on the steps. We can use a drill to scramble his brain so that he doesn't suffer needlessly, I figure that's about as close as we can get to him being dead short of complete incineration. After that, even if he could regenerate sufficiently, he won't be able to do much without a functional brain. We leave him there until we get the barrier yard cleaned up and then Grendel can go out on the transport with the tinned meat sometime later this week. I'll assist Kevin, Carmen offered. I can call you afterward to help us drag him outside. That sounded good to Critias because he had no desire to participate in a ghoul autopsy. He told her, I'll go help them bring up more barrels until you need me. It was just shy of noon by the time that Jim had reconnected his city. That was when he called a break for a meal in Funland. Everyone had worked hard, was short on sleep, and raw on nerves after their long night of rarest highs and lows followed by a morning of emergency labor. They all showered and then gathered in Funland for the welcome brunch. While the people made a meal from the ample leftovers of the wedding celebration, the captains held council at their table. They kept what information they had amongst themselves until they could be certain of exactly what was true. Condemning rumors from those in command could do great harm if they later proved to be false accusations. Bob and Kevin eventually came to the table with new insights. They handed Jim a portable video unit that contained the digital recordings that they had compiled from various cameras positioned around the community. Jim ordered his captains aside so he could watch it alone. What he saw gave him mixed feelings. It did make much of what happened abundantly clear. Jim commanded Hatchet, bring the two guards that survived to me. He then told Kevin, set this up to play for everyone on the projection screen so that the whole city can know all of this. Hatchet summoned four guards to be his escort as he headed off to do the king's bidding while the captains returned to their meal until all was ready. Tony raised his cup in salute, Carmen killed Grendel and did it with a fucking sword. He chuckled before saying, too bad you didn't film your wedding night too. It's such a waste when there is no audience to appreciate talented moves like yours. Carmen leaned over to kiss Critias on the cheek, maybe we should have filmed it. He was even more heroic in our bed than when he went outside alone to close the barrier gate. The queen asked Tony, are you planning on marrying one of the women you keep company with? No, my lady, he answered readily enough, but I suspect there will be many a beautiful child pattering about in due time. I see my duty of repopulating the world as a higher calling. This man is just too handsome and amazing not to spread himself around generously. So yourself freely, Jim advised him. The odds are that you'll die as an officer much sooner than you would like. Foraging boldly is a dangerous profession. If you can sire future captains, give me a dozen. I hope to be lucky enough to live to see them to the age of you now. Tony glanced at Hatchet bringing in Kenny, I'll outlive some people I can think of at the moment. The other surviving guard Christopher was already in the room seated among the GNP where he enjoyed his stew more than most. The man, remained blissfully ignorant of any ongoing controversy. We have no worthless resources, Jim commented grimly. They can always be spent in some useful fashion, however unpleasant that might be, for them anyway. Hatchet had the guards take Kenny before the king while he went over to tell Christopher to join him. Kenny was nervous but still hoped to spin lies to weasel his way out of it. He had gotten away with lesser transgressions in the past. Chris was neither elated nor nervous, merely confused. He had no understanding of what was happening. Jim got up from his seat to conduct official business. Jeremy is dead, he told them both. The whole room listened with complete attention and interest. The king continued, Infected forced open the front doors to attack us last night and I want to know what the two of you have to say for yourselves. 
Kenny spoke first because he felt anxious to set the groundwork for his lies. Everything was fine except for the precedent banging around in his box. I kept the locks on the front door and I never went outside. I went to use the bathroom and when I came out they were already everywhere. I fought through them and then by some miracle I got the door to the welding supply room closed. Jim pretended to believe him and his acting was good when he judged by Kenny's sense of accomplishment. He asked the other guard, what is your excuse, Christopher? Chris hung his head in shame, I failed you, my king. I couldn't stop them from breaking my gate. The giant one, he pulled it down and I failed to prevent it, but if you give me the privilege to try again, I'll work harder. I swear it. Some of the guards laughed audibly at the simple man's ridiculous notion that the broken gate was any matter of disgrace. Queen Jessica stood up from her seat, these are no laughing matters, someone less understanding might think you offer insult where you intended none. Jim looked at her not appreciating the interference until she sat down, then he returned his gaze to the mouthy guards, please laugh away. Soon enough you will not find it so funny. The guards, remained in silence thereafter. Jim turned to Kevin, show us the camera from Tower Gate 3 so we can all see what is so humorous. Kevin played the security footage on the large projection screen. Those who didn't have a good view moved to acquire one. There wasn't anyone who lacked interest. All felt curious to know what had happened to allow ghouls to run loose inside the city. The camera had been only meters away from the gate. The picture was distinct and the audio had perfect clarity. They watched in silent fascination as Chris in a panic called Kevin on his radio. When everyone heard Jingle Bell's whisper, come and see, some of the women actually raised their voices in fright. After Chris shouted his battle cry for the king and leaped into the fray, Critias jumped up to shout, I knew there was metal in him. Hundreds of men joined in to cheer the rat catcher's display of undeniable valor against impossible odds. Once all had seen Chris struggle for mere ownership of a broken gate, Jim signaled for Kevin to pause it. You men of the guard dare to laugh at a lion, Jim told the table with the chuckling patrolman. If you think you are braver men than he, it must mean you are volunteering to be riflemen on one of the new forager teams. They'll need such venturesome goo fighters as you claim to be. The king took Chris by the wrist and then raised their hands together as he proclaimed, Christopher saved many lives this night with his dauntless loyalty, so I name him my captain of gates. Henceforth I shall call him the king's lion. Jim went back to his table and then pulled out his chair to move it from the end to the side of the table. My own seat shall be his when he dines among his fellow captains. For myself I shall fetch another. I would have three cheers for a hero of the people. The room cheered gladly for the humble man who defied the great hunter Grendel with courage far into the realm of suicidal madness, but derived from unshakable loyalty to friends, family, and duty. Jim gestured to Hatchet, seize Kenny and hold him. I do not want him to try and flee after the people see what the camera saw of him. The guards held Kenny by the arms. Kenny knew of no such thing, there was a camera? Of course, Jim told him. The people now want to cheer for your courage. Did you not tell us that you battled through the ghouls and only saved yourself by a miracle? He gestured for Kevin to play the recording, who wouldn't want to see a miracle. The first footage was of the barrier yard and truck gate where the community saw the watcher and his giant open the gate to enter the yard. They couldn't see inside the truck shed or into the tunnel up to the front door. The scene cut to the lobby where Kenny stood guard. The view was directly toward the front entrance and everyone saw Kenny nodding off and then eventually slink away not to return. Many cursed him and called for his execution but then they fell silent as they watched Grendel swell the door like a beating heart until it finally burst open to let in an army of ghouls. Jingle Bells almost seemed noble-minded as he casually strode in unopposed without any warning from Kenny by either gunshot or radio. Jim had Kevin pause it once more, you betrayed us, Kenny. Were you sleeping? We will assume it, since to ask you would be to invite more of your lies. For this offense you shall receive no mercy. There is no crime that we've warned you against more. No ghouls chased you anywhere. You had cloistered yourself long before they gained entry. Jeremy is dead because of you. There is no doubt that if you had done your job properly, he would have been on the other side of his gate. You didn't even so much as use your radio. I find you guilty of high crimes. The city lost two guards last night to death, Jeremy and you. Please, Kenny begged for time to spin more stories. Jim dismissed Kenny with a disinterested wave as he looked to Hatchet, take him to the lobby and lock him naked in a cage. Bring me back his tongue on a plate. We will never again suffer his lies. Have Clara stitch the stump or cauterize it shut, whatever she needs to do to tend the wound. I want Kenny alive and healthy. He's a valuable resource to the city. It's not every day that we have an expendable human suitable to bait a trap of our own. 
We are at war with the Watchers and I would make use of every opportunity. Guards dragged Kenny away as he screamed his innocence as the last distinguishable words he would ever utter, dishonest or otherwise. We have more to witness, Jim told the room. Though Kenny gave up the King's Tower to our enemies without so much as firing a shot or sounding an alarm, it is ours again at this hour because two of your most daring champions took it back again. Kevin showed the security camera recording of the lobby once more as Critias and Carmen rushed into battle for the territory. The audience bordered on disbelief at the couple's audacity as they plotted to take back the building with a bloodless battle. They gasped in amazement when Carmen displayed such martial expertise while she destroyed her infected enemies with both her staff and then with gloved empty hands. The film showed Critias charge outside alone and it brought a cheer as he finally shot the signpost. A prolific groan immediately followed when everyone saw that his first bullet only wounded the pole instead of breaking it. Much of Carmen's encounter on the stairs was out of view. The people cheered when her fight with Grendel put her crouched behind the railing to sever the tendon in the giant's leg and then carried out onto the floor with her series of acrobatic flips. Her final victory over the giant hunter using only her sword brought loud applause as did the rush of the officers to cement the triumph. Once the demonstration was over, Jim called for his captains to give them orders. Hatchet found a new chair so that Jim could return to his seat at the table. Chris took his stew to his new place at the captain's table, humbly honored by the unexpected promotion he felt determined to prove himself worthy. Jim took that opportunity to give Chris his new duties, I want all of our gates to be hunter-proof with infallible locks. The guards watching them need to be sober and rested. What happened last night is not something I want happening ever again and I want you to be in charge of making sure of it. You have seen what a hunter is capable of doing to our barriers unlike anyone else. The builders will do the work, but you have to tell them if what we have is still insufficient. Imagine every barrier to be your post and you must hold it alone like that until reinforcements can arrive. Chris considered the task. It sure would be nice if I had a good dog, he said finally. There's nothing like a good dog to tell you when something ain't right. I bet he wouldn't mind eating rat either. Now that it has come and gone, having a dog at the front door would have been better than having Kenny. Even a sleeping dog would have barked at all those radioactive cannibals coming inside. That idea struck Jim as being a good one, if it's a dog you need, then I shall have to get you one. Now that we're doing some hunting from the railway, there will be enough bone and gristle for a dog or two. You can show us the proper way to trap more rats and that way serve double duty. I have a bachelor room in the tower for you that will serve well enough until you find yourself a wife. Now that you are a heroic movie star living in the tower, I imagine a woman or two will show her interest in you soon enough. Ask Hatchet about the room when you're ready and he'll help you out. I would like to watch the lobby myself at night, Chris offered. If it worked for them once, I bet that is where they would try again hoping for better luck. I would sleep well at night if you did, Jim replied. Only I think you will be too busy elsewhere to find the time. For now, let's just wait and see. The metal fabrication and general construction commander arrived. Derek was one of the oldest men in the city. He was already at the end of his fifties, but still robust and very knowledgeable in his profession. He was a longtime acquaintance of Jim's father and knew the young king long before he took over the title. Derek asked Jim, are you going to bitch me out about the breakage? Hardly, Jim answered. If that Jackoff Kenny had been doing his job, none of this would have happened. No one can question all the drama that went into warning people not to sleep on guard duty, and it still happens. Preparation is not infallible. We need new locks on the truck gates that the smart ghouls can't just walk up and unlock. No one ever planned for talking ghouls showing up. That was my fault not yours. The front door could stand to be beefier, but it's not as if it just fell over in a breeze. You saw how big that hunter was. That super bastard could have torn his way in at dozens of places given the same time to work at it. Captain Christopher is going to inspect everything gate related and then provide you with detailed reports. You just keep making them stronger until we have our false sense of security back again. Derek could handle it, but not without help, tell Jack to do something about getting some new steel. Maybe he can clean out another apartment tower of all its bed rails. Those are light and springy. They work mighty fine. All this new work will use up most of what we have left and I'll need to get out to the castle at some point to tighten that up too. Jim told him, you can talk to Jack yourself at the next captain's meeting. We are going to war with Jingle Bells. We have a lot on our plate. Bob and Jack have plans for a new electrical power station. Kevin has plans for a new broadcasting setup with a security control room. We got the new cameras up in time, but they are not on any kind of network yet where we have eyes actually watching them. I have plans to start eliminating ghouls from this city wholesale.
The sunless interior of the garden building is going to be new quality apartments and we're going to construct an access to the light rail from Smuggler's Passage to get back and forth from the castle. I want new forager crews and there's a lot for us to do before winter, so I'll keep your people busy. By next spring, I plan on flying in survivors from anywhere we can reach them. The bold plans urged Critias up from his seat. He was finished with his lunch and took up his helmet. There's no time for honeymoons, he told Carmen to bring her with him. Let's return to the lobby. We can start cleaning up the tunnel and the truck shed. The crews can't move the barrels to the truck through all that blood. Until the way is clear, the welders can't put up the new front door either. Carmen got up to follow him. I don't need a honeymoon, my love, so long as we are together. We shall have a hunter's moon instead. To my sword, blood is honey. Before they departed, Critias turned to Queen Jessica and then bowed his head in respect. You have only been queen for less than a day, but you have already proved yourself to be your father's daughter. The compliment made Jessica uneasy since she didn't feel worthy of it. I didn't do anything worth mentioning, she replied reservedly. Jim cautioned her, that kind of humility is unbecoming. She gave him a curious look, you mean it is unbecoming in a nominal figurehead? Critias asked Carmen, what does nominal mean? Is that like ideal? I believe she meant tokenish, Carmen answered with a hint of displeasure over having to say it as if she seconded the notion or otherwise made contribution to an insult. It was cause for Critias to chuckle over an irrelevant situation, Carmen has been foolish about who she has offered her loyalty to before. Gloria was the one who had thought Carmen's loyalty to Critias was foolish, at least at the time. She urged Henry to finish up so that they could also leave for work with their crew's captain. But once given, Gloria said with an unfinished meaning that such a loyalty was not easily broken. Jessica stood from her seat cup in hand. By standing up so suddenly all the men at the table had to hurry to match the gesture in the name of polite etiquette. She said, in my recent studies, the writer Plutarch tells the story of Caius Crocinius. He was an officer who promised that Caesar would be proud of him that day, whether or not he lived. She raised her cup then called loudly, one land, one king. The room responded to the toast in an impressive display of enthusiasm and solidarity. They repeated her words three times and each was more inspired than the last. Jessica shouted, I salute the heroism and service of you all. Like Jeremy, you will be praised for your valor. That is our eternal pledge. At the end of each day, either alive or dead, we will have served our community with distinction. Commander Stig of Guard and Patrol always sat among his own soldiers during meals as a matter of habit. He also made a point to work the most dangerous posts like when he personally commanded exterior forager support guard operations. Stig had great loyalty and respect among his people. He told them, Kenny shamed us all with his lies and cowardice. Jeremy and the King's Lion have shown us the path to redemption. There is no room for weakness or laxity in our profession. Never again will a member of the GNP stand before the King as a coward and traitor. We will purge ourselves of that weakness long before it climbs so high ever again. We are cold warriors that measure victory by the calmness of the peace. It is only in failure that we fight ghouls within these halls. The foreigners risk their lives for the good of the community, for that I envy them. We risk the lives of the community at the risk of surviving ourselves to live, in shame like Kenny does now. We still have chores to finish, Critias excused himself. Things are well in hand here. The GNP are ready to storm a castle if the Queen would only ask it of them. I didn't ask for power, Jessica said in confidence to the captain's table. You should have thought of that before you seized it, Jim told her. It wasn't the power that I seized, she countered. Now that you mention it, I shouldn't have had to do anything. When a charming prince on a heroic quest rescues me, the rest is just supposed to fall into place. You hesitated, I had to take action before you ruined everything. Carmen commented, white knights upon fiery steeds can be hard to come by. When you find one, you need to hold on tight. Critias asked his wife, how would you know? You didn't find me. You were mine before you knew up from down. It is a most beautiful and promising destiny that is in your hands, Carmen replied in amusement. I will not be the first of my people to fail to serve, even unto my last breath. With a hand on her shoulder, Critias directed her to start moving out so that they could get back to work, I will file those times you tried to kill me as special counseling therapy sessions. I never actually tried to kill you, she said in her own defense. I merely contemplated the possibility. There is a difference. It was twelve more hours of hard labor before Critias finally got a chance to remove his armor and take a rest. The number of bodies out in the truck yard was even worse than he had remembered and he had made most of them. Not enough old fuel drums were available for canning up so many disabled ghouls as were in the basement much less for them all. 
since many of them were of the headshot variety, they had leaked blood and brain matter all over the place. With Carmen's help, Critias used a snow shovel to scoop up the gummiest shapeless matter that they had mixed with absorbent cat litter. That foul mess went into the last available barrels. They sanitized the forklift tunnel and the truck shed during what remained of the daylight hours. Critia saved the exterior work for after sunset when they could grave walk in the open without attracting too much attention from all the aggravated ghouls that still hung around out in the streets. Plenty of irate biters still circled the tower to work off their excitement from the recent battle that they had been lucky enough to be late for, which was the only reason they still marched around with hostility rather than occupied the transport as headshot meat. Under the added security of darkness, other workers came out to help load all the body drums into the front of Big Joe's trailer. They cords tacked whole bodies onto a winding drag sheet while using additional plastic drop cloth as a serviceable drip liner. When it was finally all over, Critias felt exhausted, hungry, and desperate for a steaming shower. While a decontamination team thoroughly scrubbed the exterior of his mech suit, Carmen had the simpler process of immediately stripping down naked for a quick rinsing and then going directly to a shower. Critias arrived at the washroom to find that Carmen waited for him dressed in a towel. She held a cold beer in one hand and a small wooden stool in her other. He unlocked his helmet and then removed it before asking, When did you start drinking beer? These are for you, she handed him the beer and then gestured for him to follow her into the showers. He accepted the welcome beverage, and the chair. It's for you to sit on of course. She put it down in the place where she would wash him by hand, the same place she had her sponge bucket and soap products waiting. After removing all his armor, she sat him on the little seat to begin soaping him down. I'm going to have you clean enough to eat off of, she pledged as she sponged. If you're lucky, I may even prove it, which she eventually did. Christopher the King's Lion guarded the lobby for his midnight shift when a room service cart arrived from the kitchen that Carmen had ordered sufficiently in advance due to their working late out in the barrier yard. Carmen's dinner is here, he called into the showers. Do you want me to send it up to your room? We'll be right out, Critias answered for her because he kept Carmen's head down and her mouth full with the amatively appreciated press of his hand. I'll take it up myself just as soon as I'm finished here. The food was excellent, being more leftovers from the wedding feast in choice portions and selections in recognition of their hard work when they cleaned up the truck yard while they missed their honeymoon. Jim let them do so much work with minimal assistance because Critias and Carmen were the least likely to contract infection when exposed to such an ungainly mess. They were also the least likely to antagonize the prowling feeders outside when revealing their presence. Once they were back safely inside their new apartment, Critia sat at their kitchenette table while Carmen served his meal. She had spoken to Jingle Bells and also helped her husband clean up the barrier yard, so they were quite certain that the watcher was not among the disabled ghouls. While she brought his plate from the microwave oven, she asked, Do you have any ideas how we should go about finding him? Critias readily guessed to whom the pronoun inferred because they saw no other threat worthy of debate. Well, he thought aloud, we know he didn't bring any guns despite having some intelligence about him. We know he talks crazy so he probably is, and he must be within walking distance. I'm thinking about when Hiram said he almost hit the tribe down in the train tunnel. What do you want to bet those were the same semi-intelligent? Asked Nibblers that ended up shot to Helen back down in the basement. Carmen sat close to eat off his fork when he offered it. She commented on his thinking, that would suggest they approached from the northeast and there's not that much space between us and the water. Do you think they crossed the river? He shook his head no. Jim was already thinking there was something spooky about that sports dome he mentioned, be a lot of coincidence if that's not related. What direction would that be in? She ate some instant mashed potatoes with a bit of steak in it. Carmen chewed carefully and then swallowed before she answered, Colonel Davis said that the light rail tunnel goes right past there. An underground depot for the stadium is part of the old service route. Critias wasn't all that worried about Jingle Bells, if Grendel was his weapon. You've already disarmed him and Jim spends as much effort fretting over his city as you spend doting over me. He'll have some scheme for rooting out Jingle Bells soon enough. I'm sure of that. Carmen got up to refill his cup. He asked, why don't you sit down and join me instead of doing all the work? Carmen returned to her seat, I endeavor to be more useful than beautiful, my master. A man who prefers beauty over substance will destroy his digestion and become unable to relax. He had to chuckle at that. You have set too great a task for yourself then, my wife. You're far more beautiful than useful, or sensible for that matter. You may ruin my digestion, but never my appetite. She yawned broadly for duration, I'm sleepy. Critias pushed away his cleaned plate, then we shall away to bed. In the dark under a sheet, you can be more useful than pretty just as you hoped. Chapter 9 
tobacco of the gods. Thagai called a fun land assembly of the forgers at noon along with the commanders of all the supporting operations. Once everyone had lunch before them, he began the meeting by addressing George. You're taking out Big Joe to dump all those bodies. Jim wants you to take out the precedence container too. You can dump him with all the rest of the infected garbage, doesn't really matter where. You need the stun and the truck back for cleaning by nightfall so you can take the other teams out to the castle for missions after dark. George assumed that was too easy an assignment to be the sum of his duties, what else do you have for us? A home remodeling depot warehouse kind of thing, Jack handed over a map with a list of desirables. This may be wishful thinking because I'm hoping for a whole truckload. The labor just loading up should tax your means heavily. Big Joe attracts a large audience, Malcolm catched the real hazard. If the building is in too bad a shape to fortress, it could turn ugly. Andy was more confident, we can push junk with the plow to plug the holes then back the trailer up to a wall for a cut in. I can even drop the trailer off and then drive around to give them something more interesting to chase before washing them down with the flamethrowers. I'm sure you'll work something out, Thadjack said before he moved on to Colonel Hiram Davis. I'd like you to take your people out on the light rail to keep clearing track to the West Airport. Jim left his truck out there when he flew to Denver. You can even bring that home if you can manage to reach it. We're looking to add four new light rails to our fleet. Select the best ones to bring home with you. Track space will be a problem. You can park the new cars out on the far eastern end of our line until we can get around to upgrading them for our needs. Hiram spoke to Derek, we could use some chain link fencing or some corrugated sheet metal. I need something we can use to close up the openings in these new rail cars long enough to safely move them around. I have something better than that. Derek answered to the request. We have the new airbags ready for field testing, puncture-resistant inflatable barriers, ideal for windows and doorways, fully reusable. You just open a gas bottle to expand them into any shape and then deflate them when you're done for easy takeaway, no fasteners required, quick, and quiet. Jack offered the sheet of mission details to Tony Banjo, Hiram will drop you off by light rail out at the East Airport for escort duty. Derek and his field construction workers are going to the hangar to convert it into a new staging area with maintenance for trucks and aircraft. It's not a stylish run, but you'll be all alone with little chance of help if things turn sour. If we're lucky, you'll just find it boring. Carmen had enthusiasm for their upcoming assignment, what do we get to do? Are we going to track down Jingle Bells and assassinate him with extreme prejudice like in your evening cinema pictures? Not yet, Jack had other plans for them. Kevin and Bob need Critias to take your crew to the television and radio station building. It's within pistol shot of the garden building, just to the south. Kevin will provide real-time instructions on what equipment he wants for setting up our new global telecommunications center. Critias commented, he gave me the impression that he had all the gear he needed from what we snagged in Denver, that and what's available inside Air Force One. He said that plane was a standalone command center in its own right. Jack only shrugged, you have your orders. Bob says they need more so they need more. Kevin says he needs Carmen on site. She will understand what he is after. It's a walkabout inside a compromised high-rise, plenty dangerous. That means your team goes. Alfred their seasoned sapper and demolition foreman asked Jack, are we good to go on the new rail depot? He was a tall and robust figure whose graying hair made him seem distinguished and intelligent rather than out of his hard-working prime. Like Derek, he was a leader in the non-combative construction community. Jack nodded that they were. Bob has some global positioning equipment and a radio transmitter for Colonel Davis to take with them as they move out west in the light rail. They will be able to locate exactly where smugglers' passage to the garden building passes below the old railway tunnel. Your excavation crew will start digging around the clock to carve out a boarding terminal. Once you have it complete, we can load and unload directly from the city. Our days of needing Big Joe to reach Forager's castle will only be a memory. Critias asked Carmen. Exactly how close is this telecom target to the garden building? She told him, we would have to walk about a hundred meters depending on the availability of entrances and exits. Getting the milk wagon inside shouldn't be a problem because the building's design includes a large garage for the camera satellite uplink dish vans. She gave him the roots of an idea. Critias asked, are vans like a kind of enclosed cargo truck? What do you think the probability is that you could get one of them started? Could we walk in and then drive out with what we need loaded inside a van? The quality and maintenance of such stored indoors commercial vehicles would be top-notch, she surmised. The chance that they got lost somewhere in the field because of deployment during the outbreak is also excellent. It is probable that maintenance tools would be available for me to get a vehicle operational if present. In total, I calculate that the odds are insufficient to gamble on as a necessity, but they are probable enough to check out as a luxury. 
Gloria didn't like his idea anyway. It's not safe to be on the road in a vehicle of uncertain reliability. We need to be able to trust in our tools. Desperate times require desperate measures and this isn't one of those times. Her husband Henry added, if anyone else ends up needing some backup, we will need to deploy from the castle. If you two want to walk into that television station first to scout around quietly or do some pick and pull, we can wait for you to call and then drive in to collect you. We want to get the work done, not look heroic. If we're holding you back, splitting up would be fine with me. Fad Jack listened and then told Critias, you will have other work when you're done with this run. When you're finished there, bring everything back to the castle. You need to base all your plans around returning there for what comes next. Carmen hurriedly consumed her lunch to leave a clean plate. I'm finished, she told Critias. May I be excused? We have all afternoon before George brings the truck back for going out, Critias replied. You may go if you promise you won't be involved in any mischief. After a light kiss on his cheek as her silent promise, Carmen departed. She didn't go far before she joined up with Nadia the Russian instrumentalist from the Denver Survivors. Together they went over to the piano, which Carmen would play while Nadia practiced on her violin, apparently by some prior agreement. Penny spoke to Critias across the table, keeping her on a short leash, I see. Tony Banjo knew better, Carmen is not domesticated. She's just kinky, kind of like a groupie. Penny rolled her eyes with skepticism, what's that supposed to mean? It's not just my handsome face that makes me so popular with the ladies, Tony explained to her. They want the undivided attention of a celebrity, to have something for themselves that everyone else wishes they could get their hands on. Carmen is not the first one I've seen to be sure. A dangerous man of dominant profession turns on some women. Carmen has a hard time finding anything in this world more lethal than she is, so cut her some slack. She kills super hunters with the cutlery. I can see that, Penny finally understood. She eyed Critias with the times she had propositioned him in mind, that and how she had gotten to know him better since then. Carmen is holding out for a hero. Critias called over to Carmen, you couldn't live without me, could you, princess? She sent him a smirk and then gazed down at the piano keys before skillfully playing a fountain of tonal scales that were the opening to Gloria Gaynor's song, I Will Survive. First I was afraid. I was petrified, she sang the lyrics. Kept thinking I could never live without you by my side but I spent so many nights thinking how you did me wrong. I grew strong, and I learned how to carry on. As numerous other women joined in singing the rest of the song as a group entertainment, Tony shook his head in disgust before he groaned, God, I hate disco. Everything she does is amazing, a prideful cry Tias told Tony. Carmen's breath is strawberries and she sweats lavender perfume. Tony assumed it was idle talk from a man in love with his pretty new bride. Aside from that, Tony actually had desired to have Carmen himself before he had learned that she was unattainable. That was why her scent had imposed itself into his memory on some subconscious level. He said, next you'll tell me her pink tastes like peaches and she craps pre-cut diamonds. Critias replied, you would be wrong about the diamonds. As he got up to leave, Critias asked George, do you have room for a couple passengers when you take out the truck? I want to ride along with you when you go to dump the garbage. Yeah, sure, George shrugged. You loaded it after all. Why would you want the trouble? Something personal, Critias answered cryptically. I want to see it finished. Like I said, George agreed again, some extra hands unloading cargo is no burden on my crew. We will be prepping the transport for departure in about three hours. Critias left Funland for the nearby gymnasium where he lifted free weights interspersed with skipping rope until he felt properly edged about an hour later. His evening ahead of outdoor work occupied his thoughts with a search for inspiration and clarity of purpose. Critias could tell he was losing his dispassionate incelerism because he had always been a solitudinarian in his own time, committed to duty but not his personal life, only his personal luxuries. He thought about how when they got home, the scientists would reprogram Carmen back into servitude. They would convince him that it was a small price for him to pay so that he could still keep her as before. What really mattered to his time was the antigen to facilitate recolonization. That was his duty, his mission, and the whole reason he was even with King Louis at all. Restoring the world to humanity was Jim's ambition too, to see mankind free once again to embrace his heritage, to walk safely out under the sun. You're skulking in here, Carmen said from the doorway when she eventually came to find him. You were supposed to get jealous, drag me away from the piano, and then ravish me from behind while standing in some dark closet. Instead, I find you here wallowing in self-doubt. He turned to look at her to find that her eyes amorously evaluated his physique. Critias told her, you flame me with your mouth, but once again your eyes remain devoted. 
if I flame on thee in the warmth of love, she quoted Paradiso, beyond the measure witnessed upon earth, and so vanquish the power of thine eyes, marvel not, for this proceedeth from perfect vision, which, as it apprehendeth, so doth advance its foot in the apprehended good. From perfect vision, he considered. You know more of the future than you tell me, so what is your advice, woman? She advised, seed and armatogi. Join me in the carefree bliss of duty. You fret like the king, but that is not your destiny in this previously ordained by God age. Besides, you make a terrible king. That last part offended his pride, how so do I make a terrible king? Carmen told him, Jim hides his incertitudes while you wear yours as a mantle. When I see you in dark contemplation, it makes me worry and doubt myself too. Her observations didn't improve his mood, the slayer of Grendel has such faith in me. She rolled her eyes at the title, you slew Grendel and did it casually. Were it not for my advice to reduce the velocity of your pistol for silence, your first shot would have been clean through his head, right between his eyes. It only failed to penetrate his thick skull because of my poor judgment. It's my fault that we both nearly died. We would have, except for the fact that you saved us. You are the one who got me back home. You even intimidated Jingle Bell sufficiently that he withdrew his mighty guardian rather than see him slain by you. You were putting holes through him like he was a vegetable strainer. If it was easy, he reasoned, they wouldn't have given me you for help, despite any shortcomings you may possess. He checked his martial service wristwatch, let's go sit in the bath. We're going out early to ride along with George, but we have time for some relaxation before then. She liked the first part of his plans, why do we need to go with George's crew? He took her hand to lead her back to their apartment, you just let me worry about that. After his relaxation as planned, Critias took the elevator down to the tower lobby in his full armor in time to leave with George. Carmen was excited about the excursion. All their frolicking in the bath had left her with an appetite for satiating her second most favorite pleasure next, that of suspenseful combat action. Decontamination services were out in force in the lobby because they would clean the truck shed again just as soon as the transport departed for the dumping. Five of them wore yellow plastic suits so secure that they also had to wear bottled oxygen masks just to be able to breathe inside their gas-tight outfits. They had, pressure washers that they used to blast ozone-enriched spray water and braided steam hoses that ran from the boiler that they used to destroy cellular matter. They made passes back and forth between the tunnel and the truck shed, which resulted in contaminated water that dripped down from the ceiling. Go to the armaments room, Critias told Carmen. I want you to get me a pair of thermite grenades. Don't get smokers. I want the heat. The decontamination workers had some jerry cans of kerosene that they used to fuel their burned barrels. Critias took one of those to play a part in his plan. George approached Critias, we have a regular spot where we unload the trash. I'm going to use that for the body barrels. Nothing the freaks would eat ever goes out there, so we don't have to worry about them hanging around at the trash dump looking for free food or rats to chase. It is mostly just shitty old furniture, some carpeting, and crap like that with old blood soaked into it. Critias asked, flammable? George nodded that it was. Hiram's light rail depot yard is only like a mile from there. When he gets there, he may not appreciate all of the smoke if you set the trash on fire. I think he will benefit from it, Critias disagreed. One more distraction to keep the beasties confused. Fajak says that they associate smoke columns with his paddle wheeler. I figure that the freaks are too stupid to realize that there is no river around and they'll have a few hours of daylight left to notice the sign. When it gets dark, the flickering flames will keep them occupied too. Besides, I have to go downtown tonight for a walk around. The fewer ghouls there are in my area the better. The decontamination suits power washed and steamed the path into the truck shed another time before Andy came in the front door holding an umbrella against the drips. He told them, we're all gassed up and ready to roll out. The gate crew commanded by Stig had outfitted themselves at their barracks in the customs house before they arrived on time to work the mechanicals in the yard. They had upgraded their splashware with grave walking draperies to be less antagonizing to the ghouls at a casual glance. Carmen and Critias joined Malcolm in the trailer while George rode in the cab's passenger seat. Andy drove them out through the barrier yard's forward exit gate to get them onto the street. Once they were clear, he cannonballed westward along the main market boulevard for about eight blocks. Andy finally pulled an aggressive right turn into a narrow arboretum-like alley formed by the impressively lush overgrown landscaping of a multi-storied hotel. George's dumping site was the secluded hotel parking area around the back with its brickwork privacy wall enclosure that had once protected the parked vehicles from central city vandalism. Combined with heavily overgrown hedges and vinery, the concealed interior of the parking lot protected the transport from unwanted observation by prowling infected. 
Malcolm opened the side door just as Andy brought them to a halt and then cut the engine. George's gunner carried a sound suppressed Russian assault trifle of the latest and last incarnation of that notoriously dependable weapon, complete with subsonic ammunition. Firing from the shoulder, Malcolm masterfully incapacitated all the ghouls that pursued their truck and through the security barrier's driveway gap at the rear of the hotel. Critias jumped out the trailer's side hatch and then ran to the back. He opened the rear trailer doors and then activated the spooling winch that reeled in the drag cloth that underlay their fleshy cargo of stacked bodies. The conveyor sheet efficiently dragged the corpses rearward to spill them off the end of the trailer to heap the asphalt. When the body of Grendel arrived last, Critias paused to give those remains a more respectful treatment. He told Carmen, help me move him to that pile over there so that we can burn him. She assisted him in the barely manageable labor. Even with both their enhanced strengths, it was a major chore for them to roll and drag the immensely heavy plastic wrapped giant over to the nearby dry rubbish mound. Once they had him in place, Carmen asked, why do you want to do this? Grendel was a king among his kind, Critias educated her in the ways of honor. What king desecrates the tomb of another? We will give him what honors we can, as humble as this may be. You earned much renown at his passing. He was an evil hero to be sure, but a hero nonetheless. Would you have the remains of your greatest adversary discarded as garbage? No, master, she agreed with his reasoning. I could have a thousand friends, and each would draw upon my strength, but this one enemy helped me to find more in myself than I had before. I will think it a rare fortune for my sword to ever again taste of one so worthy of its artful edge. Andy stayed in the driver's seat to be ready to get the truck moving at a moment's notice. Malcolm kept watch over their entryway. A considerable mob of ghouls had chased after their truck, but they hadn't been able to keep pace over so many city blocks. Though they had fallen well behind, they hadn't given up the hunt as dozens of them swept through the local vicinity unable to guess where the truck had pulled off the main boulevard. George came up with the can of kerosene that Critias had brought. He handed it over to hurry things along. We need to get out of here, George told them. This is not as safe a place as it seems. I'm thinking we just roll out the drums while Andy drives a lap and then we head home. It will take too long to move all those cans quietly. Carmen opened the fuel oil and then poured it all out across the pyre. Critias handed Carmen one of the thermite grenades, you do the honors. It's time to leave. A female infected climbed onto the privacy wall at the southeast corner of the lot. It was about to utter a piercing shriek when it saw the activity within, but instead it inexplicably exploded bloodily from the chest cavity and then fell forward face down inside the barrier. Critias turned to look behind him to see who shot the ghoul only to realize that none of them had been involved. In his surprise, he exclaimed, what the hell? It was three seconds before the sound of the gunshot arrived from back east. King's Tower, Carmen pointed that way to mean that was the source of the rifle bullet, which came from over a kilometer away. Critias waved in that direction because he expected to be visible in Colonel Hiram Davis's high-powered scope even though in return he could only see the smudge of a figure on the southern corner of the tall tower. That was a nice shot, he commented the obvious to Carmen. That man can operate a rifle. She asked her husband, how do you know that was Hiram? Her telescopic vision was capable of locating the shooter on a corner ledge near the summit of the tower, but she couldn't make a positive identification of the prone and costumed figure. Carmen speculated, perhaps that is Queen Jessica or one of the other grave walkers. Hiram has been teaching his daughter to operate a rifle since before the downfall. His visor's telescopic limitations were at a distinct disadvantage at such a distance compared to her prosthetic eyes. Carmen's bionic replacements far exceeded human perception, but at the risk of her permanent blindness should she ever lose them from damage or simple product failure. Critias assured her with confidence, that is Hiram. Carmen asked, how can you see that far? I'm not even certain who it is. I don't need to see him, Critias enlightened her as he headed for the truck to leave. You still have some things to learn about people, princess. No one else with the talent to pull off a shot like that would also have the balls to try it, not while we're standing here as witnesses. It wouldn't take much of a miss to hit our truck by mistake or hit one of us for that matter. Come on, George waved. Get in back and then start dumping the tinned meat. Playtime is over. After she pulled the safety pin from her thermite grenade, Carmen held the yellow marked canister aloft while she said, Grendel my dearest foe, you sought to make my wedding feast into a bitterest funeral. Seek you now heaven, for a while your slayers still stride this earth, who there might be fierce enough to deny you entry. With this flare I make a furnace in your flesh so hot that I send your memory into the world. She cast a grenade into the fuel pile, let smoke be your doorway to legend, Grendel the Destroyer. A fine tobacco you shall make rising sunward, worthy fare for the nostrils of the old warring gods.
the exothermal reaction of the thermite that could casually melt steel, swiftly set the whole pyre aflame and generated a tremendous outpouring of dark smoke from all the burning rubbers and polymer products that were part of the debris. Andy started the trusty diesel engine of their semi-tractor transport and then drove forward to make a loop of the parking lot. It was empty of other vehicles because by some odd fortune on the day humanity's world fell, the parking lot had been undergoing resurfacing maintenance. As the truck rolled past, Critias reached down from the open rear doors to take Carmen's extended hand and then lift her aboard. Good riddance to bad rubbish, Malcolm said as he shoved his first barrel of goo meat out the side door. While Andy drove in a clockwise circle using the truck's angled plow to keep his path clear, the three in the trailer rolled barrels out the doors to send them bouncing along the asphalt. The harsh treatment revealed the drum's admirable durability since none of them burst open from the rough handling. The smoke of the funeral pyre, the noise of the truck's engine, and the clang of drums all served to attract the attention of infected who ran in to investigate. The first of the creatures took up their usual howling, which spread contagiously among their kind as it generally did. As the ghouls streamed into the parking lot, George intermittently triggered the transport's portside flamethrowers to teach those hungry defiled that ZHMS Conrad was a source of painful sensation rather than one of nourishment. The President's prison box was the final container to exit the trailer when Andy was already on his way out to take them home. Hail to the Chief, Malcolm joked as he gave it the final shove out the door. The box bounced once and then came to rest on its side near the rear wall of the hotel. All are not equal in death as I have heard. Carmen told Critias her thoughts. Grendel was a dogged servant, ignorant and full of rage, yet death bestows honor upon that fearsome giant. The man they called President had the height of political position. Though in life he wallowed in worldly power, death has now defecated him out into a ditch. Such is fate, Critias answered. She asked, did he live too long? Perhaps if he had died years before, he would have been a respected man. Critias recalled from the old dates on Wee Eberman's murder videos that the president had never been a good man. He supposed that Fat Fool would have done anything to keep on living another day. He lived greedily with no compassion for others. His selfishness brought him to this end. The world can forgive you almost anything, if you did it because you cared about something other than yourself. Critias swayed by his grip strap that hung from the ceiling as he watched out the side door. In the end, he made a devil of his seven demons. Evil deeds put him in the box and I'll not weep a tear for the no good bastard. We should have burned him too, Carmen felt aloud. If I had punished the man in such a way, you would have been furious with me. The thought of his taskmaster superintendent pleased her immensely in an oddly romantic sort of way. His fate is none of our concern, he answered with disinterest on the moral worth of it. Jim's karma is his own business. She asked, and mine is yours? Such is a wife, he answered. For the remainder of the drive home, Carmen sang the, never laugh when the hearse goes by, for you may be the next to die, song in its entirety. When the transport wasn't far from the barrier yard, they saw from the open side door that a considerable number of ghouls were out in the street acting highly distressed. They agonized from blindness and burns in particular, which was not all that unusual in of itself, but they weren't suffering those injuries from exposure to flames. Malcolm asked rhetorically, what's all this about then? I'll ask Kevin what's going on. Carmen offered and then she related her answer without any noticeable pause for that discourse ever taking place. The decontamination units have been using modified dry chemical fire extinguishers with compressed nitrogen propellant to disperse powdered sodium hydroxide as a purifying agent. They deliberately dusted a crowd of infected that had been lingering close to the barrier. They call the compound caustic soda for good reason as you can see by their displeased reactions. It won't last long, Critias said about the chemical agent they had used to try and disperse the infected. He had seen such measures many times before in his career. There were too many infected and too few people to waste precious resources on such attacks. He added, they won't forget who burned them either. The gate crews welcomed in the transport with their usual efficiency. Once Andy had Big Joe secure inside the long shed, the decontamination team moved in to clean the interior of the truck. Big Joe was rather sanitary overall apart from transfer footprints. A second decontamination team required George and his group to wash up to return to the tower where they would join the other foragers who awaited the night's expeditions. The lobby was all a bustle of activity. Not only were all the foragers setting for departure, but also so were construction teams, gate crews, and all the outbound supplies for a lengthy stay at the castle and east airport. Fat Jack orchestrated the chaos with tempestuous discipline and aggregative comprehension worthy of a grand marshal. The support laborers packed all the luggage and cargo into their familiar reusable plastic tubs that they would load onto the transport. By the volume of it all, it was clear that Fedjak planned to be away from the tower for a couple days or perhaps even longer. 
Clara the transplant surgeon from Denver administered a requisite medical inspection on all the foreigners and expeditionary construction workers. She made no exceptions and was thorough to the point that she seemed belligerent. Clara required an in-depth explanation of every bruise or blemish and then made written record of her findings in her laptop computer for future reference. When Carmen's turn came, Critias followed up directly behind to make sure there were no difficulties, not over her android physiology or in relation to his execution of Clara's gluttonous lummox of a younger brother. You're looking healthy, Clara told Carmen with a hint of sarcasm. Nick accumulates more bruises making dinner than you acquired in your battle here in the lobby. My flesh is difficult to contuse, Carmen shrugged, but my wretched soul is bruised with adversity. So I'm good to go? Clara asked, do you have any aches or pains, unnatural cravings for human flesh, anything at all out of the ordinary? I do have this craving for human flesh, Carmen admitted, and there is something wrong with the top of my head. Critias couldn't tell if she was serious or joking, what's wrong with your head? She backed up to bump into him suggestively, take me for a ride in the elevator and you can thoroughly examine the top of my head to find out. You can go up while I go down. Critias was anxious to take advantage of Carmen's tempting playfulness. He asked Dr. Clara, is my wife clear to go? Something is about to come up that requires her undivided attention. She's fine, but I still need to certify you. It took Clara only a minute to ascertain that Critias was healthy apart from some lingering discoloration caused by the bruises he received from Grendel during their battle at the nearby office tower. Clara commented, It's unfortunate that no one else seems to recover from injury with the same flawless rapidity as your unblemished wife. It was a thinly veiled insinuation that she could tell there was more to Carmen than was natural. Critias dismissed the comment, She has many qualities everyone should have. Roland was nearby eavesdropping in addition to ogling Carmen during her medical exam. He took some offense in that he thought highly of Carmen and little of the unscrupulous Denver surgeon. Dr. Clara needs to be more cheerful in life, Roland offered his free advice. She still has a head to hang her high hat on. Not all wounds heal with flawless rapidity. One should be mindful of their blessings in life, while they still have one. He made the last statement with a poignant glance at Carmen's unobtainable nobility. Decontamination aides handed over bathrobes to each person as they completed their inspections. Carmen wrapped on hers dipped low off her shoulders clasped closed at the front with one hand as she headed for the elevator. She paused in the cab to look back for Critias and then she brought up her free hand so she could suggestively suck on her index finger. I saw a smith stand with his hammer thus, she cooed, whilst his iron did on the anvil cool, with open mouth swallowing a tailor's news. You're about to get a breaking news flash then, Critias jested as he headed that way. Shakespeare has never been so slattern as what comes out of your whorish mouth. Slattern is a big word for you, she teased him back, but words are women and deeds are men. Don't worry about that, he assured her good-naturedly. The time for talking is rapidly coming to an end, especially for you. As the elevator door closed on them, Critias told his wife, the failing in you is that the less I want you to enjoy this the more you're going to. There is no pleasing or punishing a trollop like you. Carmen dropped her robe as she stepped into his arms. Perchance from you both are one and the same, the pleasing punishment that women bear.